Welcome to the mop up for May 20th, 2022. It's time to start excommunicating Democrats. We got to get rid of certain Democrats. Chuck Schumer, I talked about this on Monday. I can't get over this. Chuck Schumer's daughter, Jessica, is a lobbyist for Amazon. Get out of my party. If you're a lobbyist for Amazon, get out of my party. Hi, I'm David Feldman coming to you from an, welcome to my party. I'm David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 53 degrees, wet and cloudy. On today's program, there is a vast right-wing conspiracy to brainwash Americans. We talk with filmmaker Jen Senko, author of the new book, The Brainwashing of My Dad. We had Jen Senko on our show a few years back when she made a documentary with the same name. Now it's a book. It will be great to welcome her back. Megan McCain has a new book. It's called Bad Republican, and Professor Ben Burgess read it, so you don't have to. We'll also be talking about replacement theory and Tuesday's primaries. Quick correction. On Monday's show, I identified Congresswoman Liz Cheney as a representative from Idaho. Liz Cheney represents Wyoming. I am sorry for both the mistake and the fact that there is a Wyoming and an Idaho New York's Division of Human Rights is charging Amazon with discriminating against pregnant workers and women with disabilities at its fulfillment centers here in New York. Amazon is accused of injuring pregnant women by forcing them to lift boxes weighing more than 25 pounds. Amazon is also accused of not accommodating workers with disabilities. That's all according to New York's Division of Human Rights today. Last September, Bernie Sanders and Democratic Senators Kirsten Gillibrand, Richard Blumenthal, Bob Casey, Sherwood Brown, and Elizabeth Warren asked the equal Employment Opportunity Commission to investigate Amazon's systemic failure to provide adequate accommodations for pregnant warehouse workers. I wonder if Jessica Schumer, Chuck Schumer's daughter, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's daughter, Harvard Law graduate Jessica Schumer, is going to lobby all these Democrats on behalf of Amazon, Harvard Law, Jessica Schumer. Piece of shit, Jessica Schumer. The road apple doesn't fall far from the horse's ass, her father. The average American family spends $5,000 a year on gasoline, twice what it's spent a year ago today. That's according to a new study. Now look, the price of gasoline is going up. That's not a supply chain issue. America is energy independent. All that oil is here in America. And it used to be all ours. Back in 1975, during the height of the oil crisis, Congress passed the crude export oil ban, which meant when we drilled oil, it was for domestic consumption and domestic consumption only, you know, energy independence, drill, baby, drill. Then 40 years later, in December of 2015, Democratic President Barack Obama signed legislation to lift that crude oil export ban to help domestic oil producers get more money by charging us more for gasoline. See, back when Obama lifted the export ban, oil was selling at $30 a barrel. So instead of getting this country off fossil fuels, instead, Obama lifted the crude export oil ban, 40 years of that lifted, and now oil and gasoline prices were then pegged to the international market, not the domestic market. See, if you could only... If you can't export our oil, all the oil we drill is simply for domestic consumption, and that would drive prices down. So much for energy conservation and independence, right? We drill in the Gulf of Mexico. We drill in Alaska. We defile our air, water, and parks to drill for oil 
And it's sold to us as energy independence, drill, baby, drill. Right now, Republicans are spreading the lie that the only way to bring down the price of gas is to drill more. But Exxon, with its record profits, isn't spending money on drilling. It's taking its record profits and paying record dividends to shareholders. Exxon won't drill because more drilling creates more of a supply, which means less of a demand. And they're afraid oil is going to go back down to $30 a barrel. We were promised that by drilling domestically, we would never again fall prey to world events or the vicissitudes of the global market. But as I said, the oil companies drilled and drilled and drilled. They had too much oil. Gas got too cheap. Oil got too cheap which means their profits went down. So Barack Obama and the Democrats working with the Republicans lifted the ban on exporting crude oil, which meant American oil went into the global marketplace. And that allowed it to get sold to the highest bidder, which is why we're no longer protected when Russia's oil supply is cut off. Once again, we are paying twice as much for oil due to artificial scarcity. This is not a supply chain issue. We have plenty of oil and oil should be cheap. Obama lifted the crude export oil ban back when oil used to be $30 a barrel. And now, thanks to Obama, it got pegged to the international market. Now it's about $110 a barrel. All those subsidies we give the oil companies to drill in America, and still, oil costs more than ever. It, oil costs more than ever. Exxon started 2022. Their stock started the year selling for about $60 a share. It's now worth $91 a share. What is that? About a 30%, 50% increase? Meanwhile, the rest of the stock market down 20%. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley said he has spoken with his Russian counterpart for the first time since the invasion of Ukraine began. And last week, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said he spoke with his Russian counterpart for the very first time since the invasion of Ukraine began. What's the rush, fellas? Why do you want to talk to your counterparts over at in, in Russia. Why? Shouldn't you guys be buying more weapons to keep the war going? There's no time to talk peace, especially when the Senate today approved a $40 billion weapons package for Ukraine. And that brings the total amount of weapons spending for Ukraine to $54 billion in just two months. We're spending $54 billion on weapons for Ukraine, and that's just two months. No, no COVID relief, but $54 billion for weapons for Ukraine. And the war is, you know, it just got started. Lockheed Martin started the year trading at roughly $350 a share. Today, it sells at $426 a share, while the rest of the stock market is down nearly 20%. Well, here's something interesting. A lot of Republicans in the Senate voted against today's $40 billion aid package, not aid, weapons package for the military industrial, uh, $40 billion aid package for Ukraine. The, our military contract, it's not about making the weapons contractors richer. It's about helping the people of Ukraine prolong a war. Uh, well, these uh, these Republicans in the Senate, they don't trust Biden. Hmm. I wonder if PayPal is going to make it impossible for these Republicans to raise money. Uh, they're, they're, they're opposing the war in Ukraine. That, that's not uh, Twitter. I wonder if they're going to suspend their accounts too. Where do United States senators get off challenging the premise that the only solution to Ukraine 
is billions and billions of weapons. You cannot say that in America. Didn't they get the message that that speech has been chilled? You cannot say that in America. Seriously, you can't. Nobody, nobody, certainly nobody in the Democratic Party would dare challenge these weapons transfers to Ukraine. It's considered unpatriotic to question Joe Biden's decision to send $54 billion worth of weapons to Ukraine. You can get shut down by Twitter, YouTube, Facebook by challenging that premise. PayPal will suspend your account for saying this. You're aiding and abetting our enemy. Well, Senators Marsha Blackburn, she's a Republican from Tennessee, John Boozman, Arkansas Republican, Mike Braun, Indiana Republican, Mike Crapo, Representative from Idaho, Bill Haggerty, Republican from Tennessee, Josh Hawley, Missouri Republican, Mike Lee, uh, Utah Republican, Cynthia Loomis from Wyoming, Republican Roger Marshall, Republican from Kansas, Tommy Tuberville, Tommy Tuberville, uh, Republican from Alabama. They all voted against the arms package for Ukraine. So they must hate America. Well, actually, they do. In all fairness, that is kind of the problem. Those people do, do hate America. And some of them are getting paid by Putin. So they're bad people. I hate it when bad people do something that I may or may not agree with. Uh, they're bad people. Rand Paul, bad guy, voted against the arms package. He said he wanted an inspector general to find out where all the money and weapons we give Ukraine are ending up. Imagine that. Well, at least we have 11 Republican senators with a spine. I'd give anything if the Democrats had one senator, one with a spine, one. Bernie's not a Democrat. He, he caucuses with the Democrats. Not a single Democrat in the Senate with a spine to stand up for what they think is right. Well, George W. Bush, remember him? Number 43, he felt the need. He was worried that, you know, we weren't going to send weapons to Ukraine. And he's a Republican, so he spoke out in favor of arming the Ukrainian people because he says there's no talking with Vladimir Putin. George W. Bush says Vladimir Putin must go. And who better to advocate regime change than George W. Bush. This is the guy who overthrew Saddam Hussein, and we all remember how great that turned out. Here's George W. Bush speaking at the George W. Center, George W. Bush Center for Inquiring Minds that are the size of a gerbil's. I don't know. He's got some tax dodge going in Texas with his name on it, and he he speaks up. Here he is telling his fellow Republicans to support the the fifty four billion dollars or the whatever we're sending this time. We got to send weapons to Ukraine. We have to overthrow Putin. We have to overthrow Putin. So says former President George W. Bush. The result is an absence of checks and balances in Russia and the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> Iraq, too. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> 75. <laughs> oh, and we laughed. We laughed. Iraq, Ukraine, Putin, Bush. Is there really a difference? No, there is no, let, let's watch that one more time. And brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> Ukraine, Iraq, Putin, Bush. What's the difference, right? There is no difference. Karl Marx famously said, history repeats itself. First is tragedy. Second as farce. And brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> wow. George W. Bush. I mean, you got to give him credit, at least subconsciously. He knows he screwed up. I'm going to play this for Dr. Hershenfeld. 
you know, George W. Bush knows he screwed up, but he lacks the vocabulary. He lacks the patriotism. He lacks the love of country to apologize to America and throw himself on the mercy of this country by commissioning a study to show for future generations how presidents can lead us into wrong wars. No, for George W. Bush, it's just the long goodbye. He's just drifting away the way Ronald Reagan did. And brutal invasion of Iraq, I mean of Ukraine. <laughs> wow, he knows he did something bad. He, he, he knows he did something really wrong. Ah, wow. Wow. Well, next Tuesday, we have midterm primaries in Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, and there's a big runoff in Texas between Congressman and Democratic conservative Henry Cuellar and Jennifer Cisneros, which I'll get to later. We like Jennifer Cisneros and Henry Cuellar uh, should have been put in jail after the FBI raided his home earlier this year. The election to watch on Tuesday is in Georgia, which turned blue in 2020. It not only went for Joe Biden, but also replaced two Republican senators with two Democrat senators. And that's how the Democrats gained control of the Senate. And Chuck Schumer became Senate Majority Leader. And his daughter, Harvard Law School graduate, Jessica Schumer, this piece of human excrement, She's a lobbyist for Amazon. And you know, once the Democrats took the Senate piece of human excrement, Harvard Law's very own Jessica Schumer probably got a raise from Amazon because she's a lobbyist for Amazon. That's Charles Schumer's daughter who can get a job anywhere by pulling her father's strings. You know, the same way he pulled strings to get her into Harvard Law, the head of the Senate, the Democrat, his daughter, all the jobs that this piece of shit can get. And she dedicates her life to lobbying for Jeff Bezos because just like her father, she's a piece of shit. Only a piece of shit would lobby for Amazon and call themselves a Democrat. <sighs> And they wonder why we're going to lose in November. Get out of my party, Jessica Schumer, and take your father with you. OK, well, anyway, Georgia. Uh, one of the Democrats running on Tuesday is Senator Raphael Warnick. He's running for reelection since he was elected to finish off the term of Republican Johnny Isaacson, who resigned for health reasons. Isaacson was replaced temporarily by Kelly Loeffler, who should have resigned for mental health reasons. And she was defeated in that special election, won by Raphael Warnick on January 5th, 2021. The Democrats got control of the Senate on January 5th, 2021. And on January 6th, 2021, the Republicans stormed the Capitol. Georgia's Republican governor, Brian Kemp, is running for re-election. He has a challenger on Tuesday. Former Republican Senator David Perdue is running against Trump for the nomination. And Perdue is supported by Donald Trump, who insists Governor Kemp shouldn't be re-elected because Governor Kemp didn't do enough to steal Georgia for him back in 2020. Kemp, however, did steal his own election four years ago from Democrat Stacey Abrams. Kemp at the time was Georgia's secretary of state, and he used that power to deny about 50,000, 60,000 African-Americans their voter registration rights. He just stripped about 60,000 African-Americans of uh, their voter registration applications. And it was considered by many to be the most flagrant act of American voter suppression in years. He also closed 8% of Georgia's polling stations where a disproportionate number of African Americans live. That's why he defeated Stacey Abrams, 
the African-American Democratic candidate, by about 50,000 votes. That's a stolen election. But unlike Al Gore, who also had his election stolen, Stacey Abrams refused to concede. Stacey Abrams waited 10 days, then held a press conference to say, quote, I acknowledge that former Secretary of State Brian Kemp will be certified as the victor in the 2018 gubernatorial election. However, this is not a speech of concession. Hmm. Can you imagine if Al Gore did that? Stacey Abrams went on to say, you see, I'm supposed to say nice things and accept my fate. They will complain that I should not use this moment to recap what was done wrong or to demand a remedy. And I will not concede because the erosion of our democracy is not right. That's Stacey Abrams, who is running on Tuesday for the Democratic nomination once again, unopposed because nobody in their right mind, no Democrat in their right mind would challenge Stacey Abrams. She's not bad for a Yale Law School graduate. I hope she wins, but she's still not on our side. If you graduate from Yale Law School, you're still the enemy. I'm sorry, you're not on my side. She's running unopposed Tuesday for the Democratic nomination. I hope she wins. She does have a spine, but she's not on our side. She's a graduate of Yale Law School. Kemp's communication director, Ryan Mahoney, was infuriated when Stacey Abrams in 2018 refused to concede. He called her speech a disgrace to democracy. The spokesman for the guy who stole the election, her failure to concede is a disgrace to democracy. And when Trump refuses to concede Georgia, then it's voter fraud. Uh, Stacey Abrams, I hope she wins, uh, but she can be bought because she's a La Yale Law School graduate. I will pick, I would vote for a Yale Law School graduate over a Southern Republican, but not by much. She's kind of wishy-washy on Medicare for all, for example. We'll ask Professor Harvey J.K. his problems with Stacey Abrams. Well, this past Tuesday was a pretty good night for progressives. Pennsylvania has a lieutenant governor. His name is John Fetterman, and he won the Democratic nomination for senator. He beat out the conservative Democratic congressman, Connor Lamb, who was endorsed by Joe Manchin. Connor Lamb doesn't return to Congress, and he's not going to the Senate. In Oregon, Congressman Kurt Schrader, the Democratic incumbent, went down in a resounding landslide, defeated by the progressive Jamie McLeod Skinner. Congressman Kurt Schrader of Oregon and Connor Lamb in Pennsylvania, two of the most conservative Democrats in Washington. It's great to see them go and uh, go join the Republican Party. Please get out of my party. Go scoot. On Tuesday, also Pennsylvania State Representative Summer Lee, Summer Lee. And this is where I'm going <clears> to <throat> not get angry. Hang on. I will control myself. On Tuesday, Pennsylvania State Representative Summer Lee, a 34 year old black woman, who once worked as a union organizer, Summer Lee seems to have won the Democratic nomination for Pennsylvania's 12th congressional district, which covers most of Pittsburgh. And I'm going to be talking about this. She won despite an avalanche of attack ads paid for by APEC, the very same super PAC that tanked the progressive campaign of Nina Turner in Ohio. In their attempt to defeat Summer Lee, APAC secretly set up the United Democracy Project. According to The Guardian, the United Democracy Project hides the fact that it's been set up by APAC and runs issue ads that have nothing to do with Israel, even though APAC is a pro 
right wing Israeli lobbying group. OK, Summer Lee offended APEC by condemning Israel's atrocities in Gaza. She equated the treatment of Palestinians with the treatment of blacks here in America. And she suggested that American aid to Israel should be contingent on better treatment of the Palestinians. So naturally, APEC jumped to the conclusion that Summer Lee doesn't believe Israel has a right to exist. If you question Israel's treatment of the Palestinians, then you don't recognize Israel's right to exist. But APEC doesn't have the courage to say that. No, no, that's not a winning message, especially I mean, in parts of Pittsburgh it is, but it's not a winning message. So they hide behind the United Democracy Project and attacked Summer on everything other than Israel. This is cowardice. This is cowardice. This is a pro right wing Israeli lobby, APEC, that doesn't have the courage of their convictions to attack Summer Lee on the issues they lobby for, which is the oppression of Palestinians. That's not a winning message. So they spend all their money setting up the United Democracy Project and run attack ads against Summer Lee on everything other than her position on Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Uh, APEC is slowly beginning to realize that Israel's treatment of the Palestinians, especially, especially in Gaza, is indefensible here in America, especially among American Jews, especially among young American Jews. A growing number of American Jews, especially young American Jewish voters, uh, unlike the Anti-Defamation League, uh, they don't think criticizing Israel is synonymous with anti-Semitism. I know it's hard for the Anti-Defamation League and APAC to believe this, but you can criticize Israel and not be anti-Semitic the same way I can criticize this shithole of a country I call America and not be unpatriotic. I take pride in this country, the, the freedom that I have to call America a shithole. I love America because I can call it a shithole. But APEC is making some Jews stupid. You can't criticize Israel now, according to APEC. You can't criticize Israel now, according to the Anti-Defamation League, because that makes you an anti Semite. Isn't that smart and brilliant? That really is a, a true expression of Jewish values, you fucking idiots. Well, you can say that if you're APAC, but get out of my party. You don't belong in the Democratic Party. And APAC knows it doesn't belong in the Democratic Party. APAC knows it is a Republican lobbying group. So they infiltrated the Democratic Party this year uh, by surreptitiously dumping money into Democratic primaries under a phony organization called United Democracy Group. It's phony. It's a front for APAC. It's a front for ultra right wing war hawks in the Israeli government. Through United Democracy, APEC was able to dump $2.5 million into one single district to, to try to defeat Summer Lee. Looks like they failed. APEC, I, I'm sorry, not APEC, that's a Republican lobbying group, uh, the United Democracy Project, which is funded by APEC, the United Democracy Project, through all its support behind Steve Irwin, who before running for the Democratic nomination against Summer Lee, before he did that, he was a Republican 
congressional staffer. AIPAC wanted the Democrats in Pittsburgh to nominate a Republican for Congress, Steve Irwin. Get out of my party. You, you can have these thoughts, AIPAC, but get out of my party. Get out of my party. Don't set up this straw organization called the United Democracy Project and, and, and support, try to get Republicans elected as Democrats. Get out of my party. It looks like summer early. It looks like APAC failed. Uh, I want you to learn who APAC is, what APAC is. Uh, I'll be talking about APAC for a little while right now. Uh, APAC did very well in North Carolina's Raleigh-Durham district. Valeria, isn't Valeria? Sounds like a sedative. And she probably is. Valeria Fushi received $433,000 directly from APAC. This is a Democrat, right? She's running in North Carolina's, she, she won North Carolina's Raleigh-Durham district on Tuesday. Uh, her name is Valeria Fushi. She got $433,000 directly from APAC. And then another $1.5 million from APAC's phony United Democracy Project. All to defeat Durham County Commissioner Nida Alam, a 28-year-old observant Muslim. Alam, the 28-year-old observant Muslim, was endorsed by... Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, as well as members of the squad. Once again, what is so pernicious about APEC spending so, so much on this campaign or all these campaigns is that they didn't use their money to attack these candidates on their calls for Israel to obey international law because APEC is too chicken shit to make Israel's treatment of the Palestinians a political issue. APAC is chicken shit. So they attack these candidates on everything other than Israel. And that's pure cowardice because APAC is chicken shit. A local organization called Jews for Democracy doesn't like APAC. Most American Jews don't like APAC. A local organization called Jews for Democracy wrote an op-ed in a local Durham newspaper saying, quote, we call on APAC to stop trying to buy this congressional seat. And we ask all candidates in this race to refuse to accept their support. Jews for Democracy, I believe that is an organization that has balls, unlike APAC, which is chicken shit. They call themselves Jews for Democracy. They don't hide behind the United Democracy Project because APAC is comprised of self-hating Israelis. They're ashamed of what they believe, so they hide they set up straw organizations, not Jews for Democracy. Jews for Democracy called on all candidates to stop taking money from a digital currency billionaire as well, because Jews for Democracy oppose cryptocurrencies and crypto fascists who APAC seems to prop up. It was APAC that gave a full throated endorsement of Donald Trump. APEC's United Democracy Project. This is APEC. They're so proud of being Jewish. They're so proud of Israel. They can't even put Israel or Jew in their name. APEC, their front group, United Democracy Project, is also throwing $1.2 million at Texas Democratic Congressman Henry Cuellar, who faces a stiff runoff challenge from 28-year-old immigration lawyer Jessica Cisneros, that's in Texas, uh, on Tuesday. Jessica Cisneros is supported by Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, the wonderful Katie Porter, and the squad. 
just not uh, the Democratic leadership. Why? Why won't the Democratic leadership support Jessica Cisneros, who is pro-choice, and instead they support Henry Cuellar, who is anti-abortion, especially now in Texas, when the Supreme Court is about to overturn Roe v. Wade. Why is Nancy Pelosi, why is the uh, uh, Congressional Progressive Caucus supporting Henry uh, Cuellar and not Jessica Cisneros? It's all about the Benjamins, baby. It's all about the Benjamins, baby. They want the Benjamins from APEC. It's all about the Benjamins. Now, uh, uh, Cisneros, Jessica Cisneros, who we are hoping beats, hoping uh, to, hoping she beats uh, Democratic pro-life Congressman Henry Cuellar. Jessica Cisneros is also supported by J Street which has contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars to her campaign. J Street is also a lobbyist for Israel, and they represent the views of 80% of American Jews. We just don't hear from J Street in the Main Street press. We only hear from the war hawks. We only hear from APEC. We never get to hear from J Street, which represents the views of 80% of American Jews. J Street represents the progressive wing of the Israeli government, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, and the progressive wing of American Judaism, which is progressive. Most Jews are progressive. I'll talk about J Street in a little while, but let's get back to APAC which is throwing millions at Henry Cuellar. They're trying to get Henry Cuellar reelected. He's a Democrat, and they're trying to get Henry Cuellar reelected. He opposes Medicare for All. He supports weakening Obamacare. He is the only pro-life anti-abortion Democrat serving in the House. He opposes the PRO Act, which would make it easier for workers to organize. And he doesn't want to abolish ICE or its for-profit concentration camps. And APAC is supporting Henry Cuellar. In other words, APAC is supporting a congressman who opposes Jewish American values. APAC is endorsing a congressman who opposes Jewish American values. APAC is doing that because APAC doesn't represent Jewish American values, or for that matter, the values of most Israelis. APAC supports the values of ultra right wing casino owners and Israelis who refuse to negotiate a peace with the Palestinians. APAC by the way, is the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee. It represents the conservative wing of Israeli politics. It does not represent all of Israel. For years, APAC claimed it didn't raise money directly for candidates here in the United States. But last year, it officially began contributing directly to candidates. Some of those candidates getting money from APAC include 37 members of the Treason Caucus. You know what the Treason Caucus is? That's the 130 Republicans who refused to certify the 2020 presidential election. APAC is giving money to 37 members of the Republican Party who supported the attack on January 6th. Let's be clear about APAC. APAC has donated to 37 Republicans who supported the January 6 attacks on our nation's capital. APAC doesn't speak for American Jews. APAC doesn't even speak for Israel. 
It speaks for the right wing crackpots in Israeli government. APEC would be the equivalent if like of, of MAGA going overseas and setting up some kind of lobbying organization claiming it represents all of America. By the way, MAGA, Trump, APEC, one and the same. MAGA, Trump, APEC, one and the same. You cannot disentangle APEC from Trump or MAGA. One and the same. APEC hates our Constitution. It hates America. Not J Street. J Street speaks for 80% of American Jews. If you want to know what 80% of American Jews believe, I suggest you visit jstreet.org. J Street lobbies Congress. And I'm going to read you because it's important. This is their this is I'm going to read you their official policy. This is J Street's official policy. And this is what 80 percent, at least this is what most American Jews believe. Probably 100 percent, 95 percent of Jews under the age of 30 believe this is what a very, very large chunk of Israelis believe. You don't hear this. You don't get to hear J Street. You only hear from APEC here in America because why? Because they're war profiteers. There's no money in peace with the Palestinians. So MSNBC, CNN, you're only going to hear from APEC, never J Street, which doesn't want to spend money on weapons. It wants to spend money on humanitarian aid for Gaza. This is what J Street, this is what they write about their policy. The ongoing Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory is a major, major obstacle to the achievement of Israeli-Palestinian peace. It is a systemic injustice violating the rights of the Palestinian people and poses a severe threat to Israel's long-term future as a democratic homeland for the Jewish people. Military rule over millions of Palestinians who lack civil and political rights represents a daily infringement on the basic rights and aspirations of the Palestinian people and has been extremely detrimental to Israel's democracy, security, economy, and regional standing. That's what most American Jews believe. But APEC speaks for us because APEC is the warmongering lobbying arm for the military industrial complex. You cannot lobby for peace. There's no money in peace with the Palestinians or with anybody. So you will only hear from the people who want Americans to buy bombs. You don't hear about J Street on CNN or MSNBC or in any of the mainstream media, the same way most Americans want Medicare for all. And we never hear the argument for it, even though Americans want Medicare for all. You can't hear anybody outlining why we should be negotiating drug prices with Big Pharma, the same way you can't hear from J Street. You only hear from the right wing hawks from APEC, and it creates the unfortunate misconception that APEC speaks for American Jews and Israelis. It doesn't. APEC has been called the second most powerful lobby in Washington. But it doesn't lobby for peace with the Palestinians. It lobbies for military equipment. It lobbies for countering Iran's nuclear ambitions. And it lobbies for a weakened Palestinian people. APEC, bad. J Street, good. APEC, evil. J Street, beautiful. The Guardian recently interviewed J Street's spokesperson, Logan Bayroff, who charged APEC of serving as a front for the Republican Party. 
think that would be worthy of an article here in the United States, little infighting between 80% of the American Jews who support J Street and the 20% of stupid American Jews who support APEC. You would think that would be a story. Uh, the spokesperson for J Street accused APEC of strongly supporting Donald Trump. The spokesman for J Street said APEC intimidates candidates from criticizing Israel's treatment of the Palestinians by threatening to fund campaigns against them. The spokesman for J Street said, quote, APEC is taking all this money from Republican donors and they're obfuscating the fact that they're a very Republican aligned organization while trying to persuade Democratic voters who they should support. See, APAC has a problem with American Jews because 80% of American Jews vote for Democrats. So APAC has to find a sneaky way into the Democratic Party. So, so what you have is you have APAC, a front for the Republican Party, and this front for the Republican Party, APAC, set up a front for APAC, and they called it the United Democracy Project. That's what I'm telling you, and that's what the spokesman for J Street told The Guardian. Speaking of this front group, this dark money front group called the United Democracy Project, the spokesman for J Street, who represents 80% of American Jews, told The Guardian, quote, the United Democracy Project, that's the front group set up by APEC, the United Democracy Project sounds innocuous. And the advertising that they're running in these districts is about health care and reproductive rights and things that have nothing to do with Israel, which makes sense because those are the things that decide elections, not Israel. He goes on to say, but the reason that they're aligning with certain candidates is because they are more aligned with their more hawkish positions on Israel and because they fear that other candidates will be more progressive and aligned with the Palestinians. You see what's going on? Most Jews are Democrats, about 80%. APAC is Republican. It's an ultra right wing Republican lobbying group. APAC supported Trump. And Jewish Democrats know exactly who APAC is, and they know it doesn't represent Jewish values. And APAC knows that Jewish Americans are on to APAC. So APAC set up a straw organization and they called it United for Democracy. And it never admits to being a Jewish organization. But they target Jewish Democratic voters away from progressive candidates. They try to do this even though Jewish Democrats traditionally vote progressive. This is bad shit. This is dark money shit. APEC is a chicken shit organization. They don't even call themselves Jewish in their name. And they set up an organization that doesn't even have the name APEC or Judaism in it. Now look, I believe in a two-state solution. I believe what Israel's George Washington, David Ben-Gurion said when Israel won the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. He said, this will not end well. That's what David Ben-Gurion, the founding father of Israel, said after Israel annexed the West Bank. He said, this will not end well. I believe anti-Semitism is a perennial. It's like seersucker. It never goes out of style. I believe that Judaism in many ways can't exist without anti-Semitism. Therefore, I believe it is incumbent upon the world community to guarantee a safe haven for Jews. And I believe that safe haven is Israel. I also believe Israel has no place in Gaza or the West Bank. And the way forward is compromise 
not war or terrorism, compromise. I also believe APEC needs to stay out of American elections. I believe APEC needs to stay out of American elections. When Russia tampers with American elections, we don't like it. This week, Steve Wynn, the casino magnate, was charged by our Justice Department with violating FARA by lobbing Donald Trump on behalf of China. Trump's friend, Tom Barack, this week was indicted by the federal government for illegally lobbying the Trump administration on behalf of the UAE. Rudy Giuliani is being investigated on accusations that Rudy lobbied the Trump administration on behalf of the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv. Americans, like George Washington, we don't like foreigners lobbying our government. If you want to lobby the American government, you must be registered as a foreign agent. And we certainly don't like foreign countries influencing our elections, especially donating to candidates. Now, APAC is registered as a Washington lobbyist, but it is not registered as a foreign lobbyist. See, APEC found a legal loophole. It claims it isn't lobbying for Israel. It claims it's lobbying on behalf of Americans who support the state of Israel. I think in Latin, the term for that is bullshit. APEC doesn't represent Israel or American Jews. Like I said, 80% of American Jews don't support the ultra-conservative parties inside Israel's government, which APEC lobbies for. APEC lobbies on behalf of the MAGA wing of Israeli politics. MJ Rosenberg worked over at APEC for half a decade, and MJ Rosenberg was disgusted by it. He quit and went on to work over in Congress. Three years ago, M.J. Rosenberg wrote an article for The Forward. That's one of the world's leading Jewish newspapers. The article was entitled, It's Time for APEC to Register as a Foreign Agent. Here's what M.J. Rosenberg, who used to work for APEC, wrote in The Forward. Quote, it is time to require APEC to register as what it is, a foreign agent. It will still be able to advocate for Israel, but as an Israeli lobby, which admits to getting its marching orders from the Israeli government. Oh, he's wrong. It gets its marching orders from the right wing of the Israeli government. Look, um, I don't want to talk about APAC, but I'm one of the few people who can criticize APAC without being accused of anti-Semitism. I call on American Jews to speak out against APAC. APAC is not your ally. APAC is ultra right wing. And when there's an ultra right wing party in Israel, APAC is lobbying for that party, that coalition of ultra right wing war hawks. They don't represent the Israeli government. APEC represents the crackpots in the Israeli government. Yes, APEC, in all fairness, it doesn't get its money from right wing Israeli political parties. That's true. It gets its money from the same people, however, that these ultra right wing Israeli political parties get their money from. MJ Rosenberg, who used to work for APAC, wrote in the forward. He writes about APAC, how APAC should be forced to register as a foreign agent. He says if it had to register as a foreign agent, then, quote, it would not be able to directly campaign 
to politicians. It could not give money to politicians. APAC should not be giving money to politicians. No foreign lobbyist should be giving money to politicians. APAC is a super PAC, which means it can donate indirectly to candidates, right? Uh, but as of 2021, APAC is now donating directly to candidates. MJ Rosenberg goes on to write, let's see how many vice presidents, senators and representatives show up at its conferences, APAC's conferences, when they're no longer getting money from APAC. Let's see how many of its Israeli right or wrong resolutions pass the House 435 to zero. Let's see if presidents are still afraid to say what they think about the occupation and the denial of democratic rights to Palestinians without that money from APAC. That's MJ Rosenberg writing in the forward. He is saying that the reason so many Democratic and Republican lawmakers don't criticize Israel's treatment of the Palestinians is because it's all about the Benjamins, specifically the Benjamin Netanyahu's. It's all about the Benjamins. It's all about the Benjamins. It's all about the money. Now, am I anti-Semitic for saying APAC is silencing Congress the very same way the NRA silences Congress, you know, through the Benjamins, through money? Because it is all about the Benjamins, baby. We all know it's all about the Benjamins, baby. That's not anti-Semitic. That's the truth. Am I anti-Semitic for saying that? Ilhan Omar apparently is. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar in 2019 was forced to apologize when she explained away Washington's unconditional support for Israel in a tweet that read, quote, it's all about the Benjamins, baby. What's wrong with that? It is all about the Benjamins, baby. You think these politicians care about Israel? Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the entire Democratic leadership issued a joint statement demanding Congresswoman Omar apologize for what they called her anti-Semitic tropes and prejudicial accusations about Israel's supporters. They called her words deeply offensive. So if you accuse AIPAC of buying Washington's silence on the treatment of Palestinians, then I guess that's anti-Semitism? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, funny how AIPAC is MAGA, and MAGA is obsessed about censorship, right? But we don't hear MAGA complaining about how you cannot... Uh, criticize Israel without being accused of anti-Semitism. I went to an Orthodox Hebrew school. I read Hebrew. I went to Orthodox Hebrew school three days a week until I was 18. And I get it. I understand uh, it's not safe to be Jewish in this world. People hate Jews and they always will. And there's nothing that will ever stop people from hating Jews. There is nothing Israel could ever do to get people to stop hating Jews. Israel, I hope, makes peace with the Palestinians and there's a two-state solution. There will still be anti-Semitism around the world because there is nothing the Jews could ever do to stop anti-Semitism. And I believe Jews, Jews should stand up for themselves the same way I believe the LGBTQ community, blacks, Muslims, women, every group, Palestinians, Arabs, every group of people who fear for their physical safety and economic security, I believe everybody who fears for their physical safety and economic security should stand up for themselves. I'm going to wrap it up in five minutes. I don't want to go long here. Jews cannot defend the situation in Gaza. It's indefensible. You can offer up a million reasons why Gaza is the way it is, but you cannot defend 
the situation in Gaza. It's indefensible. Now, I do think we're at a point where Israel, at least for a while, doesn't have to do anything about Gaza and the West Bank. I think nobody in the Middle East is rushing to the Palestinians' defense. I think the, the Palestinians right now are pretty much isolated. Then again, I'm usually wrong. But for the time being, I believe that Israel, if they so choose, can continue to ignore Gaza and the West Bank. There will be occasional flare-ups like what's going on right now, wars, terrorist attacks, assassinations on Israeli soil or in Gaza or on the West Bank. And I believe that a cost-benefit analysis for right-wing Israelis will reveal that all this noise is a small price to pay for what we have right now, and that is relative stability, right? I think this situation right now as it is can continue uh, with occasional eruptions. But here's the problem for Israel, as I see it. Gaza makes Jews stupid. Forget all the women and children without potable water on the Gaza Strip or the jobs. There are no jobs there. Forget there's no place to live in Gaza. Forget all that. Forget it. Forget that more and more Americans are secretly turning on Israel. Forget that. Forget more and more American Jews are beginning to think, I'm a Jew. I'm not an Israeli. I'm a Jew. Why do I have to get blamed for something in a country I visited once? My advice to Israel, forget all that. Forget that the status quo over time will make Israel increasingly isolated from the world and that Jews around the world will distance themselves from Israel. Forget all that. Because I do think Israel can survive all of that. I really do. I think Israel can stay exactly the way it is, not give an inch, and Israel will survive. But there's a price. Israelis and the Jews who defend the Israelis' treatment of the Palestinians will become increasingly stupid. The Israelis will become just as stupid as Americans. War, violence, oppression, police brutality makes a country stupid. You have to be stupid to allow that to happen. America is a stupid country because we must defend the indefensible. Defending the indefensible makes you stupid. It spreads like a cancer. You get dumber. You defend one stupid thing. You defend one indefensible thing. It makes you stupid enough to start defending other indefensible things. That's why America is such a stupid, stupid country. Once you defend the situation in Gaza, it becomes increasingly easier to defend other injustices. But in order to do that, you must be stupid and you must make sure the people you share your country with are even dumber than you are. The price Israel is going to pay for this treatment, this indefensible treatment of the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank is the price is a lot of stupid Jews. You have to be stupid to defend this. Like I said, look how stupid America is. Look how we spend $1 trillion a year on defense with no real enemies. You got to be pretty stupid to spend that kind of money on defense while we have people living on the streets. 400 million guns. Got to be pretty stupid to think the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Only a stupid person could say that, and only an even dumber person could believe that. We must, you know, 
deny man-made climate change, right? You know, that's what we do here in America. We convince ourselves it's not happening as quickly as the weather reports indicate. You know, when you look outside, it looks like the planet has like three months left. But, you know, if everybody is dumber than you are, you can convince them that divesting this country of fossil fuels doesn't make sense. Got to be a stupid country to pay oil companies subsidies to drill more for profit health care. Only a stupid country could believe that our government transferring trillions of dollars to health insurance companies to pay for our medical procedures is the free market. You can only be stupid to say that, and you have to be dumber to believe that our healthcare system right now is the free market. We have the most expensive and the worst healthcare in the industrialized world because we're stupid. Only a nation of idiots would put up with it. And we are stupid. We don't know any better. To spend another $40 billion on weapons for Ukraine instead of insisting on a ceasefire? This is a nation of stupid people. We are the stupidest country on the planet because we spend more on weapons than everybody else com combined. And that's what's making us stupid because it's indefensible. I would hate Israel to become as stupid as America. I would hate Jews who defend Israel to become as stupid as the my country, right or wrong, love it or leave it, patriotic goons whose love for America only flows from its ability to make war. Like I said, Israel can, can continue to treat the Palestinians like human sewage. It can, and it will survive the same way America is in denial about killing millions in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. We have survived killing hundreds of thousands of civilians in our 20-year war against terror. We survive. The world hates America, but it doesn't matter. We're still standing, but we're stupid. To be patriotic in America, you have to be stupid. To defend the idea of America, our racist founding fathers who stripped the teeth out of the mouths of slaves to make dentures for George Washington, to defend our constitution, this constitution that doesn't work. We, we have to be stupid. And APAC is making Israel stupid. It's making 20% of American Jews stupid. Most importantly, what I find offensive about APAC, it thinks Jews are stupid. And I'm offended by that. I am offended that APAC thinks Jews only think that we have to make war with the Palestinians, not peace. I'm offended that APAC insults the intelligence of Jews, thinking that Jews believe in making war, not peace with the Palestinians. I believe APAC is anti-Semitic. I believe not criticizing APEC is anti-Semitic. I believe APEC hates Jews and only loves the far right crackpots in the Israeli government. I think APEC thinks most Jews are stupid and I think APEC makes us less safe. I think APEC is bad for the Jews. I think APEC hates the Jews, I think APAC is anti-Semitic. And I think not criticizing APAC is anti-Semitic. Uh, I urge all American Jews to tell APAC to register as a foreign lobbyist and stay out of our democracy. We will be right back. Well, that's not happening. That wasn't happening. Whereas we're running a little behind, we'll get to everybody. <laughs> Thank you.
Democracy's in change, we could bury its remains, but infotainment culture has infected our brains. We're living every day, we're living every night in the USA of distraction. The wisdom we receive, the reality we perceive, is burned into our brains by cable TV. Scandal, crime, and disaster lead the news fear and white anxiety shape our views the fourth estate has crumbled into an irrelevant heap critical thinking is all but asleep cause we're living every day we're living every night in the USA of distraction the pathological pursuit of power and profit drives everything in sight. Not sure we can stop it. Corporate plutocracy has risen to the top. We've lost the power to think, so we shop until we drop. We're surveilled and monitored while they keep us all distracted. So we never notice that our data has been extracted. We're living every day, we're living every night in the USA of distraction. All right. The Reagan agenda, a libertarian notion of sweeping deregulation has been put into motion. Our eyeballs seldom stray too far away from the mega monopolies that command the day. Diversity in media is gone, gone, gone. Slowly fading out like a sad, sad song. We're living every day, we're living every night in the USA of distraction. The telegenic spectacle of tabloid celebrity has squeezed out any room for social integrity. With profits to be made and minds to be molded, the media crushes the truth even when it's been scolded. It's books now more than ever that people need to read. Folks are hypnotized by their Twitter feed. We're living every day, we're living every night in the USA of Now we can't seem to get out of this neoliberal nightmare that cares more for Wall Street than anybody's health care. We've been bruised, battered, defunded, and dismantled. We've been diminished, infiltrated, manipulated, and manhandled. The sovereignty of citizenship, the bulwark of democracy, is under full attack by the cult of meritocracy. We're living every day. Yeah. Well, we're living every night. USA A distraction Where we're living every day 
Professor Mike Steinel, and thank you to Todd from Tucson, who gave us some money in the Super Chat. So thank you. I'm paying attention to the Super Chat. This is exciting. Last week, well, this is the, this is exciting. The show and Grace Jackson is about to join us. Last weekend, two mass shootings made the news in America, first in New York, also in California. The shooting in California happened on May 15th in Orange County, leaving one man dead and five injured. At a press conference the day after the shooting, the uh, Orange County uh, police identified the shooter as an immigrant from China and say that the killing was possibly motivated by hatred of Taiwan, which as we know is a self-ruled island claimed by China. However, in subsequent days, more details emerged about the shooter's identity and beliefs, which paint a much more complicated picture. Here to talk us through some of the nuances of this case and what it tells us about the complex history and uh, what's go complex history of Chinese and Taiwanese identities and what's going on between them right now is Grace Jackson, co-host of the Literary Hangover podcast. She is an expert on history and fiction and China, at least on this show. I know she doesn't like to be called an expert, but you are an expert. You're the closest thing we have to an expert on this show. Thank you, Grace, for joining us. Thanks, David. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, how's Astrid? She's fine. She's actually downstairs. Um, I had her behind me, but I, I thought she was going to act out. So I've uh, I've put her away and... Yeah, I want to talk about this um, this Please. horrible thing that happened. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry that I don't have light relief for listeners after your um, <laughs> after your monologue. <laughs> Maybe we should get Jackie the Joke Man in on an emergency basis. He wrote that, by the way, that entire thing. He, <laughs> it's one. Uh, well, um, yeah, I think once I take a week off, I'll be a little less on edge. But mm. it's, it's the midterms, and uh, so let's talk about this yeah. the, the shooting and the tension between Chinese Americans, I guess, and Taiwanese Americans, and what's well. Um, actually, it's not really about that tension, although okay. that tension does exist. Um, the reason I want to talk about this is that it it really kind of gets to the heart of the complex and kind of interconnected history of China and Taiwan, or the histories, I should say, and what's at stake in how we interpret those histories today. And it's actually, this goes way beyond the quite simple geopolitical debate about whether Taiwan is a part of China. This actually brings to the surface a lot of the more messy questions about ethnic identity and national identity across China, Taiwan, and in the diaspora, in the United States especially. Um, so, yeah, before we dive in, I'll, I'll just remind people of the facts of the case as we know them currently. Yeah. Uh, so on May 15th, a 68-year-old man named David Cho attended a, a Sunday school class in a luncheon hosted by the Irvin Taiwanese Presbyterian Church. This is a group that worships at the Geneva Presbyterian Church in Laguna Woods, which I believe is, is something of a retirement community uh, in Orange County. So Cho had driven 270 miles from Las Vegas to attend this service. He brought two guns with him and several explosive devices. He kind of hid out in the church after attending the service. And at some point in the afternoon, he began to chain the doors shut and also nail them shut. Uh, and then he began shooting. A 52-year-old man, a doctor called John Chung, 
And one of the youngest members of the congregation actually rushed the shooter and tried to disarm him and he was killed. Five other people were badly injured and, and their ages were between 66 and 92 years old. So you can already get a feel for the, the nature of this congregation, quite elderly. Um, to move on, I want to talk and he about was elderly, the location. Right? The shooter was Sorry? also, the, the shooter, I believe, was like in his 60s, right? Yeah, yeah. He was 68. Um, and I'll get to him a little bit later. Okay. But first, I just want to talk about the the location of the shooting and the nature of the community that it targeted, because these are very important factors. Um, so as I said, this was mostly an elderly congregation of Taiwanese Americans who spoke and worshipped in the Taiwanese dialect, not Mandarin Chinese, uh, and who identified as Taiwanese or Taiwanese American, not Chinese and not Chinese American. Now, based on what we know about migratory trends and the history of, of the past 50 or so years, most of these congregants, I would say, will have left Taiwan in the 1980s with young families. After the U.S. switched its recognition from the Republic of China on Taiwan to the People's Republic of China on the mainland, and we, we covered this in, in one of my earlier segments. So after that, many people left Taiwan. Uh, sort of sensing that opportunities are not going to be um, uh, many in Taiwan at that point. And they would have also been escaping one of the world's longest martial law regimes, which was instituted by Chiang Kai-shek, the dictator, in 1949 and lasted until 1987. Now, under martial law, or what's also known as the White Terror Period, Chiang Kai-shek's KMT party, which had lost the civil war to the communists in 1949. They brutally persecuted Taiwanese elites, intellectuals, dissidents, um, anyone who resisted the one-party rule uh, or who had leftist sympathies, because this was an, an anti-communist regime. And here, when I say Taiwanese, I mean people whose ancestors had come to Taiwan from southern China, before the Second World War, many of them actually during the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, during the Qing dynasty period. And during the White Terror, the KMT murdered and disappeared thousands of Taiwanese people, both actual dissidents and those who were just guilty by association. And the number given is as high as 28,000 by historians. Um, Crucially, they also suppressed local languages. So the ability to speak their mother tongue was just one of the freedoms that Taiwanese people were seeking when they left for the US uh, in the 70s and 80s. Wow. And so that's what makes this, this relevant, that this was a Taiwanese speaking community that was targeted. Now, what's also really interesting and tells us so much about history is that this was a Presbyterian church. Now, during the White Terror period in Taiwan, the Taiwanese Presbyterian church was a site of resistance, of political resistance. And this is fascinating because the roots of the Presbyterian church in Taiwan go back to the 19th century, when British and Canadian missionaries established congregations there. Um, now, like most missionaries, they provided education, social services, and other things while converting populations. Um, but in addition, the church actually had a formative role in the development of a distinctive Taiwanese identity. It was actually Presbyterian missionaries who helped Taiwanese people Romanize their language, which is to say Taiwanese was a spoken language without a script. And these Presbyterian missionaries they basically helped, helped people to develop a way of writing Taiwanese using the Roman alphabet, a kind of transliteration. So today, if you actually sign up to take a Taiwanese language class, which you, you can do in the US, um, you'll most likely be taught to write Taiwanese using the Roman alphabet as opposed to Chinese characters. Wow. So that's a really interesting piece of that history. Yeah. Um, now, in, in addition to this cultural kind of promotion of Taiwanese identity, the Presbyterian Church is also in Taiwan. It's a deeply political 
uh, institution. It had pretty close ties to the democracy movement that helped end martial law in the 1980s. Um, and this, you know, this kind of makes sense. I mean, I've been to Presbyterian services in Taiwan before, and it, it does make sense when you think about the congruence of of the teachings around struggle, justice, liberation. Um, so you can think of this as a kind of liberation theology for Taiwan during the Japanese colonial period and, and also under KMT one party rule. So to that extent, the Presbyterian church has very close ties to the democratic progressive party, which is currently in power in Taiwan. Um, and when when migrants arrived in the US from Taiwan, they would have gravitated to these institutions, to these churches. And in the US, they functioned as kind of social havens for the Taiwanese American community, especially the, the elderly um, who maybe didn't learn English fluently or didn't kind of assimilate in the same way that, say, their children or grandchildren have. So it was really a place where elderly Taiwanese came to support each other um, and probably a bit less political than it would be in Taiwan. So that's kind of a profile of, great. of the Amazing. church. Thank you. Um, incredible. Thank you. David, I want to move yep. on to the, the guy who did this. Yes. Um, this man, David Cho, the shooter, he was, well, details are still emerging about him, but there's a few things we know about him that, that are relevant, I think. Um, first of all, contrary to assumptions and the initial statement by the, the sheriff of Orange County, David Cho did not come from mainland China uh, as such. He was born in Taiwan in 1953. So his parents likely came to Taiwan just a few years earlier with Chiang Kai-shek's retreat to Taiwan in the late 1940s. Um, when Chiang Kai-shek uh, arrived in Taiwan, he actually brought around a million migrants with him from the mainland. This was the nationalist army and people who had fought with them, collaborated with them, who were fleeing uh, the communists in defeat. These people were known in Taiwan as mainlanders. Um, there was quite a distinction between them and those who had been in Taiwan for centuries before that. Now, this distinction was was very salient during the martial law period, um, and it still retains some significance among older generations in Taiwan. But in the decades since the end of martial law, its salience has faded, uh, partly with the passing of that older generation, uh, partly as a result of intermarriage between the mm -hmm. two groups, and partly, I would argue, as a result of the development of a much more inclusive democratic reform. definition of Taiwanese identity. Yeah, exactly. The democratic kind of melting pot idea, right. which is not based on ethnicity or race, but rather on democratic principles, civic values, basically the, the ability to vote. You know, it's, a, it's right. supposedly a great leveler. So these days, there's not a huge distinction made between those two groups. But when this man was growing up, there would have been. And it may have even been along class lines, like those who were persecuted the most by Chiang Kai-shek on Taiwan were the elites. They were the intellectuals, the doctors, the lawyers, the people who were but did they, involved they, in politics. Did they Were they part of the million who came from the mainland or were they the ones who were already there? Those who were already there, who had maybe benefited from some of the Japanese education policies under the colonial administration. I see. Um, wow. So they would have been, while they were persecuted by the KMT brutally, they would have also retained some of their kind of elite cultural status. And someone like David Cho, whose family came with the nationalists, were compelled to come to Taiwan in defeat. They would have, he would have, his family would have benefited from some of the policies of the KMT, but culturally speaking, they were not, probably would have been considered inferior to the Taiwanese. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a funny it's, mix. Do you mind if I, I don't want to interrupt you. I'm just curious. Oh. So Chiang Kai-shek brings with him a million mainland Chinese 
to Taiwan, they dominate, their ethnicity dominates? Not their ethnicity as such, but their political identity. So the fact that they are associated with the ruling party but they're meant not... that they were so, sort of safe from the kind of persecution uh, that was you know, being directed towards the Taiwanese elites who were resisting one party rule. So the people who'd been there before, not happy about the situation. And the people, the people who, is, it, is it fair to say that the people who had been in Taiwan before Chiang Kai-shek and his one million are like Boston Brahmins? They viewed themselves as landed aristocracy. They, they were, and they were smart, like better educated? Yeah, in many cases, that, that's right. I'm not sure about the landed aristocracy notion, but certainly culturally and in terms of education level, there was a pretty well-established elite um, who had done quite well under the Japanese so who had Chiang educated Kai -shek, themselves. Did Chiang Kai-shek need the, the, the original, the, the people who were there before him to, you need... Doctors, well, lawyers, he, it was more of a might makes right kind of a situation for him. So instead of co-opting those groups, he that was why he needed to institute martial law, because he wasn't willing to compromise. Um, and there was also this idea that it was only temporary for Chiang Kai-shek, that he right. was using Taiwan as a as a perch for him to retake the mainland eventually, which he never fully renounced, even wow. though it was pretty obvious it wasn't going to happen. So it was never, wow. it, it was a kind of half measure in a way, because he, he always had his eyes on the mainland. And that actually brings us back to yeah. this guy, David Cho, who did not buy the inclusive definition of Taiwanese identity that has grown up in the past few decades. In fact, he seems to have despised it. Um, he, he identified not as a Taiwanese person, but as a Chinese person. Now, this is kind of confusing and annoying if you're not a real nerd about this stuff, but there's a lot of confusion about this. This man was not necessarily identifying with the People's Republic of China when he, when he identified with being Chinese. Uh, and we don't know whether he really identified with the Communist Party of China. But based on what we know of history, it seems like he was motivated by a very potent form of Chinese nationalism that sees Taiwanese identity as an existential threat. And this was a nationalism I'm sorry, that was say actually, that again, please, that last sentence. He, he, what, what was an exit? He viewed the development of a distinctive Taiwanese identity as an existential threat to his Chinese identity. I see. And this, this kind of Chinese nationalism actually predates um, the Civil War. It was, it was nurtured during the Republican period after the fall of the Qing. And it shares a one China principle with the Chinese Communist Party. So these two nationalisms, one is like <laughs> China includes Taiwan and is ruled by the Communist Party of China. The other is China is ruled by the KMT Right. And includes Taiwan. So it's like two animals of the same species, two different animals, same so you're, species. So, uh, so you're saying that if, because there is this Asian pivot that America is prepping yep. for, mm. we're looking for spending money on a war, supposedly to protect Taiwan from China. Are you saying that it wouldn't be a clean war. It would be like Iraq. Like we, we went into Iraq. Literally, George W. Bush didn't know that there was a difference between Shiites, Kurds, and Sunnis. Mm. I'm not making that up. People don't believe yeah. me when I say that. But that's true. Yeah. So uh, what, what's going to happen? Uh, what, are we, what similar experience are we going to discover on Taiwan? Well, um, it would be a horrible, drawn-out 
bloody, nasty war. It wouldn't be a clean war. There's no such thing, right? Would there be but, a civil? Would we see a civil war on the island? No, you would not see a civil war because within Taiwan today, there is an unprecedented level of of kind of unity on the question of Taiwan having its own trajectory, having its having self determination. Right? There are lots of people on Taiwan. Who identify with China somewhat, but that doesn't mean they want to be unified with China politically. Right. So what I'm trying to get at here is the idea that they are connected. There are connections, historically conditioned connections between them, but Taiwanese identity has been evolving ever since. Well, the Presbyterians were on Taiwan and before that. Right. And it's it's already developed into its own distinctive. Um, thing and so I think if if China were to invade Taiwan, they would meet a hell of a lot of resistance, and I don't think there would be a civil war. Right. So, right. Um, yeah, just to tie this up, I I guess there's still a lot of things coming out about this shooter's beliefs. Um, he appears to have been a part of a, the, P, the Peaceful Reunification Promotion Association in Las Vegas, which is an entity linked at least to the United Front Work Department of the Communist Party. Um, and today it came out that he sent seven volumes of diaries titled Diaries of an Angel Destroying Independence, a reference to Taiwanese independence right. to a Chinese language newspaper before he set out on his spree. So it, it sounds like he was a real extremist. Um, there's also some bizarre social media reports that he was roommates with a far right kind of neo-Nazi figure in Las Vegas, um, unconfirmed, but seems plausible wow. perhaps given, wow. given the ext extremism of his views. So. What a great, what a brilliant way to explain Taiwan. That, oh, good. You, <laughs> thank you. What a brilliant, brilliant uh, soft entry point, as Michael Brooks used to say, into oh. what's going on in, in Taiwan. Well, Grace Jackson, come back Monday, please. Uh, Hey. Always. Thank Come you. Come do every show with us. We love you. I get and <laughs> and I get. I, I don't forward you the fan mail. Oh. Because uh, it's never good. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but I get a lot of uh, emails. Well, more. I got to keep my ego in check, David. Well, I'll crush you. Believe me. Okay, uh, Grace thanks. Jackson is a a brilliant, brilliant. Uh, I, that goes without saying. Uh, her podcast is literary hangover and follow her on twitter at grace jackson thank you and thank you for helping keep the show going grace is one of the part of our crew here so uh very humbling to uh to have you be a part of the show thank you grace Thanks, david bye thank you say hello to astrid for me i will thank you and thank you to todd from tucson for the super chat now joining us and feel free to if you want to stick around grace because we're going to talk about your favorite subject the view abc's the view i know you watch it in, in great britain megan mccain recently left the view she wrote a book and ben burgess professor ben burgess columnist for jacobin did the dirty work and read it you do this a lot you read glenn bet you are willing to read this garbage, aren't you? Uh, yeah, no, I, I should. I, I don't know how many medals I deserve for <laughs> uh, for for reading it. It's a pretty short book, but I did uh, I did read it. Uh, so it's called uh, Bad Republican, and it's basically her her memoir of the last uh, the last few years and how she feels like she's been horribly mistreated by everyone. Right. So. Tell us what's in the book. Is there anything in the book that is remotely sympathetic? Yeah. Um, so, you know, one thing I say in the review is I think that the writing style here is, and I actually think she probably did write it herself. Um, she well, you think? This, 
<laughs> or at least there's a good chance, you know, because like there's nothing in it that makes me think otherwise. Let me put it that way. Yeah. So uh, her, her husband is uh, Ben Dominic, who's the uh, who's the uh, founder of the Federalist. Right. So yeah, the the book uh, covers her relationship with with Ben Dominic and married him and having their child uh, Liberty uh, and. Um, and it and it covers you know the Trump presidency and COVID and her her years on the View and all of that, uh, and I, I I think that because her writing style seems to have been gotten frozen in 2008, where uh, real heads may remember that she was uh, in 2008. She was cool. She a, uh, yeah, she was great. Uh, she had a uh, she had a blog. It was called McCain Blogette. You know, it was supposed to humanize you know her dad while he's running for president. Uh, and and her writing style really does seem to have gotten frozen in like the sort of 2008 blogging era, uh, and it's very unfiltered, right? No details is too embarrassing to include, uh, and you know I think that the best thing you can say about it is that it's very raw and vulnerable, uh, which means that she's describing uh, her dad, John McCain. Um, you know, getting cancer and dying that like even somebody like me who sees John McCain as a war criminal and strongly suspects that the uh, most important difference between the Trump administration and the hypothetical McCain administration is that John McCain would have been more likely to invade Iran. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, I mean, even I found that part kind of moving, right? I mean, like that was like that made me feel some sympathy for her because as much as I think that he was an objectively awful human being, Right. Like, you know, look, he's her dad. She loved him. He got brain cancer. It's a horrible thing. Now, that said, the problem is she's every bit as raw and vulnerable when she's describing her nonsensical sense of aggrievement at, um, you know, the New York, you know, media world and her ex colleagues and the nurses in the maternity ward who made her feel judged and the students at Reed college who were mean to her in the Q and a, and you know, all of this stuff, right? Like no matter, you know, like she's the sort of level of like, Oh, poor me is like constant, you know, throughout the, uh, throughout the entire thing, you know? So, um, she, uh, she has, for example, like, I'll, I'll just give you really briefly, you know, um, well, there's so much to choose from right. one of my fa- favorite examples, which is uh, in the summer of 2020, uh, Megan and, and her husband, Ben Dominic, uh, were uh, riding out the pandemic in Virginia, but she still maintained the apartment in New York. And uh, as the riots were going on, she tweets the following. My neighborhood in Manhattan is eviscerated. It looks like a war zone. De Blasio and Cuomo are an utter disgrace. This is not America. Our leaders have abandoned us. And Uh, continue to let great American cities burn to the ground and be destroyed. I never could have fathomed this. And then uh, there's this writer for, uh, there's like a Samantha Bee writer, uh, Kristen Bartlett, who quote tweets her with a single sentence, which is, Megan, we live in the same building, and I just walked outside. It's fine. Right. I remember that. Uh, And Megan McCain writes about this thing as if it were a traumatic experience, you know, that she says she had to like break, you know, they were still maintaining that apartment, but she had to like break her lease and move all her stuff out and never return to New York again. Cause it was so terrible that this TV writer quote tweeted her and said something stark in it. And like, you know, however many thousands of people liked or retweeted it uh, because and she, the way she describes it is, is if, she were being doxxed by the act of this person saying she lived in the same building, which is confusing because that assumes that we all know where Kristen Bartlett lives. Right. Uh, you know, but um, it's, you know, but like she has to find some way to, to cast it as a traumatic event. Uh, and similarly, right. Like earlier in the book, uh, she's describing uh, this um, ordeal that she had uh, the Seth Myers uh, show where, uh, where Myers was uh, grilling her, about comments she made about Congressman Ilhan Omar, you know, spirit Omar is the anti-Semite. Uh, and even though Megan is the one in this equation who's like throwing around accusations of bigotry uh, in, you know, much the same way that she would complain about, you know, that she was on the other foot, uh, she's, uh, sh- her description of, of this 
is like, this is such a horrible traumatic thing that Seth Meyers was so mean to her that she vowed to like never go on late night TV again. And I watched the clip cause I was thinking, okay, how about ba- like, man, what did Seth Meyers do to her? And I guess what he did is he brought it up more times than she was comfortable with or like he didn't let go of the question, but uh, his word choices are extremely polite. Tone of his voice is very mild about the worst thing he says about her is that she was being a little unfair. That was the phrase, a little mm-hmm. unfair Dill Hot Omar. But like, it's hard to overstate how traumatic she represents this as, as being. She actually says in the book that, uh, her initial impulse was to blame her miscarriage shortly afterward on on how on how mean Seth Myers was to her in that interview. Hey, maybe Seth Myers could get hired to visit women in Texas. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so um, I would do that for to make a little money. I would go. I would travel through Texas and have them on and, my and show just, and just give them traumatic interviews as a, <laughs> as a legal workaround to anti-abortion laws. Yeah, uh, yeah. At the uh, and then my my very favorite example is she's you know at one time she used to go around and speak on college campuses, but she says her career speaking at college campuses came to a screeching halt in 2012 at Reed College. Since so she agreed to speak there, she realized how liberal it would be, and she showed up and she gave her speech, which is about her career and the lack of real discourse between blah 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 blah, right and. As far as I can tell from her description, there wasn't even a protest, right? Nobody heckled her. Everybody clapped politely when she was done talking. But the Q&A session was so horrible, she could never go to another college again. Mm. And what she describes in the Q&A session is basically sounds like people asking her somewhat tough questions about taxes and stuff on the assumption that she would know the answers, which, of course, she didn't. Right. Uh, And uh, she actually says... At one point, this is my possibly my favorite sentence in the book. Where there's a lot of competition. Uh, <laughs> this that, is so great. Uh, actually, no. My favorite sentence in the book is the one where she describes her job at the View. Which, remember, this is a job expressing political opinions on daytime television mm-hmm. as spiritually, mentally, and physically exhausting. Wow. Oh. Uh, but uh, but one of my favorites is when she says um, that. You know, so she advocated uh, flat taxes and a balanced budget uh, in uh, in her you know answer to the question you know in college, and then uh, she said she was asked a complicated question about this. She doesn't say what the question is. I suspect you know she doesn't strike me as a reliable narrator. So right. you know, uh, but she was asked supposedly a very complicated question about this, uh, and. You know, possibly it was something like how many people would die if we had to slash the social safety net to the point where we could have both of those things. But in any case, she was asked a complicated question and she said she didn't understand. And then uh, another student got up and said, well, how could you come and opine about these things if, if you don't if you don't actually know about them? And uh, she could, I don't know if she used this line at Reed College, but in the book, she she compares this to say that um you can't have a favorite baseball team if you don't know all the uh, players' batting averages, which um, I think is pretty amazing if you like just kind of sit up, like sit with that analogy for a second. Because mm-hmm. she's not even comparing political commentary to like sports commentary, right? Like right. I, I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty sure even, you know, like okay, look, I'm sure even Skip Bayless doesn't know every single player's you know averages, etc. Off the top of his head, maybe he does, but you know, maybe he doesn't, right? But I don't think a, an audience of undergraduates could embarrass him if he was if he was on their campus to talk about baseball. And it's such a it's it's just such an awesomely like shallow. It's like, well, if you're just like a casual fan of this analogy, why is anybody hearing from you? Why are you on television? Why do you have a column at the Daily Mail? You know, why why were you in this like co-host of this prominent show for four years? Mm-hmm. Uh, and but it really is telling, you know, because like elsewhere in the book, she makes a big deal about how much she she doesn't like Trump. Right. She goes on and on about how she doesn't like Trump. And, you know, she uh, uh, she says when people are mean to her, she says, well, they're taking out the frustrations with Trump on me, even though I'm anti-Trump. You know, she says she voted against Trump and, you know, whatever. I lived in a swing state, you know. I voted for Biden, too. I guess I guess Megan McCain and I voted the same way. Uh, but um, like 
I have to say, if I were a Republican, I'd be reading this and think, oh, my God, why are you you voted for Democrats? Why exactly? Because she doesn't actually seem to have any policy criticisms of Trump. She, you know, the only policy thing she mentions, I mean, she praises the Supreme Court appointments. Uh, she praises him for moving the embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. Uh, like, I don't know what the policy complaints are about Trump. Um it seems like the reason she doesn't like Trump is that he's crude and crass and embarrassing to, you know, civilized Republicans like her and, and her fu- uh, and, she, and he was mean to her dad. I don't know about you, but I don't like my heroes getting captured or something like that. Didn't Trump say that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I prefer, uh, you know, I don't think that makes you a hero. I think he said uh, I, I prefer uh I prefer people who don't get captured. Uh, yeah. Can I ask you a question? Uh, well, well, I was going to say. Oh, yeah, though, go like, ahead. Go, I want to well, just, yeah. just, just run, run with the casual baseball fan analogy. If you're, a, look, if you're just a casual baseball fan and you don't like the new coach, then reasons about this superficial are kind of fine. Right? Mm-hmm. Why not? Right? You know, but like, this is somebody who's hired to talk about politics for a living and like, her political allegiances are based on the fact that like this dude and her dad didn't get along. And like, he says a bunch of crass things on Twitter and it's, I don't know. It's kind of revealing. Like, I don't, I don't think she actually knows anything about almost any of this stuff. I mean, I think that she actually quotes in that read college, just to wrap that up. I mean, in that read college thing, she quotes this girl, in the audience who got up and had this line, which was so good. I just had to use this as the final sentence, the review, which was just, this is a comment, not a question. You're only here because because of your dad. And all I could think is like, yeah, that's that is the ultimate summary of not only this book but the entire career, the entire life trajectory of Megan McCain. You're only here because of your dad. Right. When Trump was running for pre- before, I think, but even before he actually declared officially, he did an interview in Iowa with who's the guy with the toupee, uh, Joseph sure. Goebbels. No, Frank Luntz. <laughs> Frank Luntz. There we go. Uh, and he said, I don't know about, you know, but how can you make fun of John McCain? He's a war hero. I don't know about you, but my war heroes don't get captured. So that was considered offensive. Sure. But the media never, it, it's just, it's like you can't question John McCain's war record in America. Earlier, you called John McCain a war hero. Was he committing a war crime when he got shot uh, yeah, down? Yeah, a war criminal is what they called him. Yeah. yeah was that uh, a war crime before he got shot down? Yeah. I mean, look, uh, he was a volunteer um, at an elite level, right? You know, as mm-hmm. the officer, uh, he was a volunteer in an imperial war of aggression. I mean, I think that the way we feel about John McCain should be at least the way we feel about like a Russian officer who gets shot down over Maripol, who is, uh, while they're, you know, engaged in indiscriminate bombing, especially if in this scenario, the, you know, invasion of Ukraine had been going on, not for a couple months, but for like a few years. And he was volunteering specifically knowing that he was going there. Right. That, and that doesn't mean you can't, you know, feel bad for him for, you know, the, um, you know, just on a human level. But he was just hacking civilians. Yeah, no, I mean, he, he was, I mean, look, they, um, the bombs don't magically distinguish, right, you know, who's who's who, right? I mean, they just, they just kill everybody in the vicinity. And this is, and this is definitely like the American strategy in, in Vietnam, you know, was, was, was definitely to just like pulverize the shit out of the country with like this just amazing amount of explosive material i mean there are there are famously more bombs dropped in vietnam than like all of europe or world war ii etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean so it's like but not given, given that it's it, there's there's just no way to be discriminate right hey i think uh george w bush has something to say about that and brutal invasion of iraq i mean of ukraine <laughs> did you see that quote? <laughs> yeah i saw that um uh, that is that is some um yeah. 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 Uh, Vicki Eisman. So I want to ask you about yeah. Vicki Eisman, who was the lobbyist that John McCain was stooping mm-hmm. in the lead up to the campaign with Barack Obama. And mm-hmm. we're now and he denied it. Mm-hmm. Right. He denied that he had an affair with uh, 
Vicki Eisman, but Steve Schmidt says that's a lie. Wasn't Steve Schmidt working for John McCain, right? Yeah, yeah. He's uh, like most of the rats. He's, uh, he's abandoned uh, the uh, the GOP since then. But um, And he's one of the Lincoln? Yeah, yeah. He's one of those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, Steve Schmidt has some funny stuff to say about Big and McCain. He, right. Uh, that he was, um, that like he said that she had to be, you know, kicked off of the campaign bus basically for bratty behavior. And he was breaking the news to, to her mom, Cindy McCain, who started crying and said, I've, I've raised two wonderful sons, meaning like, you know, it's okay if one of the kids is done, you know, right. at least I raised two wonderful sons, right. uh, which is uh, on Mother's Day, actually, uh, Steve, Steve Schmidt uh, related that story in a tweet to, uh, to Megan McCain. So, so bad uh, Republican. By the way, your mom did love you is just as, uh, you know, right. Anyway, so uh, this review this, of bad Republican appears in Jacobin, where you're a columnist. Yeah, the review is called Megan McCain, Fail Daughter, uh, and it came out today. Right, right. APAC. Earlier I was talking about APAC. Yeah. It's a third rail in politics, not because people uh, uh, love APAC. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of criticizing APAC. You cannot criticize APAC. Otherwise, you're you're accused of anti-Semitism, to which I, you know, I invite people to accuse me of anti-Semitism. Knock yourself out. What are we going to do about APAC? They don't represent it's, Israel. They don't represent American Jews. They really represent the war making machinery on this planet, don't they? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a funny thing, right, because this is a lot of what um like one of the things that the guy Ilhan Omar accused me of anti Semite was was uh, saying it's all about the Benjamins, meaning like this money that APAC and other pro Israel lobbying groups spend has an effect. And it just seems like a very weird thing because like there are lots of lobbies that have an effect on American foreign policy. Uh, and in none of the others is this taboo against sort of admitted that all of this money and time and effort that's put into lobbying efforts actually pays off, that it actually has some influence. Because it'd be weird if it didn't. I mean, if it didn't, I don't understand why they would bother. Mm -hmm. uh, the same way that, like, the right-wing Cuban-American groups in, in Miami that lobby for, right. you know, harsher Cuba policy clearly had an effect that, like, decades and decades after the opening to China, right, you know, we still had the embargo on Cuba. The same way the Saudi lobby in, you know, Washington, D.C., you know, clearly has an effect. I mean, I think that... You know, I, I mean, I think that the sort of hesitance about saying that in APAC, um, and of course, this is definitely weaponized by um, APAC and their defenders, you know, is is that, you know, if, um, you know, if put wrong, right, I mean, it sort of rhymes with something that actually would be anti-Semitic, which is saying like, oh, you know, powerful Jews are controlling everything, right? You know, right. like that, that actually would be anti-Semitic, but like, just saying that uh, lobbying works um, should not be anti-Semitic in the case of this one particular lobby, right? I mean, I don't, I don't understand the uh, the reasoning there at all, right? I mean, like that the, I mean, this is something nobody denies <laughs> in any other context, right? It's 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 kind of silly to treat it as being out of bounds in, right. um, you know, in this uh, in this context, right? I mean, if right. if the if it, I mean, I mean, if it, if what people are saying is it doesn't work, <laughs> then man, I hope none of these people saying this allow their friends or relatives to donate money to any groups like this. I, I don't. I don't think friends or I don't think APEC gets any donations from anybody other than, uh, well, like Sheldon a the the. Casino man, I don't think mom and pop. okay, okay, yeah, okay. So, so why isn't why aren't uh, you know Sheldon Adelstein must have friends, right? He must have a family. Why aren't they warning him not to waste his money on right. this? Because oh, I work. know, I know, I know. Uh, we have to wrap it up, Professor Ben Burgess. Where are you teaching before we plug your books and publications? Uh, Morehouse College is where I'm teaching. 
And so. that's fantastic. And you're the host of Give Them an Argument. You're a columnist for Jacobin. And you are also, a, you write for the Daily Beast. Who else are you writing for these days? Uh, those are the two main ones, Jacobin and the Daily Beast. And are uh, you working like a, an article every once in a while in the nation and every once in a while in current affairs, but the main ones are Jacobin and the Daily Beast. Incredible. I should say, by the way, that uh, there is also another Jacobin article that just came out, which is um, in, uh, uh, which is about the baby formula crisis and arguing that the, um, you know, that, that the federal government should, should nationalize, uh, you know, production of that, you well, know, since Biden uh, must have read that. Yeah, there you go. He, he yeah. must have. I, I was, I thought I was hoping you were going to say about the baby formula shortage, which I support. I was hoping somebody yeah, yeah, would... I support, I support. <laughs> I would have starved those babies. Well, Pete Buttigieg came close to that. He said, um, uh, this is a capitalist country. The government doesn't manufacture baby formula, nor should it, right? This is before Biden invoked the... Uh, the he said defense that? Pro- yeah, this is before Biden invoked the Defense Protection Act, uh, Pro- Defense Production Act, but uh, Pete Buttigieg did say that, which is like the sacred principles, the free market are such that, look, what's a few babies starving here and there? As compared to, you know, to, to protecting, you know, the, the wall of separation, you know, between government and the economy. I wonder if McKinsey had a contract with Nestle. Remember Nestle was starving? <laughs> it's entirely possible, yeah. Remember Nestle starved all those African women? Uh, yeah. Th- and your new yeah. book is Christopher Hitchens, What He Got Right, How He Went Wrong, and Why He Still Matters. Go buy the book. It gets the Feldman guarantee. Thank you, Professor. All right. Thank you, comedian. Thank you. It is time now for the Hershenfelds. Dr. um, I got something that I've been holding on to. I'm sure you saw it, but uh, uh, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld is a Freudian psychoanalyst. He was about to explain to everybody why you are an anti-Semite. Oh, go ahead, please. Okay. So... Because you invited somebody to call you that, right? Yes, please. Okay. So I don't know if this is still the case, but at one time this was an actual statistic. There were more UN resolutions, over 50% of UN resolutions in the whole world were about Israel and the Palestinians. I have a lot of problems with Israel and the Palestinians. But I also had problems with the Hutus and the Tutsis and Serbia and, and, and on and on and on. And yet the U.N. spent half of its energy condemning Israel for its treatment of Palestinians, which was bad, but it was nothing like the Serbs and the Croats. It was nothing like the Hutus. The, the, Hutus and the Tutsis, not, not even close. Right. And and so you can't say that that's just objectively because the Israelis are worse than all of those other people. Right. And, you know, I, doctor, uh, I used to say that for decades, exactly okay. what you said, until somebody on this show, and I don't remember who said it, I think it was me. I think somebody said the difference between Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia is Israel is perceived as some would perceive it as America's 51st state, that it is we are you cannot disentangle Israel from America. It gets uh, a lot, you know, a little aid. Not a lot, but some aid. And that because it's the 51st state, if this were going on in Rhode Island or if this we hold Israel to a higher standard than we would the Rwandan government. So and I buy into that. I I think that uh, there are a lot of Israelis coming back and forth between the United States and America. And it is in many ways a part of America. And we have to treat it with the same, at least hold it to the same standards we would hold Texas. No? That's a pretty, 
that's a pretty low bar. <laughs> All right. Speaking okay. of sex, moving right along, moving, moving right along. By the way, I went after APAC at the top of the show and I welcome your hate mail. If you uh, whatever you want to accuse me of for uh, uh, calling uh, APAC ultimately anti. I think APAC is anti-Semitic. I think it thinks Jews are stupid. And anybody who thinks Jews are stupid is anti-Semitic. I agree with you. But let me say this. I just want to say that my silence is neither a, a sign that I agree or disagree with anything that has been said so far on this subject. It's a subject I will not comment on publicly anymore for various reasons. So do not you take don't... my silence as condoning or condemning any of the doctor's remarks or yours. OK, but but I'm going to be getting emails and I see and I'm just going to state up front that APAC is anti-Semitic. I'm with you. APAC is, is disgusting and it has and it has nothing. Uh, it doesn't speak for me and it doesn't speak for Israel. It just speaks for a fringe. I completely agree with you. But I, I believe. And also, I, I abjure that argument that my dad just made. I, and I used to hear it also. Well, why don't they condemn what's going on in Sri Lanka? The same as that doesn't matter. That's a form of what about ism. You're not Sri Lankan. You should have more. You should be more invested in how. The Jewish state is treating their neighbors. I am. Yeah, I'm just I'm not I'm not saying you. I'm saying one. Okay. Good, right. OK. In any case, I, I would love to get off this subject. Okay. Right. But, but, but let me just just because there are going to be some emails. APAC thinks Jew and then I'm done. APAC thinks Jews cannot resolve issues with the Palestinians other than violence. They think the, that Jews are only incapable of resolving the problems with the Palestinians through violence. And uh, you know what? They have a point. It's the only ways that my tenants can resolve problems with me. Oh, OK. So now I, I have a this is so I saw this today and it made no sense to me. And I thought only Dr. Philip Hershenfeld, a, a, a Freudian psychoanalyst who teaches Freud, could make sense of this because I find this very confusing. What about me? You didn't think of me? You didn't think I could explain this? I, I mean, I, 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 I'm this just going to leave. Well, I both of you, but I, I both of you explain this to me because it makes no sense. I can't understand why George W. Bush said this two days ago. The result is an absence of checks and balances in Russia and the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> Iraq, too. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> 75. Oi, Gewalt. There's no other words. Oi, Gewalt. Wow. It's, it's because even, even that shallow, shallow man... <laughs> Has an unconscious, <laughs> <laughs> but no conscious. He has no conscience, but and an it unconscious. Just it just broke through right there. And I, I mean, that was. He knows that uh, yeah. Yeah. he was not very different from Putin in that particular action. Yeah. And he did it strictly for political reasons. And. Uh, I, I once saw I once saw Bush speak live once. It was right after 9-11. I happened to go to a breakfast that some people were part of the organization on Wall Street. He was talking to business leaders. I was just sitting there, you know, eating the brunch. And he, he actually got up and he said this. We have to teach our business leaders right and wrong. <laughs> He so, paused. He paused in the wrong place and just it was it was unbelievable. OK, yeah. I'm going to circle back to a Freudian interpretation of this, because a lot of my listeners understand a little about Freud and a little bit about the subconscious and the unconscious. But I, I want to play this again 
And, and for our younger listeners, because this is, to me, a watershed moment in American history. This is how, how much play is this getting in the media? Are people is this being spread around? On, on MSNBC, it's spread around. I doubt if Fox goes near as it. OK, because uh, I saw it today. When did it, when did MSNBC start showing it? Um, I think this morning is the first time I saw it. Okay. Yeah. So it's not old news. Let me play it again. And let's use this as a soft entry point to the unconscious, the subconscious, because let's play it one more time. The result is an absence of checks and balances in Russia and the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> Iraq, too. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> 75. Hilarious. Let's hilarious. start with, let's hundreds, start with the hundreds laughter. Hundreds of thousands of dead people. It's hilarious. Dr. Hershenfeld, the laughter. That, yeah. What, 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 did, what does the laughter mean? It means nervous laughter. That's what it means. Look what I just did. And the I, just, I just confessed in front of the news cameras. I mean, he, he, he knows on some level what the truth was. He knows, certainly now, at least, he knows that he was led down the primrose path by his nefarious handlers. So, but he's heard enough about why that was a terrible decision. You have said to me in the past that I punish myself, that I feel guilty about something and then I'll punish myself. That slip was, let me ask Ethan this, was he punishing himself? Was that slip not so much to, re was that revealing that he's guilty or did he do that in public to punish himself? Uh, I, I really, I have no idea. I mean, he, uh, it looks like it to me. It looks like he's he's blurting out. Uh, yeah, he's, it's sort a, of, he's, he's like unzipping. He's unzipping and exposing his shame to the world there. He's got to be ashamed of it. Um, he does seem like a guy who does a little bit of thinking and probably like McNamara, who in Fog of War talks about how 30 years earlier, or 40 years earlier, he knows he just committed atrocities. I believe that Bush has that same awareness and that he doesn't say it publicly on purpose, but there he goes saying it publicly by accident. And I, so I think in a sense he is, yeah, he's shaming himself. Dr. Hershenfeld? Yeah, um, that and confessing his guilt. Um, there is some value to confession. So uh, do you mind leaning forward, uh, Dr. Hershenfeld, a little? There you go. It, it just equalizes the sound. So sorry. If, if, if George W. Bush or Henry Kissinger came to you and said, I did this horrible, horrible thing. I know it's horrible. How do I, what do I do? Because obviously he's not, you would agree that he's not dealing with the crimes he committed, right? I would agree from what I know, yeah. So what what does a, a Freudian shrink, you know, pardon the expression, tell a patient who has committed a horrible crime that he cannot be punished for because we don't belong to the ICC? So wh what do you tell somebody like that? I don't tell people anything. I listen. And um, I would encourage him to talk and to explore what he did, why he did it, to try to be honest with himself uh, un until he can come to some understanding of how this all happened without letting himself off the hook. 
But at the same time, I'm sure I'm, I, I don't want to psychoanalyze him long distance, but he's a guy with problems. That's why he was such a, a, a drinker and whatever else he imbibed until he finally got uh, on the wagon. So that's what I would do. I, it would be not my it's not my place to say, and you are forgiven. Right. Right. I don't whereas, have the power. Whereas in my work, I, I do have the power to forgive him, but it would only be after he had done penance in the form of enormous donations to organizations helping refugees. And uh, he, he should be donating tens of millions of dollars to the United Nations Refugee Fund and to Doctors Without Borders and to, you know. And, and doing an, a, a documentary with Errol Morris explaining how these yeah. things happen. Yeah. You know, give yeah, us coming, the, coming clean about his relationship with, with Cheney and all the rest. Yeah. So we had David DeJong on. He wrote a book called Nazi Billionaires. These are people uh, not quite. I'm being serious. Not. Well, yeah, as bad as. George W. Bush in terms I didn't, of... I didn't know that was a book because I loved the game show. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to be a Nazi billionaire? Yes. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> I, so there were a lot of industrialists who did business with Hitler and their fortunes were built after the war. I mean, they it, they had the undergirding of a very successful business that has flourished. Uh, there are about five families. They go on and live happy, productive lives of denial. Is it is it possible? People like Dick Cheney, uh, McNamara, people who Henry Kiss. I mean, Henry Kissinger has to live. You know, Cambodia alone, hundreds of thousands of dead Cambodians. Because I don't that, have the feeling that he's troubled. He doesn't maybe, strike me as self-reflective. I saw him once at a, a Shiva call, and he was he was having seemed to be having a great time. Uh, I don't think there are any uh, uh, come to Jesus moments in his future or documentaries where he confesses his mistakes. He seems cocksure and that level of self uh, assuredness is the danger in the first place. And what is that? Is that a cultural thing? Is, is, there's a system, as Hannah Arendt wrote about, where the, the system uh, controls his decisions and he made the right decisions because the system was instructing him. So he... He's not the bad guy. Is that how he lets himself off the hook? I don't think so. Uh, does the system support some of his stuff? Yeah, probably. But I also think there's a narcissism and an arrogance. Yeah. He's a brilliant guy. You cannot take that away from him. And but but that doesn't prevent him or it even helps him, actually, to become very sure of himself, very arrogant, and to totally believe the idea, if I thought this, it's right. Right, right. You get a sense from George W. Bush, it's the same sense you got from LBJ. They went back to their ranches in Texas and suffered for their decisions. That, that you get a sense that George W. Bush and, and, and Lyndon Baines Johnson both felt that they were hornswoggled, as they say, into to a war that resulted in a lot of blood on their hands. But neither one of them had the temerity to say mea culpa. And that's what makes them evil. I don't see them as equivalent. I, I see them as very different i think um i think johnson knew what he was doing he wanted his great society and therefore he was gonna 
make a bargain with the people who wanted to go to war. And he may have felt at the end that that was a huge mistake. And maybe he died because of that. I, I think he was a deep guy. I don't think Bush is a deep guy. And I think he's sort of like, like, like a child who was led astray. Right, right. That's how I see him. And I, I don't see him suffering. I think that slip was a sign that, the, that there's something going on in his head. But he's, you know, he's painting pretty pictures. Right. I, I want to uh, change the subject. But first, as far as I can remember, Jimmy Carter is the first modern American president who left office without too much blood on his hands. There was a little blood, but not as much as Nixon, Johnson, Clinton, Reagan. Yeah. If you become president, you have to kill people. That's part of the job is not pardoning people on death row, ordering airstrikes. You have to live the rest of your life with blood on your hands. Obama, his favorite day was, you know, Terrorist Monday, where he'd go through the kill list. Get this guy, this guy, that guy. What kind of person says, OK, that's part of the job description. I'm up for that. Well, it's the kind of person who has a great desire to be president, for one thing, who wants to do a good job. Part of that job is protecting the country. And if his, the people he, he relies on, because he can't do the job all by himself. So if the people he relies on say, you got to push this button in order to protect the country, then mostly you're going to do it. Right. If you're the kind of person who's become president and, and you'd be derelict in your duty. Right. If you didn't do that. I think Carter had the advantage, if you can call it that, of coming to office on the heels of this debacle where there were 60,000 dead right. uh, American teenagers. And so there was no appetite for any of that nonsense. And Biden, similarly, he's uh, he's in a similar boat as far as people's appetite for us getting involved in these sort of things. But Although we people, have ongoing things that he's he's got to keep killing people. Well, but but, but Biden has. I mean, he's yeah. not bringing. Uh, tr I think Soleimani, maybe some people in Syria, but uh, but I think Trump, believe it or not, I think he wanted blood on his hands, but nobody. Let, yeah. let, let me turn to our next guest. She's not here yet, but I want to talk to you about her subject matter. Her name is Jen Senko, and she has a documentary out that's fantastic. We had her on uh, when it first came out. It's called The Brainwashing of My Dad. Now there's a book out called The Brainwashing of My Dad. And she talks about how her father went from being a Kennedy supporter, vote, voting for John F. Kennedy, uh, loved Dr. Martin Luther King. He was a liberal, if not left of center. And as he retired, he started listening to Rush Limbaugh and also watching Fox News. And in her book, she talks about how he became part of this cult of republicanism. She calls Fox a, a cult and she calls it brainwashing. So we're going to be talking about that. And I figured I would ask you about what exactly, you know, clinically, what is brainwashing and does it exist? My younger colleague, you want to um, chip in on this? I, I know nothing about brainwashing. I know about shampooing and then conditioning. 
It's cl- it's close. It's similar. <laughs> and I know the general rule about it is they say rinse and repeat. But what's confusing <laughs> about that is it doesn't say it doesn't say how many times. So you can if you rinse and repeat and keep re- reading the instructions, you could be in there all day. There's never and now you're done. It's just rinse and repeat. That that's open ended. So do you um, know the famous? There's a famous line. George Romney, Mitt Romney's father, Republican, governor of Michigan, ran for president in 68. And mm-hmm. he, he famously said that he was for the war, uh, but I was brainwashed. And Mort Saul said it was a light, it was a light rinse. <laughs> One of the greatest. Uh, and Listen, he thought, I- I would say we are all vulnerable to this kind of thing. Don't look down your nose at it. And in the right kinds of circumstances and in the search for a community. I know that when I watch MSNBC, like I watch Morning Joe when I'm doing my exercise bike every morning. And I like it, but I also know that it, it's sort of entertainment for me. He is saying things that I want to hear, that I enjoy hearing. They're comforting. He, but he, he says yeah. things that are comforting. But is he convincing you of things that you didn't already believe? Because that would be where it becomes brainwashing. It yeah. sounds like you're just more preaching to the choir. Yeah, I I don't know if he's doing that, but I know some people much more intellectually honest than I am who make it their business to listen to all the different sides because they want to hear the various arguments. Right. So I, I don't have time or interest to do that. So I listen to the thing that i enjoy hearing right i found that i was i was being sent to a a parochial uh jewish school as a kid i was immune to brainwashing because that that place was was devoted to religion and god and all that and it was something i i didn't have and then was not susceptible to but i learned later in life that i'm not susceptible to all kinds of things that a lot of people are like hypnosis and uh, dentistry. I, I just, uh, yeah, I have to just do it all at home. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, but, you know, that's a very admirable thing in you, by the way. Well, but it also has the flip side, which is not good, which is I'm not susceptible to other things that I wish I was. Yeah. Well, like, like flamenco dancing. I wish that that was something that would. <laughs> You would you would make it great. You are. I look at you and I see Buddy Greco. That's who I see. Before you go, you're kicking us out. Well, it's almost time. The hour is nigh. Okay, but you're free if you want to stick around and talk to Jen. I would love it if you stuck around. To yeah, talk I want to first talk about this prop from a movie that from a TV show that I did. If I may, it's a little plug. It's a plug in the form of a prop, if I could do this. Yes. So uh, 26 months ago, the week before everything shut down, I shot an episode of this show called Angeline, which is out today on Peacock. If you get Peacock, which is, it's only four bucks a month, and then you can uh, you can turn it off after you watch the episode. But the show is called Angeline. It's about this uh, this billboard star in the 80s in LA but in a flashback scene to 1959 you meet her parents who are on a boat from Haifa to America and it's a boat that's paid for been paid for with reparations from the Germans and my scene and by the way it's called by the way it's called the SS Israel so the Germans still kept part of the name SS I noticed that when I filched (laughs) these from the set everything's a negotiation yeah. So anyway, I saved these and now I can finally talk about it. So you can watch the I'm in episode five at the beginning and it's a, it's an interesting show. And my scene is all in Yiddish with subtitles. And we had a wonderful Yiddish coach named Herschel Hartman, who's still going strong in his 90s in L.A. And uh, so please watch it. Angeline on Peacock. 
I can't wait. I, I want to look. I didn't know anything about it. For 20 years, I 25 years, I lived in L.A. I saw, all I saw was Angeline. Yeah. yeah so, so I, made a, I didn't know that about An her. origin story kind of uh, five episode miniseries starring Emmy Rossum. Emmy Rossum, that actress. And uh, well, let, let's do this. Dr. Hershenfeld and, and Ethan, can you stick around at least for at least part of this? OK. I, I can stick around for a little, yeah, sure. Do I do? Do I get paid a little more? You of get course. paid twice as much. Twice as much. Twice as much. Okay. Well, it's good to see Jen Sanko. It's been uh, about five years since you were last on the show. I think we did it in person, if memory serves. But you put out a book. A book. Well, you've just put out a book based sort of on the documentary you made called Brainwashing My Dad. Jen Senko is a filmmaker, author, media activist, and she is known for her award winning documentaries, including Roadmap Warrior Women, The Vanishing City, and of course, The Brainwashing of My Dad, narrated by actor and activist Matthew Modine, as well as Jen Senko. And it's a fantastic documentary. Let's talk about. Is it a how to thing? Will it teach me how to brainwash this guy? No, but you could learn how to do it in the process of watching it. OK, thank you. But, yeah, there's good tips in there. OK, right. There's a whole list of tactics at the end. That be perfect. So I, I, I asked. Uh, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld to, to stick around because he's a Freudian psychoanalyst and Ooh. and your story is very interesting. Your father, I believe, was born 100 years ago. 1920. Oh, my God. Yes. Right. I'm not very quick at math. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm impressed. He voted for Jack Kennedy. He was a he followed Dr. King. He oh, yeah. lo he loved animals. Yes. And then one day, he yeah. hated PETA. And yeah. what? What? When did? And, yeah. Well, tell and us. That was animal testing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It and was for suddenly for animal testing. Right. Do you mind leaning a little forward, just so we can yeah. get? Thank you. So how's that? Perfect. Tell me. <clears throat> how he raised you, like what his politics were when you were growing up. My dad was really, really open minded. Like when um, hippies came in, I remember thinking, oh, my God, that's my dad. You know, just do whatever you want to do as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. And um, he um, he you served know, in World War Two. He served in World enlisted. War II. He enlisted. He enlisted. But, yeah, he did. He didn't have to, but everybody wanted to, you know, kick the German's ass back then. Right. And and uh, he uh, was a medic, um, so uh, he he didn't really use a gun, which is odd because, you know, how many years later he joined was a member of the NRA. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, he was a member of everything. But um, how did he feel about the Vietnam War? You know, they never really, t I think they were against it, but they never, I think they were confused about it, both mm -hmm. my parents. They, they didn't really talk about it that much. They were really excited by Kennedy and everything Kennedy represented, like science is here, you know, we're going to discover all kinds of new things, um, and then we're going to help poor people, we're going to... Um, you know, it was just like such a hopeful time. I, I, I remember that actually as a, as a little kid. I remember that like hope, like, oh, my God, everything's going to be OK now. And, and then he, what and then when did he when did he become the polar opposite? Well, what happened is um, he retired from the government because uh, he used to work. Uh, he was an engineer, electronics engineer. He retired, and then he um, they moved to back to New Jersey from Maryland, and he got a part-time job, but where he had a long commute. 
Whereas previously he had a commute with a carpool, a bunch of guys. <clears throat> so he wanting to educate himself, he, he wasn't going to listen to music. He found talk radio thinking that that would be educational, but it was Bob Grant at the time, who was the father of, called the father of conservative radio. And um, that's when he slowly started to change. And then a couple of years later, when he fully retired, he just, he graduated to Rush Limbaugh and like fell, he had like this bromance with Rush Limbaugh. And oh my God, that's when he really, really started drastically changing. Bob Grant. I, I used to call Bob Grant when, when I was a kid. I used to call yeah. Bob Grant and pretend I was a cab driver. I would lower <laughs> my voice and say, I, I, sw I have t I do. I have tapes of me. I would I would sucker him in. I'd say my son came home. They're reading Plato's Symposium. Do you know what they're teaching in Plato? That the highest form of love is between two men. We got to get this. And and you go. I know. I know. I need to go off about the homosexuals. And then I'd say, Hey, Bob, I, there's a picture of Moshe Diane here in the New York Post, and the eye patch is covering his right eye, but in the New York Times, it's covering his left eye. Can you explain this to me? And and he goes. Bop, bop, bop. Uh, I, I have the clip. I'm going to play it on the show. I would set him up and then I would just go. I, I did it like three or four times. My mother loved it. They just I, she, she was in a bad mood. She could call Bob Grant. You can my mother would have loved that, too. <laughs> call Bob. So then he Bob Grant spawned Rush Limbaugh. So yeah. this is like 88, 90, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, 87 is when the Fairness Doctrine was vetoed, right. and then uh, it was 88, uh, Rush Limbaugh went national. Right. I guess around 88, 89, that's when he retired fully, and then re really was like glued to the kitchen like three hours a day, and my mother couldn't stand the sound of Rush Limbaugh, so he built very heavy doors on the kitchen, and she would eat in the living room, and he would uh, eat in the kitchen. God forbid you walk through there while Rush Limbaugh is saying something. Yeah, I know people who really connected with Rush Limbaugh. Mm -hmm. What did Rush Limbaugh do for your father? Well, a, a lot of it was timing, but also Rush Limbaugh had this great talent. Um, I mean, he was perfect for the aging white guy at that time because, uh, you know, as we know, there was all of this, um, so all these social movements going on, you know, women's liberation, civil rights, uh, anti-war, um, <clears throat> all of the mores were being overturned. And I think a lot of older white men were like, you know, they're, they're, they had this like injured pride and also just think like, well, then they'd have to reinvent themselves. That's really uncomfortable. And some of the things that they just assumed about life, now they're being told, you know, was wrong. So um, here comes Rush Limbaugh and Bob Grant saying, oh, the heck with those people telling you that uh, they're, you know, they're wrong. You're not right. wrong. So so Rush Limbaugh n married three times, uh, opiate addiction, and speaks of family values, but never had any children. He is a misogynist who, yes. who didn't understand, uh, uh, hated women, hated yeah. women. Did your father, if you don't mind my asking, your his daughter, how did it affect your re how did his listening to Rush Limbaugh affect your relationship? It's really a very interesting question. My dad, um, I was the first one to go to college. My dad was really proud of me. Um, and I was doing these paintings and selling them, and he was really proud of me. And, um, and then after, after Rush Limbaugh, his attitude towards women in general started changing. Like, he would make sure that when company came over, he would call, well, the girls, let the girls go sit in the kitchen. I'd say, Dad, 
they're they're women <laughs> in, the, in their fifties and stuff. And I really he his attitude towards me changed, but I wasn't sure if it was because I didn't like what I was learning about Republicans at that time, um, or because I was a woman. But one thing I did notice, even as time went on, he started expecting my mother to wait on him, and he never had done that before. Really? Yes. There's a picture in the movie of him sitting there with a knife and fork. I did not pose him that way. You know, and he'd go, babe, get me a beer. He never used to do that before. We're talking with Jen Senko, filmmaker, author of Brainwashing My Dad, and the, the Brainwashing My, uh, My Dad, and you can buy the book through Source Books. It, it came out a couple months ago, and it's I'm reading it, and it's a it's an amazing read. I want to ask Dr. Philip Hershenfeld or Ethan if they have any questions. Feel free to, to jump in here. I, I have a, a basic one, which is. Um, where were you? Because I spent the summer of 2000 in Charlottesville, Virginia, at a theater, and I couldn't get anything on the radio except for Rush Limbaugh. It was so disturbing. There was this saturation. So I'm wondering, did you live in a place where anything else was available? No. And it, it's funny you should ask that because I just had a conversation with somebody who was saying, because I'm stuck in New Jersey right now because I'm taking care of my mother, who's 102, um, and I can't get NPR. Um, and what you can get, though, you can get right wing up the wazoo. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, for one thing, um, AM radio has a big, uh, you know, bigger reach. But, um, yeah, he, he was in New Jersey at the time. Yeah, because uh, there it was either explicitly uh, evangelical Bi Bible related radio or Rush Limbaugh. That was it. It was it was it was pretty amazing. Yeah. Let me ask. Uh, Jen, a question about the economics of right wing talk radio. Bruce Mom is in our chat room here in our virtual studio audience, and he he just wrote something that he says the genius of Rush is that he gave his show for free to small market stations all over the country in exchange for a percentage of the ad revenue that gave these rural stations content they didn't have to produce. In other words it wasn't necessarily profitable rush limbo he was po he was popular but by the time he died he wasn't really as big as he wanted us to believe and the the mar wasn't the marketplace at least on radio controlled by a handful of radio chains that would not allow leftist talk show hosts to do what he did to to give the show away for free in exchange for ad revenue? Well, well, yes, to that last question and to your previous comment, um, he didn't even need the ads from radio. I mean, the Heritage Foundation was, was giving him millions. So he was never want for money. I don't know if you ever saw a picture of his, his um, compound in Florida, you know, but I mean, I would, this is I don't incredible. know the way he died. That you know, he was still like a multi, multi, multi millionaire. But the, the people don't understand this because it it's kind of payola. <laughs> what what, what ha the Heritage Foundation yeah. gave him money to spew their talking points without the audience knowing that he was getting money from the Heritage Foundation. This is against the law, isn't it? You can't take money to to say something, to endorse an idea or a product without telling your audience that you're getting money to say these things. I I don't think it is against the law because he would say he was entertainment. And then he would say, uh, you know, he talked about his formula, getting people angry. And people always ask me, do you, be you, do you believe what you say? Well, that's, you know, for, for me to know and you to find out. Uh, so I, I don't, you know, what is illegal, like with the FCC? Well, uh, let's go back to the Heritage Foundation. Tell me about the funding, because that to me is so important. What, 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 
Who was funding him? Well, you have to go back to, or you could go as far back as the Lewis Powell memo when that came out. And, uh, you know, all these, the Heritage Foundation was the first think tank to come out of the Lewis Powell memo. And it sat by the right hand of Reagan, you know, when Reagan was in office, whispering in his ear, you know, watered down the FCC, um, make Rupert Murdoch, uh, you know, a citizen, all of this stuff. So it, the, it, if there wasn't, by the time, like the 90s rolled around, there was tons of these think tanks that were working for, toward getting, you know, uh, uh, free market value into the mainstream and to get a lot of their ideas into into the mainstream um and to you know like rush limbaugh was for the overdog he was always defending the you know i love that tobacco or big corporations and and so the these guys were all like either you know multi- mega corporations or think tanks that represented them and so it was easy just to rush Limbaugh the money and he was very talented and how do they get the money oh go ahead Dr. Hirsch hey, because I gotta go but I, I want to do what I don't like doing at all which is to give an armchair psychoanalysis Please. without seeing the person but here's what I hear in this very familiar story. A guy works. He's got a social connection at work. He's got a bunch of guys he drives to work with every day. And then he retires and he's lonely and he's looking for a new community. And this community pops up on the radio and um, it it welcomes him and it makes him feel good. And uh it's it's a very slippery slope. Yes. After that, till you buy the whole kit and caboodle. Right. That's that's really part of it. Yeah. And I liked what you said earlier too before I joined about how we're all many of us are vulnerable to brainwashing. It's true. Ex- except for Ethan, but everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I got to run. Thank Come you, Doctor Philip Hershenfeld. Thank Good you. you, Jen. Thank you, Ethan. You I, feel. I Ethan, you can if you want to stick around and okay, I, I'll, I'll stick. I'll stick for a moment. I got to run pretty soon. Uh, so he's getting funded. So Rush Limbaugh is getting funded by these conservative think tanks to spew their talking points, almost reading them verbatim. I, I think I'm not sure about that, but uh, you know, he was very creative. Uh, he developed his own style. Um, he could be sarcastic and um, um, I, I just I'm sure that he he would take what they were feeding him and just create his own right. stick out of it. Right. I remember yeah. my father listened to him and was amused. He, he would commute to work, listen to Rush Limbaugh and call him a ca- carnival barker and just thought this guy doesn't believe a thing he's saying and it's kind of interesting i've never heard anything by, about yeah. this i said well why do you listen to him? he says i can't believe he's able to go this long talking non-stop <laughs> and then we figured out that he was somebody was whispering into his ear telling him this is what you're going to say tomorrow this is what and after a while he knew what to say but he was getting coached by, like you said, the Heritage Foundation. And also he was on stimulants. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes, Ethan. That's, that's right. <laughs> so much so that he, he lost his hearing. Wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking with Jen Senko, and she's a... I'm, I'm afraid I have to run also, but um, thank you so much. And it's great oh. to meet you, Jen. I look forward to reading your book. Oh, great to meet you too, Ethan. Thanks. To, I can't wait to watch Angeline. Oh, thanks. Thanks, David. Thank you. Uh, Jen is a documentarian, and her new book is The Brainwashing of My Dad, also the name of her doc- her documentary. Uh, I remember the end of the documentary. I don't want to give it away. Uh, so. You can. You know why you can? 
I never used to, but I feel it's so important. People will still want to see it and read about it because of the detail. Go ahead. You tell us how things re were resolved with your dad. Okay. Well, I'll give the um, the the brief version. Right. So, um, what happened in 2010? My parents moved to a senior community, and somehow during the move, his radio broke. But by this time, he wasn't fixing things so much anymore. So he put it in the garage, and it stayed there. And it broke that habit of watch, of listening to Rush Limbaugh. And my mother started eating lunch with him again. And then, after a while, they needed a new TV in the kitchen. My mom got it and loves programming remotes. So she programmed the remotes, had stickies all over them. He couldn't figure out. <laughs> it's like me. <laughs> right. Yeah. So <clears throat> she had her own method. So he stopped watching Fox. And um, so, you know, he started mellowing out right away. He became like a, a sweeter. Fun he was funny, always fun had been funny. He was beginning to be funny again. Um, and then the most amazing thing happened when he had to go in the hospital for a kidney stone. Um, my mother said, Jennifer, can you um, kill some of daddy's emails? Because they had these old computers and they're going to clog up his computer and take up space. And I told her, mom, they just keep coming. There were all these right wing mm -hmm. you know, should watch the NRA, you know, anti-legal, all of, all of them. You'd get tons of them, and he forwarded them to us all the time. So I said, Mom, they, 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 I can't just delete them. They keep coming. So she got the idea of unsubscribing him from many of them and subscribing him to some of what she read, which was like Truth Out, Alternate, Reader Supporter News. So he had more of a mix Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd say, I'd bet that most of the right wing subscriptions were gone. <laughs> so he started to change back. And one day he said to her, I, I like, I like that guy, Obama. I like him. Um, <laughs> I just got the chills. I, I knew it, it just, I just got the chills. I, can, I, can you imagine me when my mom called me and said that? Right. I just, I nearly dropped to the floor. Right. So well, the reason why I don't mind blowing a little off the end, you can still read it and get the juicy details. Right. Uh, is because it's such an important message. You take away this this media, you take away the, the drumbeat and the... Uh, not intoxication or interrogation, what's the word? Uh, indoctrination, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the person can change back. Right. So you remove them from that source, and he changed back to his old self. Right. It was, right. It was a miracle, because by then, it was near the end of his life. Right, right, right. And I got to see my movie before he died. No complaints. Yep. No complaints. You can't, you have nothing to complain about. That's, it is, because it is, unless you're hurting people, uh, it's a journey. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn, uh, maybe I'll bring him in because he has an interesting story with his guest from last week, Reverend Schenk, who told a similar story. The, the Reverend Barry W. Lynn, is a, a a minister in the United Church of Christ. He's also a lawyer, and he ran American Sep uh, Americans for Separation of Church and State. Mm -hmm. There was a time in his life when he was going on Fox and Crossfire and arguing the social issues of the day, mm -hmm. gay marriage and abortion, and his nemesis was Reverend Schenck. And Reverend Barry W. Lynn joins us a little earlier. Do you mind telling Jen Senko uh, what happened 
especially and, and, and on our show last week. It was really a, a beautiful thing to see. Absolutely. Is my microphone working? Because I've got some signal here that suggests it's not. Can you hear me? We, yeah, you're, you're coming in loud oh, and clear. Maybe okay, the microphone. Terrific. Yeah, go. yeah Rob, Rob Shank used to be a tremendously skilled advocate at getting time on the news. So if I was at the Supreme Court to do something about gay marriage or reproductive justice, he'd be there too. And he would always have, he'd be wearing a collar. He represented a group called the National Clergy Council. I never knew exactly who they were. And, but he would have props. Uh, he, he and his brother once brought what was alleged to be a fetus in a jar of formaldehyde. And then at the Supreme Court, he would put up uh, what it looked like a pulpit. He might bring a cross and he is all visual. And so the local news loved that. They just, they didn't care who he represented. They said, here's a minister who's anti-gay marriage, who's anti-choice, who's anti-separation of church and state. She's, he's wearing a collar. Let's film him. Let's get a couple of words from him, too. And he was a very articulate and remains a very articulate person. Some years ago, I started to hear that he was changing his mind on some issues like guns. And he did make, there was a documentary made about his change of heart over guns. And at that time, his argument was, I'm supposed to be pro-life, but guns just kill people. That's not consistent. So the director of this film um, is also a philanthropist, uh, I, I believe in the Disney family, actually. And she made Abigail, this Abigail film. Disney. Abigail Disney. I saw the film. Yeah, and he's he's in it a lot. He clearly had a change of heart. But then I started to hear that he was changing his views on other matters. And what he did last week, um, he explained exactly why he had changed his mind on abortion, that he's, he said he was living in a fantasy world where d people around him made him believe things that he couldn't possibly, that weren't real in the real world. And then at, toward the end of the show, he, he this actually surprised me. He, he said, you know, I, I need to apologize to you. I, I should have listened to you 30 years ago, and I didn't. But when you would speak, he'd say, I just had this sense that maybe – Maybe Barry's right after all. And now he said, but you were right. And he sent me a note afterwards and he said, I just should have listened to you 30 years ago. So it, it's, it's one of the change. most it's one of the most beautiful moments we've yeah. had on this show. It, I sat back and watched it. I couldn't take my eyes off it. It was. You know, I think people cause a lot of damage <clears throat> with their words. I think Rush mm -hmm. Limbaugh uh, has blood on his hands. Transgender mm -hmm. people who get beaten up, it's because of Rush Limbaugh. Gay people who can't find housing, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the dead in Iraq, it's all on Rush Limbaugh's hands. Mm -hmm. But I do believe in redemption. I want to play this clip to get the, this new hour going. This is George W. Bush speaking uh, at his library, trying to push the war in Ukraine. Jen, I know you've seen this, but- I'll watch it. Yeah, this is, this is as, this is a watershed moment, I believe, for historians. The result is an absence of checks and balances in Russia, and the decision of one man, to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> Iraq, too. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> 75. When I watch that, you know, he's a war criminal. We, we know that goes without saying. Uh, we talked to, to Dr. Philip Hershenfeld about this clip, who he's a Freudian psychoanalyst, and we talked about how he obviously the subconscious is working, but there's also 
the subconscious punishing him and asking for forgiveness. That is the best George W. Bush can do to ask for forgiveness. And the more I look at that, and I want to get both of your reaction to this. Here's a, a serial killer, a mass murderer watching that. Let me ask Jen Sanko, do you have a little more sympathy for George W. Bush? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, he was kind of humble in that moment. And he muttered after he made the mistake, and Iraq too, right? That's what he said, I think, right? And so that sounds like an admittance to me, you know? Yeah. So um, I do like to believe that people can change uh yeah I, I think i do yeah would you come back we, we, i sure will yeah I, I, love, I love talking to you yeah it's been too long uh jensenko is a filmmaker and media activist you live here in new york city and you've done other documentaries roadmap warrior women the vanishing city and the brainwashing of my dad that came out a couple of years ago go stream rent by the brainwashing of my dad and then buy 10 copies give it to libraries and friends give it to that proverbial crazy uncle everybody should see this movie and read her book it's an adaptation of her documentary came out about three or four months ago it's published by source books it's called the the brainwashing of my dad before you go and follow her on twitter at brainwashing dad fox news that's the true genius of the brainwashing isn't it what what before you go and and i i think the reverend barry w lynn will join in on this they program that to brainwash people, don't they? Yeah. I mean, basically, you know, if you read Gabriel Sherman's book, um, The Loudest Voice in the Room, about Roger Ailes, I mean, first of all, he had a memo detailing how to create more GOP voters by having GOP favorable news. But then he studied, like, Lenny Riefenstahl, you know, um, he studied ways on how to brainwash people um, and they wanted to create GOP voters so it was designed that way you know and it was like the perfect evil pair he and um, Rupert Murdoch because Rupert Murdoch wanted the same things that he did do we need to do what Fox News is doing it feels like MSNBC is kind of doing that but they're neoliberal hacks who are pretty much on the same side as Fox News. I mean, there's very little difference between <laughs> Rachel Maddow. I mean, you, you know, abortion, gay marriage on the social issues. Uh, there's a difference between Rachel Maddow and Sean Hannity. But on the, the big issues like war, uh, income inequality, she well, pays lip service to maybe opposing Sean Hannity, but never really any. So we don't we don't hear. I don't think we hear MSNBC championing uh, Medicare for all or closing down ICE. I mean, they're not willing to change anything in this country. Well, see, that's why I argue <laughs> with right wingers. Um, that say, well, MSNBC is the, um, you know, the bookend of Fox, not news. I don't call it Fox without calling it not news first. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, it's under that a, a, a corporate umbrella. So it has corporate masters. And the corporate masters are invested in more. They're invested in pharmaceuticals. Um, so they're not going to do anything that's going to damage the relationship with that or damage their economy. And they don't want tax raises either. OK, so they're under that corporate umbrella. The, what, what Noam Chomsky taught me was 
that they're going to do about this much, but they're going to leave out, you know, they're going to leave out a lot. Mm-hmm. But I, I do admit to watching MSNBC uh, at times because, well, my mother needs to watch TV and I don't want her to watch CNN or Fox. So we watch MSNBC. Right, right. It's different also in that it's not purposely manipulative. It It's not a trying to sell an ideology. I feel it's mostly responding finally to right wing media and what it has done to this country, which is outrageous and dangerous. So I feel that they're kind of the answer to that, but limited, but, but again, they don't, they don't use the same tactics. They they don't feign anger. Uh, They don't, you know, act like they're your buddy. Um, They're, they're more, they have more integrity. And, and they'll correct themselves if they're wrong. That's true. That's true. Um, Go ahead. No, I think I've told a story on, on the show before, but when Ollie North was around and a celebrity, um, he was on the radio. I used to do Friday afternoons with him. And then he got a television show on MSNBC. And they decided that they were going to have – Uh, do it like a crossfire-like thing, so have some progressive. And it came down to Paul Begala, who is really the corporate Democrats, corporate Democrat, and myself. And a lot of the people on the staff would say, Barry, you at least, you were an activist. You are still an activist. We should hire you. I got a call from a vice president at MSNBC who said, Barry, I got one question for you. If we give you this job, will you defend the Clinton administration every night, no matter what they do? And of course, he was going to war at the time. And my friend Alan Combs, who was on Fox opposite Sean Hannity, and Alan would just say, this this war is BS, which we should not be participating. And they were both of them saying the same thing. And I said to this guy, uh, no, I cannot do that. I cannot make such a promise. And he said, well, I think this will be the last conversation we ever had. But I did think that would be your answer. In other words, what they want in that instance was corporate. And, and I was a good friend of Ed Schultz. And Ed Schultz was either fired, depending on who you listen to or what he says to you at the moment. Mm-hmm. Of course, Ed's dead. But it was either over the pipeline issue or because he wanted to cover Bernie Sanders and because he he was against the pipeline he was for Bernie Sanders he got he, he literally was fired from MSNBC and ended up on what was then called Russia Today right. and became known as RT but I loved Ed Schultz watching Ed Schultz right he, he was you know he was he had been a Republican he came from North Dakota, but he started to change his mind, as people are want to do. And I thought he was literally the best host on MSNBC. And it's when he was fired, there was nobody like him to replace him. And now it's very difficult with a straight face for me to watch it, starting with Joe Scarborough. When Joe Scarborough was first hired, he was on at night. And this is what he did. He'd have one person, one progressive like me, and he'd have these cubes, and he'd be against me, and then he'd have three other people against me. Right. And that was the pattern. You had a progressive, and usually the progressive spent the first 30 seconds going, I think this is somewhat unfair because, I mean, there's right. three of you, and you don't, you, you don't get anywhere doing that. You don't get, if you don't want to do it, you never come back, but you don't complain about it when you're there. But Scarborough to me, you know, he loved Trump. He and his wife were going to Mar-a-Lago and right. then they had a falling out. And then all of a sudden he becomes the anti-Trump voice, another anti-Trump voice on MSNBC, to which I say, I guess he saw where the money was going. Yes. where it was coming. And that's the only reason he's against Trump. But his core principles are just as conservative as any of the voices on Fox News. Right. And then, you know, and it bleeds out. I mean, they have this character who 
I meet the press now who you know, barely asks a difficult question. And I do understand as a person who did a lot of talk radio and was a host of a lot of talk radio shows, you don't want to go full bore into somebody that you in fact want to have back again. I used to have, I did a show, a crossfire like show on radio in Washington. And we'd have a Senator on almost every day. So you have to be a little delicate if it's going to be some right wing uh, Senate, but you don't have to fall on your face in awe of what they say. And I, I frequently think that's what's happening on meet the press. Right. So MSNBC is not, I just, I can't watch it. I watch CNN if I want something remotely normal, but uh, honestly, the, the time that is wasted in the news talking about with the same clips endlessly repeated on every show on CNN from morning until I go to bed at night and right. flip it on. And there's the same stuff going on, the I, same I, clips. I, I want to take a break. I, I Before we say goodbye to Jen, I, I want to play you Dennis Prager, who I think is as <laughs> equally dangerous as Rush Limbaugh. And now I can't find it. Anyway, uh, all right. Not going to happen. Hang on. Uh, all right. Didn't happen. My rule of thumb is if it's not written down, it's not information. Now, I know we have a lot of listeners who are blind. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You can hear me. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I know we have a lot of listeners. I'm having problems here. Hang on. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, we could hear you before. Hear okay. you. Uh, I, I know we have uh, blind listeners. I know we have dyslexic listeners. And, and I know there are people who haven't, adults who haven't uh, learned how to read yet. And they they listen to books on tape and they watch documentaries like The Brainwashing of My Dad. And I don't mean to offend them. I don't mean to offend the people who can't, who have trouble reading. My rule of thumb is I want to see it in writing. It's not a fact until I can hold it in my hand and read it. That's why Twitter's so dangerous. Twitter destroys careers because you put it in writing, you tweet it, you can't edit it, and unless you take it down immediately, it's there for everybody to do a screen capture and you're exposed. You can say things on radio, you can say things on television and podcasts, and you can play the same thing over and over again. And it doesn't carry the weight as something that's been written down. I don't watch TV news because it's not written down. Mm -hmm. If it's not written down, it ain't a fact and you can't hold somebody accountable. And I'll tell you one other thing that's really telling about the United States government. When there's a hearing on Capitol Hill, you cannot get a transcript of it. When you read about a hearing on Capitol Hill, you can watch it on C-SPAN, but if you want that transcript, good luck getting it. It isn't free. It's got to go through the Congressional Printing Office. You cannot get, it is a rare hearing that has a transcript readily available. Very few congressional hearings put out transcripts. And there's a reason for that because Senate hearings, congressional hearings, are treasure troves of facts, sworn testimony under oath. God forbid the American people or the media could read through a Senate hearing and spot the lies told by Clapper when he was asked if you're spying on people. You see that in writing? There'd be a revolution in this country. If Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer cared about democracy, 
all those hearings, all those transcripts would be for free and they'd be you could read them the next day. Takes seven hours to listen to these hearings. It takes 13 minutes to skim through a seven hour hearing and get to the juicy part. They don't want that. <laughs> Jen no, Sanko, thank you so much, Jen Sanko. Please come back. It's been too long. Thank you, guys. Um, I enjoyed meeting. Yeah, yeah this was great. Sorry to keep you. It went longer okay. than that. Jen okay. Sanko. Go read The Brainwashing of My Dad right now. It gets the Feldman guarantee. Buy the book, buy The Brainwashing of My Dad. If you don't enjoy it, tell me and I'll reimburse you. It's the Feldman guarantee. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great book and it's a great documentary, The Brainwashing of My Dad. Buy 10 copies of the book, buy 10 copies of the documentary. Give it to libraries, give it to friends, leave it in laundry rooms, leave it with people <laughs> in coffee shops. People need to read this book. Come back, Jen, please. David, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks, Jen. Bye, Harry. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We have a lot to talk to the Reverend Barry W. Lynn about. We will be back. Uh, but first some music from the brilliant Professor Mike Steinel. <laughs> We're living every day, we're living every night in the USA of distraction. We wake every morning like the Rolling Stones Cause we just can't get no satisfaction Democracy's in change, we could bury its remains But infotainment culture has infected our brains We're living every day, we're living every night In the USA of distraction the wisdom we receive, the reality we perceive, is burned into our brains by cable TV. Scandal, crime, and disaster lead the news. Fear and white anxiety shape our views. The fourth estate has crumbled into an irrelevant heap. Critical thinking is all but asleep. Cause we're living every day, we're living every night in the USA of distraction. The pathological pursuit of power and profit drives everything in sight. Not sure we can stop it. Corporate plutocracy has risen to the top. We've lost the power to think, so we shop until we drop. We're surveilled and monitored while they keep us all distracted. So we never notice that our data has been extracted. We're living every day, we're living every night in the USA of distraction. All right. The Reagan agenda, a libertarian notion of sweeping deregulation has been put into motion. Our eyeballs seldom stray too far away from the mega monopolies that command the day. Diversity in media is gone, gone, gone. Slowly fading out like a sad, sad song. We're living every day. We're living every night 
In the USA of distraction The telegenic spectacle of tabloid celebrity Has squeezed out any room for social integrity With profits to be made and minds to be molded The media crushes the truth even when it's been scolded It's books now more than ever that people need to read Folks are hypnotized by their Twitter feed We're living every day, we're living every night In the USA of distraction Now we can't seem to get out of this neoliberal nightmare that cares more for Wall Street than anybody's health care. We've been bruised, battered, defunded, and dismantled. We've been diminished, infiltrated, manipulated, and manhandled. The sovereignty of citizenship, the bulwark of democracy, is under full attack by the cult of meritocracy. We're living every day, yeah. We're living every night. A distraction Where we're living every day We're living every night In the USA A distraction Where we're living every day Where we're living every night in the USA of distraction. That's right. Thank you, Professor Mike Steinell. You're listening to the David Feldman Show, DavidFeldmanShow.com. Hey, office hours every Friday night starting at 8 p.m. If you would like an invitation, go to my website and hit office hours and you'll get the link. It's not up quite yet, Reverend. We're having some website issues, but it will be the invitation will be up uh, shortly. You'll also if you subscribe to my newsletter, you will get the invitation. We're sending the newsletter out every Friday. It's a recap of the David Feldman show with every interview, every conversation, every segment with a time code. And all you have to do, Reverend, is just click on the time code and it takes you right to the part of the show that you want to watch. You can program the David Feldman Show your way by subscribing to my newsletter. Go to my website right now and sign up for the newsletter. Reverend, lots to talk about. A great deal. Do you mind leaning I, forward? Or, or your microphone is... I'm, well, I'm trying to enforce better audio. So there was a pro-row march last weekend. There was. Replacement theory we could talk about. We sure. could talk about why Congress just doesn't go ahead and repeal criminal laws that are no longer being enforced, like obscenity and draft registration. And I don't know if you have a right wing religious nut of the week or not. I do. I do indeed. And this is a doozy. But I don't. Do I have the clip? Um, I don't think I had a clip when I reported that I was going to do this. Is there a clip? Well, there should be a clip. But you don't have it. Why don't we start with the march? The row march. Did yeah. You well, go? <laughs> okay. It was very powerful. And they did some things that were very good, like having labor leaders, not just one after another, but two of them together talking. They had two, they had three women. These are anti-labor. The faith community. These would be anti-labor. 
Yeah, they were labor organizers. Oh, were, I thought you meant. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought, <laughs> Sorry. No, you didn't think that. But um, and three people of faith. Uh, the the newest uh, president of the National Council for Jewish Women gave a terrific, absolutely terrific speech. Um, but what bothers me about going to these marches, if if I am generous, I would say one out of ten people at the march was a man. One out of ten. But as I saw on one guy's T-shirt, he said a hundred percent of unwanted pregnancies are caused by us men. Wow. There were also no men speakers, which I do understand. But I kept thinking as I was listening to people, you know, talking about all the women speakers, um, what would have the reaction have been if either of the people I had on the show with me the last two weeks, what if Bill Baird told the story about the Harlem hospital and literally seeing a woman bleeding with a coat hanger hanging out of her uterus? What, what would that, you don't have to speculate. You just have to hear it. And uh, I heard him recently on another program where he told another story. He, he's providing contraceptive information at his clinic. A woman comes in and starts immediately to take off her clothes. And he says, what are you doing? And she said, well, the last guy that was going to help me with contraception uh, said he, he, he'd only help me get an, an abortion if I had sex with him. And then I did. And then he just left and said, I'm not going to help you. And or even last week with Rob Shank, what if somebody like that with the history of his anti-choice activities that went back decades had stood up there and said just a fraction of what he said on the show and then apologized to all 15 or 20,000 people? That would, I think that would have been extraordinarily powerful. But, you know, uh, I don't make the, the decisions right. and I don't. There were no, none of the kind of historic, uh, well-respected feminists. There was no Ellie Smeal from the Feminist Majority Foundation, no Jay Leno's wife, who's also very active in the, in the movement, the pro-choice movement. Not even uh, Cecile Richards, of course, who had been a longtime president of Planned Parenthood. But and I understand this idea of getting younger audiences and getting younger speakers and building up that momentum. But there are times, I think, when it would be good to hear from people from the past who have something unique to contribute. And I think both Baird and Schenck have, shall we say, right. something direct to contribute. So I went back. I mean, I came back. and But then I saw a movie the other day that's more profound than anything that happened or was said at that march. There's a French movie that was made last year. It's called Happening. And it's about 1940s France where it was impossible to get an abortion. And it tells the story of a young woman who's uh, about ready to start university, becomes pregnant, and she can't get any help. And in fact, one of the doctors she sees literally tells her to take a medication and then a friend of her says, well, that's, that's the wrong medication. She, she says, but he said it would uh, likely uh, cause a miscarriage. And the woman says, no, it, it, what it does is it makes the fetus stronger. So they're affirmatively lying. And then there's actually a, a depiction of an actual abortion. It's very difficult to watch it. Most people have never seen it but it's so graphic and so disturbing, but it's so powerful. This is what happens. You don't need the handmaid's tale to tell you what the future will be like. You just need to see what it was like or hear the voices from people like Bill Baird and the women. There are lots of women that are still with us today who could tell just how bad everything was back in the 50s and 60s when they couldn't get you not only couldn't get an abortion, you couldn't even get contraceptives to prevent a pregnancy in the first place. So, so 
let me ask you about the issue, the political issue of abortion. We've covered this before. When did abortion become a political issue? Was this, did it become political because of Roe v. Wade? Or was it an issue in the 60s, the 50s? Yeah. Well, I think it, in most, most states it was simply illegal. And there are very few doctors who would even perform an abortion. Very, very few. There were severe penalties. In fact, in France, they make a point of this a lot in the movie happening that you um, you could go to jail for 10 years just for having a, attempted to obtain an abortion and doctors could go to prison for even longer. But it's, it was a contentious issue. I mean, when I got into the church state separation issue, it was because a friend of mine in college, which would have been in 19 probably 68, uh, told me he and his girlfriend were going to London. And I said, that sounds like fun. And he said, it's, it, it's not. We're, we're going because we have to get an abortion. I said, can't you go to Massachusetts? He said, no, it's illegal there because the Roman Catholic Church had such tremendous power that it could stop any of this from happening. But it was, I think it was unthinkable unless you needed it. And, you know, my wife uh, sat around with a bunch of women in their 80s and 90s one night about 30 years ago, and every one of them had a story about abortion. They wanted to have it. Maybe they got it illegally. Maybe their sister had it. Maybe a good friend of theirs had it. And they're just, they're incredibly powerful stories. Those women are probably gone. They were 80, you know, 20 years ago. But I think if we don't learn, if you don't know what the past has been and you see something like what happened in Oklahoma today, a complete ban on abortion from the moment of fertilization. That's what the statute said. The moment of fertilization on. It's going to be very difficult, of course, to argue now in the Supreme Court, because I don't think there's going to be any substantive change in that leaked document. You can't say, well, wait a minute, Oklahoma can't do that. After all, I mean, this is uh, the first trimester. It's a woman's choice. It's all about privacy because that constitutional underpinning will be gone if this five to four decision comes to pass, as I'm afraid it will. Uh, I'm looking at Oklahoma legislators passed a law today banning abortion after conception. It is yep. the most yep. restrictive such measure in the United States. It would prohibit all abortions except to save the life, save the life of a pregnant woman or if the pregnancy is the result of rape or incest. Well, you're a lawyer. What would you advise women in Oklahoma to do? I would advise any woman who wants an abortion to claim I'm thinking off the top of my head, but you can claim you were raped. Uh, They're not going to. I know that Brett Kavanaugh postponed a rape victim's abortion in an ICE detention center. Right. I, you know, claiming you've been raped, uh, you got to. I would assume Oklahoma would then torture the woman t- into proving she was raped. And Absolutely. Right. I mean, it's like it, uh, um, the, the same day I had a conversation about this person who was going to London to get an abortion with his uh, then girlfriend. I had another conversation with somebody who didn't want to be drafted in the Vietnam War. And... Uh, one of the ways you could avoid being drafted is if you said you were gay. And I said, are you going to do that? And he said, no, it would ruin my life because the stigma against gay people in the late 60s was enormous, absolutely enormous. And you, so 
the things that we can now say, well, we could do this, or maybe we should do this, that was not available back in the late 50s and in all the way into the early 70s until we got Eisenstadt versus Baird and then later Roe versus Wade. But the thing, the other thing I want to mention, and it comes at the conversation we were having with Jen, not a single person at this rally on Saturday here in Washington ever said, ever told the story of a very important congressional race that's going on in Texas. Henry Kohler is the only anti-choice Democrat. Two days before the march, Nancy Pelosi comes out and endorses him, his reelection, and says, uh, we are, um, he's a valued member of the Democratic caucus. He is running against a woman named Jessica Cisneros, who is an Hispanic lawyer and who is a total progressive. I mean, she's, she's just what Nancy Pelosi fears. And why does Nancy Pelosi care? Nancy Pelosi thinks, possibly in her dreams, that the House will remain in Democratic hands in November. But she's going to have to get elected to be Speaker of the House. And as you recall, there was some discussion about members of the squad and other people in the Progressive Caucus not voting for her the last time she was running for Speaker. She can't afford to lose votes. And I think she looks at Jessica Cisneros and says, she wouldn't be on my team. And that's why she, but nobody, nobody spoke and said, I think it's a disgrace that the leader of the House of Representatives who says she is pro-choice can actually sit there and just days ago endorse Culler, Henry Culler, to be to retain his seat in the House. There, there's another person. We've had her on the show, Angelica Duanes. Remember her? Mm-hmm. She's running in California. Uh, she's running against a, a corporate Democrat of the worst kind, who, according to an article that just was published a few days ago, he has been giving out of his campaign funds about $4,500 a month to his wife, who runs a consulting firm. And if you go and look at what she says she's good at doing, she's a hypnotist. A hypnotist. And how about this? Uh, a visual, an, an emotional wellness facilitator and life coach. She's made a few ads for him. It is not always illegal to employ as someone who's doing your publicity, a member of your family, but it certainly is distasteful. And in his case, it's magnified by the fact that he also has a legal defense fund, which he maintains and is still raising money for, for an effort about a decade ago when he was accused of sexual harassment. And he was accused of sexual harassment. Uh, the, The case kind of... What's his name? For weird reasons, washed out. What's his name? He still used, he's still taking money for that. He took it for a case that he never had to defend, and he's still using it today for, presumably, grants for other campaign activities. It's just, What's it's his just name? dishonest. What's his it's name? It's so dishonest. Who? What's his name? Tony Cardenas. Oh, right. Tony right. Cardenas. Right. Yes, Howie Klein has talked about him. Yeah, well, I mean, he's he's, he's a completely useless member, un- unless, again, you're looking for a vote, as Nancy uh, Pelosi would be in the event that it's a very close election and she somehow might retain control of the House. So the absence of comments about Nancy Pelosi was a huge mistake. By the way, you're being polite. Uh, Tony Cardenas is accused of sexually abusing a 16-year-old girl. That's correct, who uh, apparently worked for someone that uh, he, he or I, I think he hired the guy as a gardener or something. This was his daughter. Hmm. But, you know, but you can't, nobody's perfect, possibly you, I don't know. Thank you. I agree, I, agree, I agree with you. Yeah. I thought you would. Thank you. But 
But when you have this level of problems and then you compound it with this very, very sketchy idea of submitting, I think the bills or the payments to uh, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Cardenas were something like $434,000 last year. That's a lot of money yeah. for ads. Maybe she hypnotized them. It's possible. Maybe, you know, when you used to go to the movies and there were these uh, things called subliminal ads right. that may or may not have been used, but you'd be watching a preview for something and then there'd be a subliminal ad like, drink and then they name a soda or mm -hmm. buy Twizzlers or something. And then it, then there would, in theory, be a march out to the candies counter to buy before the movie started. That could happen. Right. Could happen. I don't right. believe in subliminal advertising, but it Me could neither. be happening. Me neither. I'm against it. Yeah. I don't know. I, I could, but I wouldn't. But there's nothing wrong if you want to do that if you want to solicit no, subliminal people. advertising would be wrong and uh, it would be completely wrong. particular what if somebody for example put up a subliminal ad suggesting that people who are watching or listening have sex with him that would be terrible that would be i would be opposed to that i think it's actually against the law it well be, it should be yeah yeah um well so anyway so with with the march and the failure of anybody to criticize Nancy Pelosi and this stunning movie happening, um, I, in, in case I ever had any doubts since I was, I don't know, 14 or something about how important an absolute decision making by women about pregnancy is, this week alone would have wiped away any doubts whatsoever. The abortion movement, how much can you blame the Supreme Court for the difficulty for women, the difficulty that women face getting an abortion? Is the Supreme Court all to blame or is it the fault of its local Republicans on a granular level eroding the, the woman's right to privacy state by state, right? No, absolutely. And uh, this idea that Mitch McConnell doesn't want to talk about, except I think he's thinking about it. What about a national anti-abortion law, a federal law that would circumvent any decisions? Again, this is a, a difficult area of the law, but you could make a case that it would subsume any more positive statutes in the states. It would outlaw abortion forever and possibly as early as conception, like the Oklahoma bill does. But I think that it is, I would love to think that this is going to create a national backlash, a blue wave of people who say, if it's a Republican, I am not going to vote for that person. I wish that were the case. I wish I believed it. I simply don't yeah. think there's any evidence of that. And, and there's an early poll few days ago suggesting that this really for Democrats just isn't that big a deal. And it should be. It should be the biggest deal. Talked a few weeks ago, we talked about making some some one issue the big issue and suggest that it would be health care. Um, but I think this this issue is um, just plain easier to explain to people. And I think that any Democrat who doesn't make this front and center is going to be in trouble, is going to be in trouble. Right. And that it's it's a moral imperative to talk about this, to preserve this, or it's all going to disappear for most women in this country in the next election cycle. By the time the Senate flips and the House flips, doesn't matter what Joe Biden does or says, it will be an unstoppable wave to restrict abortion rights. And and since, remember, the pro-life, so-called pro-life movement, which, of course, earlier this week also refused to fund uh, any serious work on baby formula, which is in a 
short supply in almost every state now. Um, so as uh, uh, if pe- these people are pro-life until birth, and then they basically don't give a crap. Right, right. And, and but it it is it is unthinkable, unthinkable that candidates would not. We even saw Senator Casey, who's certainly not been a fan of of abortion rights, until Casey versus Planned now. Parenthood. Was that the father? Yeah, no, this is the son. Yeah, yeah. But he, um, but he was always kind of muddled headed about it. But when he saw the the draft bill, he, he decided to vote for the codification, which of course failed last year, codifying Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade. Somebody said at the hearings uh, at the uh, uh, march on Saturday is just you know we ought to view it as the floor, not the ceiling. And I do remember saying once at a big march for women's lives back in 2004 that I thought the, it was essential that women make that choice no matter when it is, no matter what the basis for the interest in having an abortion and all the way through pregnancy, because that's really what it's all about. All the way through? All the way through. Even when third, yeah, third trimester, it should not be regulatable. Even if it could live in an incubator. It's up to the mother to decide whether she wants the fetus to live in an incubator or she wants to terminate it. And nobody, nobody needs to get in the way of making that decision. She can ask anybody she wants. She can even call her congressman's office and say, what do you think of this? But ultimately, it's got to be her decision. Right. I mean, so six months pregnant, and there's no question that the baby could survive outside the womb, at least in an incubator. I think a lot of countries in Europe would not allow an abortion. Right? They wouldn't. But, you know, this whole thing, Roe versus Wade is built on this, on a couple of fantasies. One is that you can determine um, viability at a specific moment. And this is why in the Mississippi case, it's the basis for this uh, potential overturning of Roe completely. The issue was, well, you know, he kind of can... Uh, the second trimester, 23, 24 months. But now we can do so much more. We can preserve fetal life at 15, so we should move it back to 15. That's not the point. In my view, that's not the moral or legal point that needs to be made. But it's built into the law. So when all these characters, including the two women Republicans who are allegedly pro-choice, when they wouldn't vote for the bill, they they just they said it was it went too far, it went too far. What what does that even mean? I mean, one of them said, "Well, the uh, the Affordable Care Act has certain exemptions for hospitals, Catholic hospitals. They don't have to perform abortions. That's what the law is. Codify that too if you want. But I think Chuck Schumer was looking for a vote." that he could use to say, look at all of the, everybody, every Republican voted against this, and that that was more important than passing the bill in the first place. I no longer am interested in what senators say, how pro-choice they are, if what they mean is, I gave a good speech on the Senate floor, I went on MSNBC three times, and I said, (laughs) a woman's right to choose must be inviolate, I don't care. I want to know, what did you do to stop Amy Coney Barrett? Not what did you say about it on television? What did you do to delay and possibly make sure that vote never occurred? I don't want to know anything else. I want to know what you did. Don't send me eight requests for money every day unless you answer that question. So I now write back to all these campaign committees and say, uh, I would like to support Senator so-and-so, but what did she do 
when it came time to stop a woman who was going to be on the Supreme Court who had signed a letter month, years ahead of that calling abortion barbaric. What do you have to know about somebody about their view of Roe if they said in an open letter printed in newspapers, it is a barbaric practice and say, we think it's wrong. It's barbaric. She has no business remaining. She had no business being approved to sit on the United States Supreme Court. And it's getting worse. We're going to run out of time. But let me I, say one. I want to ask you about the replacement replacement theory, but c continue. Yeah, well, I wanted to say, even in the great replacement theory, which, of course, is a horrible idea uh, based uh, in the early 20th century when French writers and philosophers are talking about uh, how white Europe was becoming uh, distorted by immigrants from Africa and the Middle East. But then it was used, and it was used by the killer in Buffalo. Um, of course, the killer in Buffalo, I think, has already said, or I'm sure he will, he just learned about this on Fox News by hearing Tucker Carlson talk about it. But just today, it got even worse. Here's something. I used to be on TV occasionally with this guy, Matt Schlapp. Remember him? He's now the head of the Conservative Political Action Committee. Right. And he was giving a speech in Europe, in Hungary, of course, not, not exactly a role model for great countries. He says yesterday that we could solve the whole great replacement theory problem simply by banning abortions. In other words, if more children are forced to be born in the United States, wow. there will be too many of them. Can you believe this? This is where it's gone. These people, these, this is so fringy. It's hard with a straight face for me to even report what he says. But why would you say this unless you are desperately trying to say, oh, wait a minute, it's not racist or anti-Semitic to talk about the great replacement theory. We're just trying to find a way out of it. We're just trying to find a way that we could fix it, like making sure that every woman who is pregnant will have that fetus grown to full term babyhood. Wow. It destroys the way we think about almost everything. That's how bad this is. When you, I was saying at the top of the show that in order to defend the indefensible, you have, you have to become progressively more twisted and dumber and you have to make the American people progressively dumber than you are in order for them to buy this. And it feels like the, the building blocks of discourse in the United States on both sides are built on a false premise that's indefensible and it just gets dumber and dumber. And when you're defending something that cannot be defended, you're a lawyer. It, you, if when you have to twist your logic into pretzels and <laughs> practice verbal uh, gymnastics to to prove a point, the the whole country becomes the whole conversation is is based on stupidity and a lie. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I don't think progressives lie about things. I, I mean, I was thinking. I, I think they. I think they don't. I think they're unwilling to speak the absolute platonic truth about what's going on. I just yes, don't. I, I think. I, I think they they won't stand up for core tenets of the Enlightenment. I think they're they're chicken shit. I think there's a lot of that. I do think it. But I think on principle, when you look at all the great issues of the day, whether it's environmental issues, energy policy, human rights, civil rights, civil liberties, I think the progressive view has sustained itself extremely well. 
that this is that I can't think of. Anything. So is the, so is the teachings of Christ, but the practitioners tend to be, for the most part, on the side of chicken shit. In other uh, words, yeah, I, I think certainly it is a huge amount of uh, chicken waste uh, that comes out of the church. There's no doubt right. about Right, and the progressive movement. Where is the leadership in this country? Uh, in the, in the progressive, other than Bernie. Maybe Elizabeth Warren and, and certainly some members of the squad, no doubt. Yeah. But I don't know. Did you see anything at the Roe rally that made you optimistic? Anybody speak who you thought? Eh, I... Well, I think one one person who spoke from one of the groups that was sponsoring it said that we simply will not go along. We women will not go along with anything politicians say. Don't ask us to do anything. And this the, a Liz Estrada moment. I, I I don't understand why women are not having a Liz Estrada moment and saying we're done. Except yeah. for David Feldman. Except for David <laughs> Feldman. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think there's a, there is a footnote. In fact, if you read Lysistrata in the original Greek, um, there is a footnote that says exactly that. We're not talking about anyone named Feldman. You know, I think Aristophanes wrote Lysistrata, and the, it's a false premise. As I understand the ancient Greeks, women threatening to stop having sex with Greek men at that time, they'd go, and the problem being, I don't think men back then were that upset about uh, women not having sex with them. Well, very, very we, gay, should, very we should gay. ask a historian, but... Um, I think it was a very uh, LGBTQ friendly... Sure. Period in America, in American history, in American history, you're doing a George Bush thing. Yes. You know, the problem with that clip and um, it, it's not just that he made the gaffe of complaining about uh, uh, Putin going into uh, Iraq, but then he made a joke of it. And he, of course, he joked about weapons of mass destruction, as you may remember, at one of those correspondence dinners yeah. um he was up to give his little you know comedy routine and he was looking under the tablecloth and said uh, no weapons of mass destruction here and that was supposed to be funny now i was not at that dinner but i i don't think that's not funny yeah but it's what you do you cover up it's what Rush Limbaugh did. It's what all of these characters, Greg Gutfield and these other so-called comedians on Fox News do. They punch down, they hurt people who can't punch back, and they think they're being funny, and in fact, they're just being shits. Which is why if somebody's a Republican, I punch down at them. If, yeah. if you're, I have a rule. Uh, if you're a closeted gay Republican, I punch down. If you're an obese Republican, I punch down. If you're unattractive, I punch down. If you're a Republican, you're in the business of punching down. So I'm going to I'm not going to I'm not better than you. When you go low, I go lower. <laughs> That's my I remember yep. working for somebody who was ultra right wing. He punched down. And man, if you made fun, he, he would isolate the thing you were most self-conscious about right. and work it. And God forbid somebody did the same to him, his knees buckled. That's not fair. That's not fair. I know. Oh, I, I don't like I was making fun of Lindsey Graham calling him Miss Lindsay, and people say, what does his homosexuality have to do with his politics? And I wrote back everything. Right. He's in the closet, everything. He's he's sick. He's in the closet. That's sick. Well. He's a, yeah, well, Lindsay was. Um, yeah. 
I was at... Uh, you had you know, dinner was, uh, across... Didn't you have dinner and he was with his... Well, you don't want to talk about that. No, I mean, it was a Valentine's Day. And Joanne and I were at a German restaurant on Capitol Hill. And he was having a, a, a fine dinner and a fine, laughable conversation with a guy. Maybe it was his chief of staff, but maybe it was just... A guy a who is chief of his staff. It could have, you know, I saw Lewis Black show a couple of weeks ago and his opening act told a joke about uh, Lindsey Graham. We were sitting around afterwards and uh, I, I said, I, I didn't say this, but I wanted to say, I have a better story about Lindsey Graham. When Lindsey Graham was running for the Senate, he and I were on a show on uh, the sports network and it was after a Supreme Court decision that said you couldn't use the public address system of a public high school to select someone, assign that person as a chaplain, and then um, he could give a prayer, she could give a prayer. And uh, a bunch of people who were pretty conventionally religious, including a warm family sued, said, this, this, will not, this does not work. So six to three decision, you can't do that. You can't use a public address system. So Lindsey Graham and I are on television a couple of days later. And he says, you know, uh, I have a feeling that there's going to be a lot of spontaneous praying going on in football stadiums this next weekend. Meaning people would just defy them. And I said, you know, Mr. Graham, honestly, when school prayer was declared unconstitutional. Jack Kennedy was president. He, he explained to people, whether you like it or not, this is the final verdict of the institution that has been given the power to make the final decision on what the Constitution means. But I said, I would like to think that you, as an elected official who plans to be a senator, would do something other than just suggest that people just thumb their nose at the ruling Maybe you could get more creative. For example, I said, why don't you just train a whole flock of parrots to say the Lord's Prayer and then release them at football stadiums throughout the country? Mm. And he it, it didn't, it didn't really like that, but he never liked <laughs> me before either. So I guess that was okay. But yeah, these people, they are... Look at Tucker Carlson. Somebody comes to, you know, one one or two nights people were protesting outside of his house he acted like this was the end of the world he was being put upon by all these people who didn't like him it's like the supreme court justices what do you expect if you do something that's going to take away the rights of 51 percent of the american people and people come to your house and walk down the street and annoy your name make a little make your neighbors go I wish he didn't live here. I wish right. he didn't live here. Why is that the end of the world for these people? These people, don't, they don't work very hard. Supreme Court justices have staff, have clerks that write almost all of the stuff they do. Really? They take off in June, and they don't come back till October, and they don't do anything except get cushy teaching jobs wait, around wait, wait, the wait. world. The Supreme Court justice hire comedy writers to write yes, their they, bits? No, they don't. But they, well... Did Alito write that, or did Yeah, I did think he, he, he wanted to get a comedy writer, but they were all uh, on late night on Fox News, right. and so they couldn't be bothered. Right. But no, occasionally they come up with actually uh, some clever lines. I wouldn't say they're comic lines, but um, they. Alito, not Alito, Scalia was funny. Scalia was, yeah, he could actually come up with fairly clever lines in his write, writings. And then yeah. it, when he gave speeches, he, he could, you know, well, he's funnier than Greg Gutfeld. Let's put it. Very quickly, religious nut of the week. Yeah. Um, Greg Locke of the Tennessee Global Vision Bible Church. So last Sunday, he has a streaming ministry. He usually does it from a big tent outside of, of a building. Here's what he said. <clears throat> you cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. If you vote Democrat, 
I don't even want you in the church. You can get out. You can get out, you demon. Well, my old employer, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, uh, filed a complaint with the Internal Revenue Service that said that this violated the prohibition, one of those few in tax laws for... Uh, the Johnson non-profits. Amendment. Hmm? The you Johnson. can't endorse... What? The Johnson Amendment. The so-called Johnson Amendment. And um, you can talk about any issues you want, but you can't tell people what party to vote for, what candidates to vote for. And we had high hopes that Barack Obama would actually start enforcing the law, but this was one of the many things that were so disappointing about the Obama presidency and separation of church and state. He just never took it seriously. And as a consequence... Republicans now go to churches on a regular basis. It's not like Democrats have never gone uh, to churches and inappropriately ask people to vote for them. But now the floodgates are just open. I hope that this Biden administration, Internal Revenue Service, takes this seriously, looks at this. This is not, by the way, this is not just some random guy at a Tennessee church. This is a guy who was... At January 6th, he, he actually preached to a crowd of people. He's he's given blessings to the actions of the Proud Boys, that extremist fascist organization. So this guy is so closely related to the fringes of politics. If he said, if he only said, be anti-abortion, be anti-gay rights, but he hadn't also then told them what party to vote for, um, he might have gotten away with it, but I don't think he should get away with this kind of obvious declaration of who you ought to be voting for, and in this case, who you ought to be voting against. Great. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn, for nearly a quarter of a century, ran Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Uh, he's an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ as well as an attorney, and we always uh, love having you on the show. Thank you so much. Go to BarryWLynn.com to see his sermons, his interviews, his conversations. Excerpts from your book, perhaps? Um, Not yet, but both of the interviews that I did, both with Bill Beard and with Rob Schenck, are up there uh, when you get... I think it's on the open page. Great. So thank you. Thank you. you thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. it's almost time for the professors and Marianne, but I'm looking at Joe in Norway's hummus cam, and I can't tell if that is Rahima.org's website. I'm looking at everything Rahima.org provides for refugees. And everybody should go to Rahima.org to donate, give $5. I mean, that's how Rahima.org feeds refugees in the United States, in the, in the Bay Area. They give them nutritious food. Uh, you know, $5 can buy a pound of beans and enough vegetables to feed a family uh, healthier than any other meal you can you can give your family. Uh, Joe, what are you going to be cooking for us? I'll be making a, a creamy, smooth hummus tonight. But before I just, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention something about APAC, which you may have missed. Please don't bring it. <laughs> please. I'm already it's already starting. Uh, the, the, <laughs> my policy is APEC is anti-Semitic. It thinks Jews are too stupid to solve a problem with the Palestinians through anything other than violence. APEC is anti-Semitic. It thinks Jews are stupid and violent. Anybody who doesn't speak out against APEC is an anti-Semite, period. Absolutely. But one thing missing. No, from no, no. This just is I, I don't want to discuss it. No, no. Okay. No. Moving on. Don't touch the third rail of APAC on this show. No politics. No, no politics. What? What about APAC? Go ahead. 
the left and the right leadership in Israel are united, virtually united against Palestinian rights. That's just a fact. This is more of a issue with Zionism from my experience. That's all I okay. wanted to say about that. I, so I, I give you. And I give. I I'm gave making you, a national dish of Israel. It's Palestine. never enough for you people. <laughs> I, I shit on APEC for an hour on today's show, and it's not good enough. Is J Street okay? Does it does does J oh, Street pass your uh, smell now, test? Now I now I should stop talking. About, I'll stop. Talking you got, about do you have a problem issue. with J Street? Yes, but well, for another time. Anyways, in order to make a smooth and clean. How long homeless, did you live in Israel for? Oh, I lived there uh, several years, a couple different times. Okay. And maybe in retirement. Maybe. Okay. Go ahead. And be sure to focus on, on the task I do before I cook the hummus, in order to make a very smooth and creamy hummus, you have to essentially circumcise the chickpeas. So I'll be playing a little bit of a, a moil here tonight. Okay. Circumcise about 500 chickpeas. And the trick is to use bicarbonate of soda. So we just cook it oh. real quick. It basically, the alkaline uh, melts the 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 husk of the, the the bean and then you can wash that away and then cook your beans and you have completely smooth as silk holes. Right. So be sure to wash that. I, I wanna, very important. I, I want to check in with Dan. Are we going to be doing any quizzing today? I have a five question quiz if you want it. Well, uh, why don't we... We can save it till Monday. If no, 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 no. I didn't see it on the calendar. It was at 6.20. That's why. It was on 6.20. Oh, very quickly. Let, what, what is the... <laughs> let, let's... Very quickly. I don't want to keep anybody waiting. Very, let's let's just plow through it. I apologize. I didn't see it on the calendar. It's okay. I'm sorry. So let, let's put it in the... I'll get started. Okay, very quickly. You, you versus me. Here we go. Today's quiz is inspired by a birthday. Oh, the money's still going inside the kitchen. Yes. On May 19th, in 1946, in a small town in France, a huge star was born. It was, give it to me again. What is this? May 19th. 1946, in a small town in France, a huge star was born. He eventually reached seven feet, four inches tall. Andre the and Giant. Andre the Giant. That's right. Um, today's quiz is about pro wrestling. I know everything about pro wrestling very very quick good go ahead <laughs> hulk hogan's famous suggestion to uh, all his little hulkamaniacs was to say your prayers and blank ask to, peter teal to finance my lawsuit against bubba the love sponge to get your exercise to take your vitamins to eat your vegetables or to love your friend's wife <laughs> eat your vegetables <laughs> It took me 10 minutes to think of that, you fuck. All right, number two. What's the, correct, <laughs> what's the correct answer? Take your vitamins. Take your vitamins, not eat your vegetables. Say your prayers and take your vitamins, brother. Okay. Uh, number two, what is the term used to describe a wrestler who usually cheats and badmouths fans in order to generate a negative response? A heel. Is it a heel, a jerk, a shoe, or a comedian? <laughs> a heel. The correct answer is a heel. Okay. <laughs> Number three, wrestlers Mike Graham and Dusty Rhodes confirmed that he once drank 156 beers and dubbed him the greatest drunk on earth. Was this King Kong Bundy, The Ultimate Warrior, Andre the Giant, or Dan F.? <laughs> I think it's Andre the Giant. It is Andre the Giant. That is correct. Number four, what did George the Animal Steel used to eat before a big match? Was it fire, the turnbuckle padding, a banana, or a can of beans? <laughs> fire. No, you see the turnbuckle. Ah. Okay. Do you remember George the Animal Steel? He had a hairy back. He started eating the fucking <laughs> corner of the, the ring. Professor the Ann Lee, are you are you a, a wrestling fan, Professor Ann Lee? 
No, I stopped after a while. I, I went over the over the top of the rope myself. Okay. Uh, Dan, I apologize. I didn't see it in the in the in the in the calendar. It's okay. There's there's one more. Okay. And Professor Anley, that sounded very quiet. I'm not sure if you've got a way to boost yeah, it up a little bit. To, but here's yeah. here's number five. Which of the following wrestling terms means to bleed during a match? Is it shoot, juice, job, or that time of the match? <laughs> the time of the match. Anybody? That time of the match. Uh, I'm going to say, what's number one? We have shoot, juice, job, or that time of the match. Shoot. It is juice. Ah, okay. That is juicing. And there's more more questions I was looking at. They actually used to cut themselves with a razor blade and then heal up for a couple of weeks. So when they got knocked a little bit, they would bleed. Right. But yeah, they, they have scars bleed. on their foreheads. Yep. Yeah. If, you got, if you're... If you're thinking of being a cutter, and I don't recommend it, uh, I better be careful here. But uh, if you it always cut the forehead because it ble that's where all the blood goes. Unless you're a Republican, then there's no blood flow. To, to, <laughs> or at this point, a Democrat. Dan, I apologize. Thank you so okay. much. I'll see Enjoy you at office professors. hours. I'll see you at office hours to, tomorrow night, right? And the, the, the links are up on the website now. As soon as you mentioned that, I was like, I forgot to uh, fix it. Oh, earlier really? this week. Did so, you so, access the website? Yeah, I accessed the website and I posted uh, Monday's show and I put in the office hours link for this Friday. Right. And if people wanted it, is there a link to attend a live taping through? No, that, that's not set. That, yeah, we're still the, the office hours is all set. OK, thank you, Dan. Time for the professors and Marianne. Joining us is Professor Ann Lee. You read her over at Daily Co's under the name Annie Lee, Professor Jonathan Bick, who will be at office hours tomorrow teaching us about Star Trek and the Twilight Zone. Professor Adnan Hussein, host of Guerrilla History and the Mudgeless Podcast, and Professor Mary Ann Cummings, who is Parks Commissioner, Aurora, Illinois, still clinging to Nina Turner. Let's start with Anne Lee and her. Let me address your sound issues. You, Hello. Is that, that good? I think so. Testing one, two, three. Uh, yeah. Peas and carrots. Peas and carrots. Okay. I think that's good. Is that well, good enough? Yeah. What would you like? If you could talk loud, like you're angry. Okay. That's good. <laughs> Uh, what would you like to talk about tonight? Oh, I, I had a book recommendation. Um, I've been uh, also writing about uh, some of the issues in uh, uh, Ukraine now that uh, we're entering a kind of late phase. And uh, today, uh, another amusing, I don't know if it's really a bombshell as much as it's uh, just interesting that... Uh, uh, one, a congressperson, a member of the House of Representatives from uh, uh, from Georgia, a fellow by the name of Barry Loudermilk, who's not on everybody's list, uh, just happened to uh, essentially lie to uh, uh, congressional investigators uh, about whether he had given tours, a 19-minute tour of the Capitol on January 5th. And he did sort of the typical GOP thing by attacking um, attacking Democrats who questioned his uh, credibility on that issue. And uh, unfortunately, the, uh, <laughs> the select committee has the video receipts of him uh, leading a bunch of folks around. So it's just uh, pretty bizarre that he would try and do that and do we, who do we see who the people he led? Did they end up? In uh, we haven't seen the tape itself, and there's no specific uh, identification. But I figure that the committee is is doing that. Uh, probably did it um, because they've been doing that for everything, and undoubtedly uh, uh, they've just asked uh, uh, Barry Barry Loudermilk to show up. Uh, voluntarily to the committee, and we'll see whether he gets served a subpoena just on that basis. 
uh, it's clear that they are. It's just a sign that they have a lot of receipts, and that these weird denials are just going to going to stack up. Uh, and and of course, the reference to it as a quote unquote reconnaissance mission is sort of interesting in in the sort of subtext of that. And uh, well, um, most of the the news programs led with that uh, a couple hours ago. So and Merrick Garland that. supposedly is asking the committee for some transcripts. Indeed. Uh, and the, the sign from that particular request that's important is to suggest that it's a wide-ranging investigation, something which has not uh, been totally emphasized before. But I think it's a good sign relative to the month away we are from public hearings. I think we'll have a couple of pretty interesting um, uh must see moments on yeah when video. are the, when are the public hearings uh a month from from now i think um maybe in a couple of weeks i i don't recall the exact date maybe somebody and, else what, what is the timing behind that is the feeling that hearings during the summer will get a bigger audience i would guess that that's it a lot of these things are timing i, I uh, I think that the uh, wide-ranging uh, Merrick Garland thing was released on this on the same day of the anniversary of the 1973 Senate, uh, the beginning of the Senate water Watergate inquiry. You know, the Mueller was, report. The Mueller report. No, no, 1973 Watergate. No, no I'm uh, saying you're saying that Mueller released it. You said Garland released. Garland released or. The news, uh, and this may just simply be the, the committee releasing the information that the, F, that the Justice Department requested uh, transcripts oh, I see. Uh, from the select committee. But the timing of it on the day of the anniversary of the 1973 Watergate Senate committee hearings seems auspicious in that sense, if nothing else, to put a little spin on it. So. Right. A lot of timing going on. Um, I mean, I think it is uh, important that the, the, our summer viewing have some of this. Of course, in 1973, you didn't have all of these abilities to look at, uh, you know, video again and again. Uh, and a lot of people were, you know, glued to the sets when we only had three major networks. So, you know, the, I think it's different these days. But uh, important. We're going to have lots of these timing issues. I think. Uh, uh, the issue that it is a wider ranging investigation and that ultimately, you know, so, some of us who complain about Merrick Garland not moving fast enough uh, is finally going to be answered. We, we may actually have, you know, with all due respect, a some kind of indictments or at least early indictments that will squeeze other people, perhaps. Right. Let me ask our distinguished panel. The midterms are in November. The Democrats are going to lose the House. That means the January 6th committee will be disbanded. You have uh, you have a case against Donald Trump that's falling apart in uh, New York City. Alvin Bragg, the D.A., is pretty much not going to prosecute. You have this grand jury in Georgia investigating the phone call that Trump made to Raffsenberger. You know, I only need X amount of votes. That doesn't seem to be going anywhere. The wheels of justice don't seem to uh, turn slow. They seem to turn in reverse when it comes to Trump. Does anybody see anything other than fact finding a public record of all these crimes that have been committed but nobody doing time. Does anybody see any chance of Giuliani, Trump, or any of these top dogs doing time? Anybody? I wouldn't take that bet. I mean, and it looks well, like, you know, our judicial system is not going to hold people of power accountable. I mean, th th we've been on this trajectory for a couple of decades at least. And 
you know, I mean, from the from the moment that uh, Ford pardoned Nixon, mm -hmm. that was setting a terrible precedent. And, you know, uh, Reagan was not held accountable. Uh, Bush Sr. was not held accountable. Bush Jr. is not going to be held accountable. Dick Cheney is not going to be held accountable. I, I mean, I can just go on and on and on. But I, I can't. I don't know. I don't see Trump being held accountable here. Um, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope uh, Professor and Lee is right. And, you know, that Mer Merrick Garland is going to awaken from his slumber and actually do something. But um, we'll see. Bob Dylan said, steal a little, they throw you in jail, steal a lot, and they make you king. And when I first heard that, I thought it was profound. That was 40 years ago. Now it's trite and banal. No fault of Bob Dylan's. But it's just, yeah, well, gee, of course. Okay. Uh, what would you like to talk about, Professor Bick? Well, I wanted to pick up on something that uh, the Reverend Barry Lynn had mentioned uh, toward the end of his segment. Uh, in the wake of the leaked Supreme Court decision draft that plans to overturn Roe versus Wade, an entirely peaceful pro-choice uh, protest were held outside the homes of right-wing justices Brett Kavanaugh and John Roberts. But Republicans, including Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and Senator Josh Hawley, you remember Josh Hawley, mm -hmm. uh, David, he uh, he was photographed raising his fist in support of the January 6th uh, attempted coup. Uh, they complained that the gatherings of around 100 people to sites of mob violence and demanded that Democrats condemn the protesters. And predictably, the Democrats sprang into action. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki um, said that President Biden strongly believes that protests should never include violence, threats, or vandalism, suggesting that the demonstrators, including Kavanaugh's neighbors, who chanted pro-choice slogans and carried signs, had posed a threat to the justices' safety. There was no violence at these protests, in fact or implied. The legislation, um, so the, the, um, the Senate uh, passed legislation the Monday after that weekend when these protests happened unanimously uh, that ensures that family members of Supreme Court justices are afforded the same level of protection as senators' families. Journalist Jug Legum said, quote, It's remarkable how quickly the Senate has acted to protect the privacy and safety of five justices. It's something senators are unwilling to do for millions of women. Right. Right. Uh, the, so, um, so the Senate, the Senate, their family members are entitled to privacy. Apparently, so, uh, so not only privacy but protection. Protect. So, Jessica Schumer, Harvard Law School graduate, daughter of Charles Schumer, gets a job as a lobbyist for Amazon. Who's paying for her protection? Taxpayers or Amazon? Uh, oh, I don't think it's Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> so so we're paying for Jessica Schumer's protection when she's lobbying for Amazon. Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, you know, Gee, we why are we going to lose the Senate in November? Chris Smalls might come after her. <laughs> <laughs> and the and Senate. Think, oh, go ahead. Sorry, just I, I think this uh, what Prof. John has raised about this uh, issue of uh, very quickly moving to protect family members suggests that your apparently vindictive and beyond the bounds attacks on the families of all of these elites is actually, you know, uh, pretty effective. I mean, they clearly feel like that's a point of vulnerability. So they've moved very quickly to not have um, any consequences for them and their families. Um, you know, and they're the maybe. ones on this show, at least my official position is 
It's the, the families that should pay the price. The sins of the father should be passed on to the children. Well, that, that's what I mean. You've been pretty consistently suggesting that and emphasizing that you should go after, you know, these kids, these families who are benefiting from yes. the ill-gotten gains. Um, and Not um, physically. they've clearly moved to protect themselves on precisely that score because they feel vulnerable. That would be clearly effective. Well, right, but I'm not advocating been... physical violence. I'm just saying that they should be rounded up by the state and placed in re-education camps. That's all I've ever said. <laughs> there have been a lot of threats, though. I mean, there were, and, 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 you know, a guy set himself on fire a couple of weeks ago, and then there was the guy who pulled up in front of SCOTUS with, uh, purportedly with a explosive device. So. With a one? An explosive device. He rolled up in his, uh, pickup truck and claimed he had a, 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 you know, a bomb. But that wasn't going after anybody's family. <clears throat> no, but I mean, the, the, the no, we don't know about how many how many different kinds of threats have been been happening. And there has been reports about uh, judges, more judges now being threatened across the board, not right. simply uh, SCOTUS. That's, right. Let me let me just clarify I do not believe in physical violence. I just believe that if your last name is Bezos, you should be tainted. You, you should not be allowed to be proud of the Bezos name. If your last name is Schultz, you should not be proud that your father is Howard Schultz. That should be synonymous with evil. These are union busting companies. And I think no physical violence, but I think we need a cultural revolution in this country where we denigrate, not celebrate inherited wealth. That's all I'm saying. And I think in fairness, these protests were not uh, aimed at the families of the Supreme Court justices. They were aimed at the Supreme Court justices. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that they were at their house and they felt vulnerable well, dearie me, these were peaceful protests. You're taking on a position of that power. You're making these controversial decisions that are at odds with the majority of Americans in what is supposed to be the least powerful branch of government. And and you are uh, and, and Susan Collins did the same thing. Someone wrote a message in chalk, not threatening on on the sidewalk outside of her house and she calls the police Please. really yeah so uh the senate held a vote on the on the women's protection act which uh would have affirmed that health care professionals have the right to provide abortion care and that pregnant americans have the right to obtain abortions the vote failed 51 to 49 and uh, the Democrats knew it would fail due to the legislative filibuster, which requires 60 votes because we had to protect slavery and we haven't gotten rid of it since the Civil War. Uh, unless right wing Democratic senators, Kristen Sinema of Arizona and Joe Manchin of West Virginia ended their opposition to filibuster reform, which they did not. So that went out the window. So a legislative fix is not going to be forthcoming for those two reasons. Uh, so while the Supreme Court is poised to roll back reproductive rights for 166 million women, said progressive journalist David Sirota, the Senate's response was to give the justices and their families more royal guards. Adam Sewer of The Atlantic noted that while Democrats have said in recent days that a backlash against the impending Supreme Court ruling will secure victories for the party in the midterm elections, possibly, the unanimous vote on Monday of the Senate suggests, quote, the party leadership does not seem to like the idea of there being a backlash. Matt. Max Berger of pro-labor rights media organization More Perfect Union 
tweeted that protests held at the Supreme Court justices' homes are a legitimate outfit for the majority to express anger with an increasingly anti-democratic political system. While voting to protect justices from such protests, Berger wrote, the Senate can't defend a right supported by 70% of Americans. Hmm. And, you know, uh, for more than two centuries, the Supreme Court judges families have not needed this additional protection i think here's a better idea maybe the supreme court should not issue rulings that are opposed by a super majority of americans maybe they should respect legal precedent and the principle of stare decisis on matters where they testified under oath that they were super precedents Maybe they should respect the bodily autonomy of Americans instead of substituting their extremist religious ideology on those who do not share their evidence-free beliefs. Those are just some suggestions. You know, another what, great way to protect your family? Abort your babies. That's, you don't have to worry about protecting your, your family if you get an abortion. <laughs> just a suggestion. Yeah. Uh, you know, and as for the Democratic Party, you know, I thought they were genu genuinely dedicated to protecting abortion rights. But when the Democratic Party leadership uh, uh, protects anti-choice incumbents against pro-choice progressive primary challengers, I have to wonder if they care more about abortion as a right or as a fundraising issue. Yeah. It's clear that corporate Democrats do not side with most people on Medicare for all, taxing the rich, unions, forgiving student debt, and other popular economic policies. But at least I thought they would actually fight for certain social issues like the right to an abortion. Uh, now I'm not so sure. Yeah. Starbucks says they will drive women in Texas to uh to get an abortion so if you turn in howard schultz you can get ten thousand bucks right <laughs> or a lot of uh, lattes yeah do you have to buy a coffee to get driven to the clinic or not necessarily <laughs> <laughs> professor marianne cummings do you have your voice back I, I do. I do have my voice back. Sorry about that. I didn't realize how bad I sounded. And, you know, I had no idea I had lost my voice until somebody called me up in the morning that morning. I couldn't speak. So it was just a massive pollen attack is what it was. So, you lost your kidding. voice when that Alito decision got leaked. We all <laughs> lost our voice. I'm just trying to audition yep. for MSNBC with those platitudes. Oh, man, you have to, like, really disconnect the integrity portion of your brain if you want a job there. I mean, you know, basically, you do, you just have to be a mouthpiece. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I have to say, you know, I, I kind of miss years ago when I actually liked Chris Hayes. And I, I, I actually liked him. He's and still he great. But when I watch him, he's still great. Isn't he? I don't watch. I don't watch him much anymore. And he's he he had that uh, Ministry of Truth uh, maniac on his show the other night. I saw a clip of that. Uh, what was her Nina Janowski? But she's done, they, right? So, they shut down I, the minute. Yeah, they no, shut? I think they, she resigned, and I think they've like decided. Ooh, that was kind of a bad idea. Uh, right. You know the idea. <laughs> the, the idea that and you know uh, there there was like a, a series of um, violence done on on Twitter, people actually digging up her past. Uh, one of the things she was involved with uh, back in the, uh, 2017 was with a group that was trying to like um, do PR for the Azov Battalion, for, well, for for Ukraine in general, but, you know, to try to, you know, let's spin a different narrative on these Nazi groups who happen to be our clients, so... Anyway, uh, yeah, so she's right. She is an expert in disinformation. Uh, you know, that, that at least that much was true. But um, anyway, 
I had to like laugh a little bit when people were wondering about when is Trump going to be ever held accountable? Well, you know, last night I saw a clip of uh, George W. Bush railing against, you know, the evil Russians, you know, about the, the illegal invasion of Iraq. Anyway, his little pea brain was going, wait a minute. I knew that wasn't what I was right. supposed to say. I've been <laughs> playing that all day. Oh, you have. OK, yeah. of course you have. It's a, And I'm going, God damn, you know, with the, the ego maniacal Trump and a demented Biden, you kind of forget just the profound stupidity of this man and the profound banality and evil of this man. You know, it's right. just like, but, you know, and on the other hand, uh, Gene uh, Maxwell was charged, among other things, with trafficking girls to billionaires. Yet the judge has sealed her little black book. We are, we are not to know who it was that she was trafficking these you know, children to. Amazing how that works out. And, um, but anyway, I have a, a... And then they wonder why QAnon, they wonder where people get the idea that yeah. Democrats or billionaires are running a, a pedophilia ring. Yeah, well, um, I get people really pissed off, but you know, the uh, in, in terms of, I know that you were talking with uh, earlier about uh, taxing the churches. I mean, there is the biggest pedophilia protection racket on earth that's still in operation and still tax exempt, even though its head may have a have himself may be a fairly benign person there's still the ghost pope skittering around the vatican you know ratsy with half of the uh college of cardinals still referring to him as your holiness so you know this power is power ratsy, but but do, you mind leaning, do you mind doing a cheryl sandberg for me and getting and leaning in yes, yes. thank you no, okay what was this third thing you were talking about what was it I didn't know what you were talking about last week. But anyway, I, 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 am I properly framed? Yeah. No, I, oh, it's, for, it's to hear your voice. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I, I am speaking a little quiet, more quietly this week. But um, anyway, last night, I want to talk to uh, tell a story. This is about um, a positive story about the privacy course near Cleves. So last night, I'm going through my checking account, and I nearly blew a gasket because I saw a figure, $397, and and the title of it was Facebook Biometric Info. And I'm going, those bastards, they charged me 397 bucks, what the hell? And then I realized it wasn't a charge, it was a credit. Turns out I'm the beneficiary of a law that, that was passed way back in, um, 2008 signed by Rob Lagojevich in the state of Illinois. It was called the Biometric Information Protection Act. In other words, like online companies cannot harvest your like your facial recognition. And it, in the state of Illinois, uh, they're not allowed to do that without your explicit con consent. And there's big penalties on these companies if they do that. Plus, the law allowed for class action lawsuits, and that's what happened. I think I vaguely remember at the beginning of 2020, like signing, like if you ever had your face, you know, labeled on a Facebook uh, post of somebody else, and I thought, yeah, I think I have. I not thought much about it. Well, they settled the suit for like $650 million. Hmm. And like a whole bunch of us who happened to see the little notice, and sign on and provide the, uh, the law firm and the, uh, and the state with our social security numbers are, have been getting a nice little surprise. How about that? And that's nice because, A, it's class action law is really important. You know, whenever they talk about tort reform, that is the worst. And I, try, and I think I have successfully convinced many of my Republican friends, look, do you think you can go after a billionaire and his law firm? You know, 
you might be completely in the right and they completely in the wrong. But, you know, if they want something, if they want your property, if they want something from you, they'll just spend you into bankruptcy and then right. take it. And this is the one way when a bunch of us get together. And yes, uh, the, the lawyers take anywhere from 20 to 30 percent because the lawyers often have to work for years without knowing if they're ever going to get a payday from this. Right. That's their risk, but then they get the reward. And so then, you know, that kind of allows you to arm up, I mean, legally speaking, you know, with the top, with top rate legal representation. So, and the other thing too, is that, hey, sometimes legislation works, you know, sometimes good legislation. And I was Blago that signed it into law, but there were some people in the in the uh, Illinois House and Senate who actually crafted this law. And now it was significant. Um, maybe I should I should uh, it's a, it's an NBC News. I'll, I'll put the link into the chat. But um, anyway, um, this. This actually is now, since this, this, law through, this lawsuit went through, it really did send up a warning to, you know, companies that would illegally harvest your data. And, and, and California now is looking into such a law. There's a whole bunch of states now looking into emulating this law. It's astounding to me that it was done all the way back in 2008. And, you know, yeah, I guess it was. I mean, Blago, he was arrested later that year I, I think the end of that year and then we got his um lieutenant governor at the time they didn't run it's they ran separately they didn't run as a ticket and um the, pat quinn was this this liberal kind of bernie like sanders like crusader that kept running and running and running for office mostly losing occasionally winning found himself lieutenant governor then found himself the governor um uh, you Is know this the one who who freed all the prisoners no mm -mm. that was george ryan george ryan and i have to say this about george ryan um he was actually a decent governor we had you know like there, there was a, a good economic times he didn't he resisted his own party and signing off on a tax cut because he said our infrastructure is years behind he passed an infrastructure bill and then as he was leaving office, and before he got indicted for this, uh, another scandal, that, that's a whole other issue to talk about. But he went to prison. He was the guy that went to prison before Blagojevich went to prison. But he pardoned everybody off of death row. And he gave the best speech, political speech, I, don't, I think I have ever heard in terms of substance, in terms of narrative, like starting from... The time when he was he and his wife first married and one of the kids in the neighborhood who their kids played with was found brutally murdered you know so they know what it's like you know violence but he just went up through all the casework and just the systematic um short changing of poor people of people who are not mentally quite fit and it just and then the the crowning case was this uh, nicario case in naperville where um, a gangbanger was charged with brutally with uh, brutally be beating and raping re raping and beating this girl, even though there was no DNA evidence link linking him to it, they just needed to have somebody because this was from a very nice neighborhood family. It was a particularly brutal murder, and uh, so they they were he was charged with a, a capital offense, and he was on death row, hmm. and. Um, and this is when the prosec prosecutors actually ha got a confession from the guy who actually did it, who was the guy who was, had, who was already in prison in Joliet for serial murders. And he confessed to that. It, there was actually some DNA linking, his DNA linking him to that murder. But nonetheless, it was a horrible scandal. So the, the bottom line was uh, a Northwestern professor and his 12 students were looking through all the cases. They, would, they focused on this case, and they looked on everybody on death row. And they found that half the people on death row, they easily found, like, major mistakes in their cases. And, in fact, they found exculpatory evidence. Not only were they not technically guilty, they were innocent. Right. I mean, these people. So they left. And, uh, and so... Turns out... And, turns out 
uh, we have to go to Professor Adnan Hussein. Yeah. Turns out the only thing worse in America than cops are prosecutors. One of the reasons there's so many people of color in prison is not because of cops so much as prosecutorial discretion and just going after low hanging fruit and forcing people of color to plead. You know, they want to put numbers on the board. And a lot of these DAs are elected officials who. Yes, work, they're they're and very a few few progressive DAs that have complete like a trusted a DA in, in I think it was in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yeah, I want to say is, Kramer, but it's not Kramer. I, I've always, yeah, it begins with a K, though. Larry what Kramer, I'm isn't it? Is that the Larry bottom Kramer. line was Krasner, Krasner. Uh, Krasner. threatened to overturn all of those things, and of course he's he's crap. He's a Democrat, and right. I'm probably saying never voted for him, but right. yeah. Professor Adnan Hussein, good to see you, sir. Sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, not at all. Good to be with everybody in interesting discussion so far. Um, I just had a quick thought on the um, question of protecting these powerful people's uh, families. Um, I noted that there's been a lot of attention on uh, the Putin daughter's uh, and their various trips uh, around the world and how to apply sanctions to them. So it's kind of interesting that uh, we're so very concerned about uh, people protesting in the vicinity of uh, these powerful people's uh, families and children. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, of course, is about that uh, aspiration of the far right uh, to ban abortion not only in the United States, but also in Europe um, that I mentioned on May 5th. And so there was an interesting reference um, that the Reverend made about the intersection that I made about the intersection between far right, great replacement theory and anti-abortion measures, that there is actually an intimate and deep connection between, you know, the uh, policies of um, trying to stop and limit uh, abortion and these fears and concerns about demographic uh, dwindling of white people. That's also, of course, connection to the racial and cultural anxieties around immigration that are the basis of the Great Replacement. But one corollary is, of course, that uh, we need to uh, patriarchally control women's reproduction as a resource of the nation, of the people, and in this case, of course, white people or European people. Um, So those were just two threads that I wanted to pick up, but uh, there's so much um, else to talk about. I wasn't sure whether I should talk about more far right stuff, uh, because in Canada, the uh, Premier uh, Jason Kenney uh, of uh, Kenney of um, uh, Kenny, sorry, Jason Kenny of Alberta um, uh, is stepping down um, because this extreme right wing uh, figure who was a minister in the federal government for years and years under Harper and was very instrumental in trying to reshape Canada's immigration policy um, is now seen as, you know, far too, <laughs> far too liberal. Um, he tried to bring together the different factions of these far right parties, Western uh, exceptionalists, uh, Western secessionists, along with uh, people whose, uh, um, you know, basic ideology are QAnon and the Great Replacement Theory. Even he thought those people were a little crazy and that they were take, threatening to take over the party. He happened to say this in some meeting that was recorded and released, and it caused such a storm that uh, there was a kind of review of his position as leader of the United Conservatives in Alberta. He managed narrowly to pass uh, that uh, vote within his party uh, by you know 1.3 percent, uh, but he nonetheless decided that his position was very untenable. 
And so he's stepping down. And this is the core territory, you might say, of the current conservative party. So it's interesting to see who will emerge as leader in Alberta and whether this points to the direction that uh, the federal conservative party will adopt and the next round of elections. And I think we will see, you know, something uh, further on the right. Uh, but the other uh, sort of story that maybe connects a little bit here with the Ukraine issue is one that I uh, mentioned briefly when we were talking about uh, with Joe Lowry about um, the censorship issues and so on, um, is uh, Turkey's uh, position in attempting to stop uh, or at least maybe not stop, but saying very clearly and directly from the outset, they are voting no on uh, the entry, the entrance applications to NATO by uh, Finland and Sweden, both. And apparently NATO requires uh, all 30 uh, current members to agree. I think this is quite an interesting uh, development partly because I think one of the questions about NATO that somebody like uh, Trump raised, and I think the far right uh, has raised in their critique of NATO is what's the business of Turkey doing you know, in NATO? They don't belong in NATO. They're a Muslim country. They don't belong in Europe. You know? And of course, the European Union has been very serious about excluding uh, Turkey. And you know, there have been important French uh, foreign ministers and others who have declared during the period when Turkey was exploring accession into the European Union, the process that you have to go through of political and legal reform and economic reforms in order to enter, they declared, uh, you know, very clearly that um, majority Turkish country like Turkey would never be allowed to enter into the European Union. You know, I I didn't know that Turkey was not in the EU. That's interesting. Yeah, they're they're not. Um, they used to be part of a, an informal kind of um, uh, sort of notional body of the Congress of Europe, or was it the Concert of Europe? I forget the exact phrase. But uh, and they even also had the distinct honor in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century of being declared the sick man of Europe. So they were part of Europe in some sort of sense, but of course, because they're uh, majority Muslim power, uh, the reconstituted ideal culturally uh, of uh, Europe in the European Union uh, raised concerns for people. And you find, for example, under Pope Benedict, uh, you know, grave anxieties about the possibility that a country like Turkey might enter because that would undermine the Christian heritage the exclusively Christian heritage, presumably, of uh, of Europe. So, uh, yeah, they're not a part of the EU. They are, however, part of NATO, which is, of course, a product of their important geostrategic role during the Cold War, um, controlling access to the Mediterranean Sea. And Turkey actually uh, provided quite a number of troops uh, for the U.S.-led uh, war on the Korean Peninsula. And so we have like this history from that period of Turkey being part of NATO because it was important and useful in the Cold War. Um, But I think some right wing critics of NATO have questioned what Turkey's position should be that NATO can't be a real, uh, you know, properly organized military alliance if it includes a country like Turkey in it. So I wonder, this is quite interesting. This could potentially lead perhaps to backlash against Turkey if they press it too far, I wonder um, if they could be ejected. <laughs> you know, I don't think anyone really wants to do that because that would, um, uh, I think, pose some issues or problems. But the fact that Turkey is using this as an opportunity to pursue their own security interests is quite interesting. And it'll be interesting to see whether or what, not. Yeah, what is it? So the, the Nordic yeah. countries are joining and why is Erdogan Turkey? Yeah, okay. Well, this is Turkey's position: is that uh, Sweden and uh, Finland are harboring PKK and Kurdish YPG uh, and uh, Fethullah Gulen supporters. 
in whom Pennsylvania? Turkey, uh, yes, the the figure who everybody in the Middle East thinks is a clear CIA asset, but okay, he's, uh, he's sitting there in Pennsylvania, and he was leader of a fairly secretive uh, religious group in Turkey that originally was an ally of uh, Erdogan's party, the Rifah movement, and then later the AK party. Um, and in fact, they provided a lot of the intelligentsia, you might say, the skilled people because they specialize in education and they had ran a whole set of uh, specialized religious schools and promoted what they characterized as a very tolerant Sufi oriented form of modern Islam. And so they were useful allies in the beginning when uh, the Turkish uh, Refah and AK parties that um, came into power sort of conservative populist sorts of movements, they didn't have these technical capacities to govern the state. They didn't, you know, have their own cadres and they really relied upon the Gulenists as they're, as they're sometimes called. At a certain point, they had a kind of parting of ways and Fethullah Gulen's supporters are blamed for the 2016 sort of failed coup where a part of the military you know, tried to take over the government. And now Turkey, well, I mean, some people believe Erdogan was fully uh, aware of what was going to happen. They had a lot of knowledge of these plans, but this was a perfect um, opportunity to sort of purge society and government institutions that had been, you know, uh, had quite a number of these Gulenists in it because they had relied and needed them uh, to run the state and, and so on. And so it was also an opportunity to suppress other forms of dissent and associate them with the Gulenists. So there's a few groups, the Kurdish, uh, you know, resistance uh, groups, um, that have been sheltered, uh, you know, given asylum, political asylum in some European countries, in this case, uh, Sweden and Finland, as well as support for the Kurdish white, you know, uh, Kurdish rebels in northern uh, Syria. And the fact that Sweden and I, I think Finland, one or the other, didn't uh, put a ban on selling arms to Turkey as a result of Turkey's activities in northern Syria. So they put sanctions on them. So Turkey is remembering all of these issues and saying, we're not going to let you. I mean, this is supposed to be a security alliance, but, you know, these are terrorists. Uh, you're giving them shelter. How can that be a security you know, alliance, like you're expecting us to vote to bring you in when you are protecting people who undermine our national security. So this is obviously seen as possibly, um, you know, an attempt for to score some political points domestic domestically since elections. Erdogan is up for elections next year. He has an incredibly good record of winning, I think, four or five elections in a row. Um, but uh, this is, would be added insurance during a kind of uncertain time where there are a lot of economic problems. Inflation is terrible in Turkey, much worse than it is in many other countries. And also as a chance to negotiate and assert, again, Turkey's significance and importance and get something out of it. So it's, it could be very clever. It could be. I wonder, maybe go a little too far. It'll be interesting to see whether this rush to embrace Finland and Sweden into NATO uh, on a kind of very fast track will be tolerated. What, you know, the U.S. and other NATO countries will do to try and placate and mollify uh, Turkey. But it's been very clear. He said it today. He said it three, four days ago that Turkey wouldn't vote uh, in favor. Right. Some other like the foreign minister and other officials have said, well, we might work with with them. But uh, Erdogan has been very clear in making this announcement as, I guess, the opening salvo of his bargaining, uh, you know, uh, you know, with NATO for some concessions. Erdogan. Are the elections fair in Turkey? Well, you know. I think around the world now, one has to wonder, you know, uh, the kinds of interference and vote suppression and so on. Are American elections fair? Well, yeah. You know, there's questions clearly in lots of places. Um, so I would say it's not really maybe a lot worse than the United States. I mean, he genuinely is a skilled politician who has managed to create 
shifting coalitions. I mean, if you look at the start of his career to where he is now, he started off as a kind of Muslim oriented liberal reformer because he wanted to get into Europe. That you know pathway was blocked and he is and he originally used to be very warmly welcoming of uh, the possibility for kurdish uh, language rights and other aspects of incorporating them you know giving really? them certain I, kinds I of autonomy really cuz i remember him kind of reversing all of or at least the western press was saying he was reversing everything really? that ataturk built for turkey well yes i mean he um uh, has uh, basically tried to set himself up as a kind of neo-Ottoman second Ataturk, but from the other other side. And that is something that he has cultivated. But, you know, initially when he came in, he was saying, yeah, we should get rid of the death penalty. You know, we should do, you know, uh, he also used the reformist um, kinds of requirements for democratic uh, governance and supervision, rule of law, sorts of um, uh, uh, concerns and, and uh, standards within the EU as a way to suppress uh, military control over the government, because that has been something that, you know, Turkey routinely has these military kind of coups or soft coups. Right. And the real rulers of the state, you know, uh, they were a state within a state. That's interesting. And he used that, that to suppress them, to root out the secular, you know, secularist military, uh, Ataturkist ideologues of the military, the deep state. In fact, that's where the phrase comes from, is talking about the deep state is Turkey's military and police apparatus and security apparatus that really rules the state. And you could have different elected governments but nothing would change because the true controllers of power and security policy and so on was, you know, the military and security apparatus. So that's where the phrase, the deep state, wow. you know, comes from. And he used uh, accession, uh, you know, into the EU as a lever, you know, to try and root out military control over the democratic processes. Um, ultimately, however, what he's end up, ended up doing is sort of replacing them with his own sort of people um and he's turned he used to as i said be uh you know accommodating of kurdish rights he said well you know look why should we you know they're good muslims too uh, why should we you know base this on this extreme turkish national ethno nationalist um sort of approach we should give them language rights and you know restore some of their you know uh, political prisoners to you know uh, let them run for office and give them you know amnesty and give them some kinds of autonomy over things like schooling and stuff like that in Kurdish areas of the East, um, what he is now moved to is that he's basically taken over the position of the extreme right wing nationalist, uh, you know, uh, uh, politics. I mean, uh, he's just moved his coalition over there and he's conducted, you know, war, uh, you know, against uh, Kurdish right. rebels and, of course, used the uh, Kurdish uh uh, Kurdish activities in northern Syria to justify intervention in the Syrian conflict and so on. So he is something of a political chameleon and has clearly, you know, developed um, a good uh, way of always landing on his feet um, and um, in, in ever increasing. Well, I don't know, like the last round might have been the, there were there was a round uh, fairly recently where there was a Kurdish uh, secular party uh, that uh, 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 kind of took over from the Socialist Party um, and uh, created a, a left coalition, uh, human rights, that won in a round of municipal elections that really threatened him. And so then he suppressed. That's when he really turned authoritarian and right wing and called all these people terrorists, rounded them up, put them, you know, uh, put them in jail and, 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 and so on. But most of the time he has managed to have pretty strong majorities in reasonably fair uh, elections. I, I, my memory normally fails me. It seems to me in the Bush administration, he was an outlier. He became leader of Turkey when Bush was begging countries to be secular, militaristic, and get 
and not be run by Muslims. And then suddenly Erdogan comes to power and we were told, uh oh, this is dangerous. He's going to reverse all of what Ataturk did, cleansing Turkey of Islamic rule. And now it's going to become a, a like a Muslim caliphate. That didn't happen, though, did it? Well, it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. But on the other hand, you know, his policies have drifted further and further toward exploiting religious identity and rolling back, uh, you know, like no public, you know, alcohol served, you know, on this, you know, um, he, you know, uh, he's done things like that. Also taking back, uh, turning the Hagia Sophia from a museum into a mosque. So he's done some other symbolic things to reinforce the, um, kind of religious character of Turkey and have it be recognized more officially in government and undermine where he can aspects of secularism. And it has also coincided with his turn towards trying to be seen as the preeminent Muslim politician in the Middle East and turn his foreign policy as the doors to relationship with Europe have been closed. He's turned to trying to kind of create this coalition with Qatar and with the Muslim Brotherhood. So he was one of uh, Morsi's closest sort of supporters and allies right. and was very upset with the fact that the U.S. supported the overturning of the first democratic elections in modern Egyptian history um, to reinstall a military dictatorship. Um, but uh, yeah, so he he's tried to uh, tried to kind of neo ottomanize you might say, uh, you know, since 1516 until the end of the Ottoman Empire, uh, the end of World War One. Um, you know, uh, the Ottomans governed and ruled over Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Palestine. You know, what to say? Palestine, Israel, uh, and Iraq, right? And so he is looking toward this as an area of his geostrategic interest, which is why he intervened in syria why he supported uh election you know uh the muslim brotherhood in uh egypt and why for example he's taken various positions of I intervening even in libya currently um right well yeah. we have to wrap it up thank you for that uh professor ann lee read her over at uh, daily coast annie lee very quickly what is your book recommendation Oh, it's a, uh, a new book which I've just started in the uh, spirit of uh, Raymond Williams, who wrote a book on key words, uh, essentially on ideological matters, but uh, a really useful book for those of us on the left. There's a new book by Michael Hudson on uh, J. Uh, J is uh, for Junk Economics, a uh, guide uh, to... Uh, what is it? A uh, reality and uh, what I just uh, <laughs> reality and deception. I'm, I'm I've turned into uh, uh, George Bush again. So uh, anyway, <laughs> right? Oops. A guide to reality in an age of deception by Michael Hudson. J is for junk economics. It just came out. It's uh, it's really easy to read and. It'll give you a sort of update for some things that are currently difficult and problematic. Um, and my example would be, and I don't have time to do it, but uh, uh, would be uh, uh, the the road to serfdom by Hayek. He, he uh, comments on how essentially it's about uh, debt peonage and uh, uh, it's neo feudalism again. And it's really a good book. I, I mean, that sounded a little wordy, but it's actually very easy to read, and I think it's very accessible. And folks who who don't have you know, a lot of the theoretical stuff will find this actually kind of useful, a useful guide to the current problems that are that are involved in uh, heter heterodox economics. Right. So anyway, J is for junk economics, guide to reality in an age of deception. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor Ann Lee, reader over at the Daily Kos, Annie Lee. Thank you, Professor Adnan Hussein. Thank you, Professor Marianne Cummings. Glad your voice is back. Professor Jonathan Bick, we will see you office hours tomorrow night. Looking forward Thank to you. it. Thank you. It's time for Minsky and Kay. And I'm going to play the uh, theme song, but we're, I don't want to 
play it for too long. I'll play it at the end. Here we go. Well, anyway, I'll play. Alan Minsky is executive director of Progressive Democrats of America. And Professor Harvey J.K. is author of Take Hold of Our History, FDR on Democracy, The Fight for the Four Freedoms. And to tease the re-release of your very first book on Marxist historians in Great Britain, British Marxist historians, this comes out in October? It come October 1st. But I want to say in response to um, Anne Lee's... Uh, Remark about Raymond Williams' keywords. It's funny. It's coincidence. So Raymond Williams was a part of the generation of my British Marxist historians. And he was very close to Eric Hobsbawm, one of the historians. Um, what distinguished Raymond Williams was that he was Welsh, whereas the others were British. And my original plan was to include Raymond Williams as a chapter in the British Marxist historians, but I was persuaded by Christopher Hill, who was, you know, one of the central figures, not to do so, that he really wasn't part of their cohort during the Communist Party days. So I did not do that. But the book keywords that he ref that, that sorry, that Lee referred to, um, I used to use it in my classes. I actually developed a whole course around just that book keywords. Mm -hmm. It's subtitled uh, "Vocabulary of Culture and Society." It's, you know, it basically looks at at, at how the changes that took place in certain in words as a consequence of industrial capitalism it was rooted in a book he had done back in 1960 the first book he ever wrote called culture and society which was a really early effort in, in a kind in, a, in a, a marxian cultural studies approach as opposed to a later postmodernist approach but it was fascinating for me to hear that name i've tried to interview him at cambridge but he kept his distance, so I never actually did meet him. Well, to uh, both of you, Alan Minsky and Professor Harvey J.K., I didn't know this. I think it was Professor Marianne Cummings who told me, and I'm looking at the quote, that McKinsey's very own Pete Buttigieg, our Secretary of Transportation, was on Face the Nation. He was asked about the baby formula shortage. And he said, quote, let's be clear. This is a capitalist country. The government does not make baby formula, nor should it. Companies make formula. I have a question. If one third of our economy is government spending, It's about that, right, Alan Minsky? One third of our economy is what state, local, and federal governments spend. You have to unmute yourself. Um, Are we? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's roughly correct. It's 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 gone uh, from like twenty five to forty five in the post Roosevelt era in that okay. range when we're not in a overt war, hot war. Yeah. So, are we a capitalist country? Well, that's the crazy thing, of course, where we have a situation where, as everybody knows, our taxes are as high as, as the social democratic countries, and uh, we don't have social services that are anywhere near the level of those countries because we have a massive military budget. So, um, I mean, obviously, there's pretty much one purchaser for military armaments. There are governments around the world, though. Some of the Eric Prince is maybe buying some of the heavier stuff now, too. Um, you know, rich people have their, you know, gated communities and offshore existences and, you know, probably large bodyguard entourages. But for the most part, the single buyers are governments and the United States government's the largest purchaser. So um, we have a huge uh, amount of the economy that is uh, uh, operated under the government and by the government. Professor, aren't you glad, sorry, aren't you glad to know your president is a capitalist and his and his his puppets believe that we are a capital. You know what? Even even in the days of Eisenhower, they had the decency to talk about the fact that we were a mixed economy. Do you remember that, that language from when we were kids? You and I. Well, you weren't. You're a big. I, I can't but. believe you said mixed economy because Jen Senko was on earlier, and I'm reading her book, and she brought up mixed economy, 
in the book last night. I'm going, mixed economy. I've never When's heard the last that. Time? Well, it just shows you how long ago they dropped that kind of language. It's the language of maybe John Kenneth Galbraith of the 1950s into the 60s. By um, the way, in, tw- in 2020, I'm wondering what that percentage was. If, I wonder if it got above 50%. With the huge um, Trump, uh, oh, yeah, the CARES Act, yeah. See, Alan's father would have known what a mixed economy was. Yes, and and we will be hearing his father's name. In all seriousness, it's we're about three months away from everybody talking about Alan Minsky's father once again. Right, three Alan? months away. You're, you're predicting a market crash, David. The the, the 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 Minsky moment, your father, I don't mean to embarrass you, is a world class economist, world class. And during the, the finance, I met you, I heard about the Minsky moment and it was right after the financial collapse. And all I read about was your father and the Minsky moment. I'm sure you're sick of talking about that. No, but what are, you, what, are you, what are you saying? Are you predicting a, a huge uh, market? There are implosion? predictions of, the, of a recession, right? I, I was reading. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, my dad comes up when there are recessions. My dad comes up more when, you know, financial speculative bubbles implode. And you have an over leveraged economy. Right. Too much debt. is, and And now we're finding that People are having trouble paying back their subprime loans once again. But banks are not the culprit. It's private It's private equity that's doing all the lending. Who's doing all the lending? Well, aren't they? It's private equity com- stuff. Yeah, I was reading about the amount, the, the trillion dollars that, that one of the, what's the name of the one that controls like a trillion dollar portfolio? Uh, Black. Blackstone is it Black Blackstone Rock effect? or Black Black Rock? One of them Black. is horrible, and one is Black semi- Hole. Maybe the name of Black it, Hole. Bla- Blackstone. Blackstone and Black Rock, and I was getting confused. One, 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 one is basically ba- manages portfolios. The other is a is a is a in, investment company. The one is actually claiming to address climate change, but then they decided not this year. We're not going to. We're not going to uh, divest ourselves of all these banks that are spending close to a trillion dollars on fossil fuels. Like Jamie Dimon, for example, J.P. Morgan Chase, is one of the biggest investors in fossil fuels. And they're, they're financing it. What is a Marxist historian? What does that mean? Well, in the case of the British Marxist historians, what it meant was that they they were determined to, re, re, in that case of it, retell British history in terms of the of class struggle. That that's at the heart. That's what it really was about, and to tell the story for, of of Britain from the bottom up and by way of class struggle. And uh, basically, uh, there are lots of other versions of a Marxist of Marxist historiography, but that was the British Marxist understanding of it, and that's what appealed to me about their about their work was their capacity to understand the the dynamic of history, and also to understand the ways in which throughout history, whether we're talking slaves or serfs or working people, whatever, the ways in which struggles from below did shape. Not always in victorious ways, but definitely did shape the course of British history. And those of us who entered as Americanists, or in my case, originally Latin Americanists, pursued a similar set of uh, of ambitions for for historiography. Who would be a that gen- go ahead? But I do want to say too. I mean, and I think Harvey will concur. That generation of historians that Harvey wrote about too. Some of them were very prominent names in in. Uh, uh, British sort of public intellectual society. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, they almost every one of almost every one of them was. But in certain ways, you had, for example, E. P. Thompson. Besides being probably the most significant social historian of the of the second half of the twentieth century, because of, of or an array of books, most significantly a book that may be read less today than it was. Uh, a few decades ago, the making of the English working class, which was a a 900 page history 
of the for, the rise, the formation of the, of the English working class in the late 18th and early 19th century, which was originally supposed to be the first chapter of a, the whole story of, of British labor and turned into a, its own 900 page book. But he became especially famous, became actually the second best known figure in British public life after the Queen, because he was, in fact, the among other things, the co-founder of the European nuclear disarmament movement. Um, that, that's his. Eric Hobsbawm right. Right. was probably the most famous of the of the historians globally. OK, and not only because he could speak five languages, deeply involved in Italian Communist Party stuff and Italian politics, British politics. He was basically the foremost intellectual probably of the last few decades in Britain, at least on the left. Um, I mean, I could go through the litany, but those two in particular. But, but, but he has bomb, right? If, if I get this right, he never left the Communist Party. He refused to. Right. He never did. So right. In some respects, it was just a symbolic adherence to it. But I think I'm going to get this right, but maybe I'm getting this wrong. He also was a widely read and hugely popular theater critic. Jazz. Theater? Jazz. Jazz critic. He wrote for years under the name Francis Newton. And... Um, for, for uh, you know, for New Statesman and other and other outlets. In fact, I think the collection is available of his jazz criticism. Yeah, there's a really. By the way, if anyone want, is interested, go on to YouTube and just plug in Eric Hobsbawm, and you will get a. There's a really good, you know, good documentary of his life produced by some people on the left. Eric Hobsbawm, and he would be Hobsbawm would be. You know, I always recommend your book. Take hold of our history. It's a, a soft entry point into your writings. It's a collection of essays, and you get a rough idea of what Professor Harvey J.K. is about. What would, what, who of the Marxist historians would be the easiest to read? Okay, you know that's a good question because there are books that are just like wonderful to read. Let me start with that. Okay, and I will tell you that my first encounter with the historians, and I would never have occurred to me I would one day become their historiographer. When I was a freshman at Rutgers back in 1967-68, there the two names that I encountered were Eric Hobsbawm, in fact, because of a book that he did, which is a classic, The Age of Revolution. And which later was followed by the age of capital, then the age of empire, and then finally the age of extremes, which is a so it takes you from 1789 all the way through the 20th century, the history, the histories themselves. The other one is somebody who's not in my original book, but I actually am the executor of his literary estate, and I've done a whole bunch of things. I knew him very, very well. We got became very, very close. George Rudet. And and I could tell you that if people really want to get a sense of what these historians are about, there's a really good little book that I brought out on his behalf after he passed away with University of North Carolina Press titled Ideology and Popular Protest. And it really does look at the relationship between working pe working people throughout the ages and what we would think of as a kind of intellectual or political class. And it's really, I think, a, the closest thing to a damn good Gramscian analysis of 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 social history. So that's a George Rude's work is fantastic. But seriously, I, I actually I mean, I've, I read all of their works and I just. I just found some of their works just absolutely fascinating. And and I had never studied British history until I really had to throw myself in, into what they had to say. Um, wow. I mean, there, there's a there's a paragraph. There's a paragraph. There's a paragraph that Hobsbawm, not Hobbes, that Thompson wrote that became. Where's my book? That became probably. One of the it became the every every graduate student of my generation in history on the left quoted this this paragraph. I, I talk talk while I find this paragraph. <laughs> well, while we're waiting for that paragraph, Alan Minsky, we had some found it. It's, can I just use yes, it? please? Okay, so this, he so this is in the preface to his the making of the English working class. Had I known I would talk about this. 
I've got some of the stuff back. But there. we're going to be talking about this a lot. Yeah, we will. But th- you have to listen to this. And it, it has references that might escape most American American minds. He tried to explain what he was trying to do in this book besides consider the question of class. But he but he does this and he, he really was almost poetic in the way in which he wrote. I am seeking to rescue the poor stockinger, the Luddite cropper, the absolute handloom weaver, the utopian artisan, and even the deluded follower of Joanna Southcutt from the enormous condescension of posterity. Their crafts and traditions may have been backward looking. Their communitarian ideals may have been fantasies. Their insurrectionary conspiracies may have been foolhardy. But they lived through these times of acute social disturbance, and we did not. Their aspirations were valid in terms of their own experience, and if they were casualties of history, they remain condemned in their own lives as casualties. And that's a, that's a poetic way of saying that he was going to take them seriously. Okay? So he would never use words like masses and elites. Okay, he, there was nothing te- economic or technologically deterministic in, in these people's works. It really had to do with, with sort of human agency and the way human agency can actually change things, even if even if you lose in the process. Right. This is exciting. I can't wait to be talking about this in the lead up to the release of the book. Let's talk I, about yeah. Tuesday. Yeah, Alan's, Alan's better than I am on that for sure. And I'm so unsettled by all of this that I'll listen and then... Summer Lee. Crank. Let's start with Summer Lee. Has she won? Yeah, my understanding is that the only outstanding precincts, there was some trouble in registering the votes from 31 different precincts, all of which were in Allegheny County, where she did, where she won. She lost the other county, Westmoreland County. Um, and that they're even from the part of Allegheny that were within her district, or they largely were, where she won even more handily. And so the expectation is is that she will win this. Right. And APAC uh, set up a front organization called the Democracy Project or the Project for Democracy. Yeah, for something is the acronym I'd recognize it if I saw it. But yeah, that's what they've done. Yes. They set up a front group. So this is dark money. The APAC is a Republican organization that lobbies for the far right crackpots of Israel. Unfortunately, that's not accurate. Um, they're, they're, they had uh, really started out prominently uh, influencing the Democratic Party. But uh, in the age of Trump, where they very much largely their leadership embraced Trump, they had sort of become such a bad word in Democratic circles that a spinoff was founded in coordination with them called Democratic Majority for Israel. And um, and they were the group, not APEC. APEC did nothing in last uh, year's race with Nina Turner and Chantel Brown. But DMFI poured about $2 million into it. And that completely changed the outcome but of that race. But it's funded by yeah, APEC. Hey, I'm, I'm, actually, can I just, Alan's right, about, but I just want to add one thing. It's really the age of Netanyahu that turned IPAC into what it was. Okay, yeah, because it goes it goes back further. That's correct. Yeah. Right? And and as and I think Obama bucked heads with Netanyahu, as we all know. So that that uh, be, he, APEC in the right. defense and standing with Netanyahu on everything, they became more of a bad word in Democratic circles. But the result in Ohio meant that the template was deemed so successful that APEC has jumped back in. They've created this really. Uh, bear, I mean, DMFI was affiliated. Their new organization um, is just so that they can pour super PAC money in. Because APEC actually hasn't worked as a super PAC. It had been a bundler of donations that would then go directly into the campaign. So now they created a super PAC, United for Democracy or whatever the hell it's called. People can look it up. I'm not getting the name right. And they poured even more money than DMFI into the race against Chantel Brown. They were the primary funders of uh support for her in in the summer lee race by the way it was about it was heavily weighted in attack ads against summer lee only a small portion of it was pro steve Irwin, the candidate they were trying to lift this up. Is, it's called the united democracy project udp right that's right yeah the udp they don't say they don't tell anyone that they're funded by apac that they're a spinoff they don't even tell any- 
they don't even tell anybody that they're lobbying for the far right wing of Israel. And as you have pointed out, their their issue ads have nothing to do with Israel. It's just poisoning political discourse. It was very hard to see that Chris Hayes on MSNBC. I don't watch a lot of MSNBC. I, that, that that just is not anything I can stomach very much. Uh, all of its apology for the moderate centrist part of the dominant part of the Democratic Party, the status quo Democrats. But Chris Hayes did a good six minute segment on it. Um, I mean, he tiptoes around the issues pertaining to Israel and Palestine. Uh, and um, but he um, the, and the so does APAC. Made, but the APAC is tiptoeing around the issues of Israel and Palestine by creating United Democracy Project and not discussing pa the Palestinians or Israel. It's it's pure chicken shit. It's cowardice on APACs. When are we going to demand that APAC register as a foreign lobbyist? Um, my daughter's knocking on my back door. I'm going to have to get that in a second, but um, and I'll come right back. Um, you know, we, we a bunch of us who have have you know um, progressive PACs and our progressive five hundred one c fours. We are um, now going to produce. I agreed to be on a, a, a sign on letter, a couple a couple projects like that today to be uh, directing this to Democratic leadership to um, not uh, to just reject candidates that are accepting the support. APAC is not the Israeli government's lobbyist. It's not legal to have to have for a government to have a lobbyist. APAC identifies itself as the lobbyist for Israel when, in fact, it's lobbying for the ultra -right. foreign government. Got foreign governments have lobbyists in this country. I'll be right back. But you have to register as a foreign. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they are if not registered by, yeah, if you're funded by the absolute. Right. So that's a, that's a big practice for former politicians, Democrats, Republicans. They love doing that. Right. Maybe we should get find some maybe like Luxembourg or Luxembourg or Stein. Yeah. Or, yeah. Because they have a lot of money in Liechtenstein. That would be a good one. Kharkiv, the mayor of Kharkiv in Ukraine. <laughs> hired Rudy Giuliani to lobby the United States. Individual cities have lobbyists. So, Alan, uh, I'm hearing noise. What, what is going on? What, uh, not mine. I, I'm not me. Oh, I hear Joe in Norway. I'm going to mute you and then we'll go over the food in a second. Um, Summer Lee is one. Kurt Schrader lost in Oregon. Likely, yes, very likely. The result, so so that primary was decided by what could be under 500 votes? Summer Lee. That's Summer Lee, but no, Summer Lee probably. Well, the Summer Lee one, I'm sorry, I'm still, my mind went to Summer Lee when Schrader lost big, didn't he? Schrader right now is behind. They, they, they won't, not going to finish the voting on that till next week. They're doing, they're sort of pulling a California, Oregon is. And right now she's, uh, um, Jamie's ahead of Schrader by um, 60.5 to 39.5. A nine and a half thousand vote lead. As you can tell, all the winners in this stuff they they get up to about forty to fifty thousand is what it takes to win one of these races. In low turnout. It might be a little higher in Oregon. It tends to be a little bit higher voting voter turnout in Oregon. But um, so they win. Yeah. They win their. Those are safe Democratic seats. Summerlee is. So certainly very much so. Jamie, a little less so. Um, if it's a total tidal wave election for the Republicans, let's say inflation is at 10 percent and, um, you know, I don't know, Joe Biden is messing up on this and that and he can't get and more of his agenda gets blocked and he makes a complete fool of himself uh, in the months of September and October. And it's a complete tidal wave election. Then, then Jamie's seat could be lost. But um, outside of that context, it would be expected to be not a blowout. A Democratic district, but a Democratic win. Yeah. And in North Carolina, Erica Smith lost, correct? Lost big. And and I That's... think one of, you know, there was a lot of conversation on a call I was on today about why that was in that particular race. What were the elements there? Um, a, a candidate I was very vocally supportive of, Dwell Canning, lost. And in that race, um, Canning uh, lost to an establishment Democrat uh, in Peter DeFazio's old district very badly. Um, and the seat 
Peter DeFazio, one of the founders of the Progressive Caucus, not the most progressive, um, you know, veteran Democrat in the Congress by any stretch, but nonetheless, a you know, kind of person who you could trust, you could make a case to their office to support working class interests. The person who's going to replace him is a new Democrat. And the party establishment, including, uh, you know, um, Senators Wyden and, and Merkley, and Merkley's arguably the second or third most progressive senator, endorsed this establishment Democrat versus this climate champion that we had endorsed. And um, it, it is a case where the party establishment, if they remain unified like that in a state like Oregon, they're going to be a force to go up against. And they're going to be tough for progressives to overcome. In North Carolina, you had Clyburn weighing in. You had the outgoing congressperson. But it, I think the real thing there was the flood of stuff into the media. It, nothing like that had ever happened before in the race. So Apex Money went went very far in a district that's very poor, rural, um, Democratic voters and majority black. And um, yeah, that was a that was a blowout and a very unfortunate result. Because it is, is really people. anti-democratic to have a a lobbying group like Apex pouring money into a race with issue ads that have nothing to do with what they're lobbying for. This, well, right. this is not educating right. people about the right wing crackpots in Israel and making they're not making the case for the right wing crackpots in Israel. What they're doing is they're sowing confusion and obfuscating I'm not saying it's identical to anything like Putin, but it is it could be construed as foreign interference in our elections. It creates chaos. The, the, Israel was not on the ballot in Pittsburgh with Summer Lee. Or in, nor in northeast North Carolina. It was not on the ballot, but there were people who are ultra right wing Netanyahu supporters of Israel who pumped money into the campaigns to destroy any candidate who wants some kind of conversation with the Palestinians. I don't know that that's even clear, David. Um, I'm not quite sure that um, Erica uh, in particular. Um, was she would set up by Erica? Did they, did they... I, don't, I don't think there was any strong compulsion that you could see in her political career to engage in any kind of. Um, you know, to really foreground the issues of Israel and Palestine. Did APEC go after group. Erica Smith? Oh, yeah. Big time. Those mother... Mm -hmm. Huge. See, the problem... And, the alum, and, and uh, only a little bit, Jamie McLeod Skinner. And how did Alam do? She lost in Durham, right? Lost by about 10%, yeah. Right, because she's Muslim. She was elected to, you know, Durham during... Yeah. during Durham County Commissioner and Durham County was the largest county in the district. You know, the only people who can stop APAC are American Jews because APAC has framed it so that any criticism of APAC is considered anti-Semitism. 80% of American Jews do not approve of APAC. Yeah, and I think somebody's trying to commission a poll on that through um, in an organization I've heard whispers about that. So to poll American Jews, um, you know, on the policy positions around Israel that, that we can discern that APEC supports and the contrast sure. there. Because generally, of course, we're the American Jews not only are the certain, certainly the subset of white Americans who vote most heavily for the Democratic Party. And we're quite overrepresented in, uh, in, in progressive circles, as you know, David. So um, um, I, heard generally... Stephen Mil I heard Stephen Miller was going to was going to join us soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a he's a, yeah, he's a very uh, progressive fellow. That guy. He's adopted. There are exceptions, he's obviously. adopted, by the way, Stephen Miller. Is he? Yeah. Just thought I'd mention he... that. Was he? Yep. Really? Hmm. Uh -huh. So was Breitbart. Just thought I'd. Uh, or adopted him. Huh? Yeah. Another case for abortion. Stephen Miller, <laughs> Breitbart, <laughs> unwanted, two, two unwanted of... babies. There's a, uh, what do we have to look forward to on Tuesday? Stacey Abrams is her. She's uncontested uh, as the Democratic nominee for governor of 
Oh, yeah. Tuesday, Tuesday's huge. And, and, yeah. and look, I'm, and we're huge advocates for Senator Vincent Fort down in Georgia. Hopefully, Fort will be one of the top two. Nobody getting 50 percent will be in a runoff against reactionary Democrat and basically the sleep at the wheel um, guy named David Scott, corrupt Democrat from Metro Atlanta. But the huge race is in South Texas. And that's because, you know, the way the media has covered these races, only a few of them gain national prominence. And I think it's fair to say, um, even more than the Anina Turner races, that now the this Cuellar is Cisneros. Cisneros race, yeah, yeah. Cuellar Cisneros race is the highest profile congressional race in the progressive versus moderate Democrat battle. Um, in particular, I think it's become that way in part because Cuellar was investigated by the FBI. But I think it really went to another level when um, uh, Pelosi and Clyburn are, you know, the Democratic Party is going on about their uh, support for a woman's right to choose. Uh, and um, uh, and Cuellar, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Harvey. That's great. And, and Cuellar, uh, they're going down and they're campaigning for Cuellar. And uh, Cuellar is, of course, anti-choice and, um, and anti-labor. And uh, anti-pro act, pro-ice. Anti-Medicare right. for all wants to weaken Obamacare. He's a, a far right conservative Democrat. APAC is supporting him. APAC is supporting him, though. You know, the crazy thing there is um, they are pouring money in against Cisneros. Um, but the fossil fuel industry uh, gives so much money and so much super PAC support to Cuellar. You know, I'm not even sure what the extra money pouring into that district is going to do. I mean, right now, Summer Lee, by the way, Summer Lee won in Texas by this narrow margin. P Pittsburgh. Uh, in, Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, sorry, by this narrow margin because she had an incredible ground game. She had an incredible ground game because she came out of a movement. When she won for the House of Representatives in, in Pennsylvania. Labor. She's a labor organizer. Um, well, it, but the particular movement that got her and two other people into the um, you know, basically Pennsylvania State Assembly, um, built up an incredible movement within Pittsburgh that basically then won the mayorship in this last election cycle and now just moved wholly into the summer for um, Congress race. And uh, having that kind of, um, you know, up from the grassroots uh, approach. And by the way, Jamie McLeod Skinner did a great job of really organizing, building support. She won support of uh, county Democratic parties out in Oregon. Maybe you can see a different template for a different part of the country. But again, the same thing, very well organized locally. Jessica Cisneros now in her third run against Cuellar. It's safe to say not only does she have the nation's attention with her, but she has a really powerful, for a very difficult, very, very, very difficult district to have a ground game. She has got a great ground game now down in Texas. Everybody should support her. Hopefully we'll get if we win that race on Tuesday, the narrative is set that progressives are ascendant, fully ascendant within the Democratic Party. And we're in a very different place than we were just uh, after the uh, election in Ohio. Because of on, Nina uh, Turner. On Tuesday. Right? Yeah. The idea that at that hour, it seemed like we were just going to get swept away, swept out the way by this APEC money and everything. Um, but um, thanks to really good ground game organization. And look, we're the only political formation of the country that has that kind of enthusiasm right now. And they were trying to extinguish it. That's what they're setting out to do, to extinguish um, the one political movement that young people are into and that there's real momentum for. Um, APAC, APAC, APAC is trying to extinguish the progressive movement within the Democratic Party. They do not reflect the views of most Jews. They do not, most Jews are progressive. APAC does not speak for American Jews. I happen to think APAC is anti Semitic. Here's why APAC thinks American Jews are stupid. APAC <laughs> thinks American Jews are malicious warmongers who can't find any solution to the Palestinian issue without resorting to violence. APAC preys on Jews who who they who APAC thinks are stupid and militaristic. And I find that insulting and anti-Semitic. And I think anybody who who supports APAC 
is anti-Semitic. I think APEC is an anti-Semitic organization and the failure to speak out against APEC, anybody who won't speak out against APEC is anti-Semitic. I'm framing the conversation and I think most American Jews need to do that. I think because if you criticize APEC in America, you're called anti-Semitic. And I think American Jews need to step up and tell APEC to stay out of our democracy. They're a chicken shit organization. They don't even have the courage to, to, to go into these primaries and put ultra right wing Israeli orthodoxy on the ballot. They hide behind straw organizations and create chaos by attacking perfectly good progressive candidates that most Jews support. APEC is undermining Jewish values in America. Therefore, it is an anti-Semitic organization. APEC is anti-Semitic. We're definitely going to work uh, in the way we can with our partners. Um, we're somewhat more measured in our in our uh, messaging. Um, I appreciate what you're saying, David. Um, but uh, you know, again, we'll be we'll be uh, signing on to some statements and working with some people on some statements about uh, uh, what's going on with all this money pouring in. They, they've uh, chills. You know. APAC chills speech in America. If you criticize APAC. You know, if you say something like it's all about the Benjamins, like Ilan Omar. The Democratic leadership comes crashing down on you, accusing you of anti-Semitic tropes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's just not that much gain by you got to be very cautious about what you say when you make official statements, especially if you're in a situation like I am executive director of a, you know, somewhat legacy organization. Um, you want to be careful how you phrase things, because, uh, you know, you don't you just want to you want to, um, you know, negate their capacity to make those kind of accusations because you don't want those kind of accusations in the press. And um, so we're cautious about the way we we, we we're going to make our statements. But, but I we, understand. Um, I don't like speech being chilled and I don't like phony front organizations. People pretending to be something that they're not. I mean, what they did to Nina Turner I mean, that's some that's some bad stuff. Talking about, we're talking about APAC or we're talking about the Progressive Caucus now? Talking about APAC. So, oh, OK. <laughs> Professor Harvey J.K. <laughs> is the author of Take Hold of Our History, FDR and Democracy, The Fight for the Four Freedoms, and his new book on Marxist, British Marxist historian. Old book. What's, everything old is new again. Everything old is new. <laughs> is out in the fall and we're going to keep talking. I love the, this conversation, Professor, about British Marxist historians. Alan Minsky is executive director of the Progressive Democrats of America and people, there's still time to support Jessica Cisneros, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I look forward to... Uh, she, if she, I'll tell you something. If, she, if, if Cuellar defeats her, it's it's the equivalent it's 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 the equivalent of uh, of the Nina Turner affair. Yeah. And we'll and we'll tell you who's and that, and, and, which will show you that it's the Democratic establishment loves loves the fact that they're going after these progressives. They just love it. Now, by the way, Jessica Cisneros is you know the idea that they're that they are ganging up on this person is just an absurdity. I mean, she's so sincere in her, um, how she has arrived at the point where she is advocating for the policy she's advocating for, that she's jumped into this in the way that she has. Because guess whose office she started out working for when she decided she was going to uh, get involved in politics? Who? Henry Quayers. The one that the FBI, I mean, you know, she, she the one the FBI she, rated? Yeah, but she gets she gets involved. She wants to make a contribution, right? She's going to law school. She gets a summer job working for Quayer's office, you know. And and uh, you know, she probably just saw it firsthand. Here's this guy; he's not doing anything to support the people. And we you know what's what's uh, you know very. Uh, but this is not a rich district. There are not a lot of one percenters down there, you know, in this district from San Antonio south to the Mexican border.
Right. And this is the this is the character that Pelosi still endorses. Okay. The money the money of of the fossil fuel industries take them on next time David. That's that's where the that's where the real power is, believe me. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Professor Harvey J.K. Thank you, Alan Minsky. Follow Professor Harvey J.K. on Twitter at Harvey J.K. Buy his books. Alan Minsky, Progressive Democrats of America. How do people contact you people? Uh, info at pdamerica.org or Alan, A-L-A-N, at pdamerica.org. And our social media handles are at pdamerica. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Nice to see you, David. Great. Thank you so much. Let us now go to California, where Emil Guillermo is standing by, host of the PETA podcast and columnist for ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. I really got a great response to your wife. She, she, great. Yeah. I need one tonight from her. So that's good. Oh, okay. No, no, just kidding. No, she, she loved being on your show. She was sick, but she is, you know, I, I always kind of downplay what she, her role at PETA, but she, it's not that she runs PETA, but all the big campaigns that they're effective on are her campaigns. And it's because of what she does and she works this is a term in politics that is always used. It's become a cliche, but when they say they work tirelessly, you know, I always think of uh, the Michelin man or something, but she, she really works all the time on these issues and it's hard for us to take a vacation and get away. I work a lot also. And, but she works so hard for the animals and she taught me a lot and she saved my life. So I appreciate her being able to come on and, and speak about the issues that she's worked. That, that horse thing, that's almost all her and maybe one or two other people at PETA. And right. they have really transformed how people look at horse racing um, in America. Right. So let me read uh, you. Let me read you something that I read. Yeah. One in three adults in America believe there is a group trying to replace native born Americans with immigrants for electoral gains. Another 29% of Americans say that immigration is leading to native born Americans losing economic, political, and cultural influence. Of these two ideas, the study shows one in five Americans believe both. Right. That's from ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And it's written wow. by a man named Emil Guillermo, the name of the column was entitled this is me. This is me. Buffalo Victims Could Have Been Asian American Under Replacement Theory. Yeah. Talk to me about that, please. I, I was, look, I'm concerned about all the things that you were talking about in the previous segment, uh, the primaries that have you know, passed and the, the ones that are coming up, Justice Cisneros in Texas. And, and let me say, before I get into my thing, how much courage it takes for you to, to say, to, to come out and say the things that you did about Apex. I mean, I've dealt with Apex for a long time, uh, just looking at it. And because of what you said, right, it's the truth. If you say anything against Apex, you are seen as anti-Semitic. And which and I'm saying APAC is anti-Semitic. Yeah, I think what, they think what you, they think Jew they 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 try to they think Jews are stupid and militaristic and only care about uh, destroying Palestinians, and I find that anti-Semitic. I think you need more people coming out and saying that kind of truth because a lot of people are just they're they're mum because they see APAC, they don't want to deal with, they don't want to deal with their power. Well, you know who has the courage to take on APAC? J Street. Yeah. J Street. People should go to J Street and find out what most American Jews believe about the situation with the Palestinians. 80% of American Jews support J Street, not APAC. 
APAC is synonymous with MAGA. Right. right. APAC is MAGA. If you if you love MAGA, if you love Donald Trump, then you love APAC. If you support progressive values that come from the Enlightenment, you support J Street. 80% of American Jews do not support APAC. It is not anti-Semitic to criticize APAC. People in Israel criticize all these right-wing Likudniks who fund APAC. It's not anti-Israeli or anti-Semitic to call APAC what it is dangerous. Well, you're, you're right, though, about the chill. It, you know, when, when issues come up, Israel, you know, Palestine, they're, you know, people uh, sometimes take a pass. Sometimes people defer. They, they won't speak out. And it's because they fear the power of APAC. And I, I just think that well, they crossed the line in 2022 with these midterms. This is when they've crossed the line when they it's all right that they're a Republican lobbying group. But when you infiltrate the Democratic primaries with Nina Turner and Alam and uh, Summer in Pittsburgh yeah. and you create a straw man organization and you don't tell people that you're buying anti-progressive ads and it's all being paid for by APAC. APAC crossed the line this year. Yeah, well, I'm just glad to hear you speak out like that. And I hope that other people, uh, you know, understand what's going on and also similarly speak out because it does have to come from American Jews. Yes, it does. It, it does. Yes, it I mean, does. That, 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 that was so clearly stated there. Because I know a lot of people just would rather steer clear of that debate and say, you know, not not my issue, not my issue. As, but, as did I. You know, yeah. I, I don't want to I'm not a professional Jew. I don't want to be speak for 80 percent of American Jews. But APAC has framed it. So any criticism of APAC is synonymous with anti-Semitism. And it's American Jews need to speak up and tell APAC to stay out of politics and register as a foreign agent. Right. Well, this is certainly a strain that is in our our pol U.S. politics, and more people have to speak out to expose it. I'm glad you did. I wanted just to reiterate what you said in the last segment before we go into this thing about white replacement theory. I, I just think that this, this survey that's done by the AP and their uh, – the National Research Center that they work with, NORC, N-O-R-C. I, I think it's so important. It came out on Friday the 13th. That's when I first saw it. It's gotten very little play, but there are people out there. There are more people out there who have these beliefs in white replacement theory and in conspiracy theories, and it represents about a third of the people in, in our country who, who answer this poll. This came out on the 13th, Friday the 13th. And then what happened on the Saturday, Saturday the 14th? We saw Peyton Gendron do his thing in in um, in Buffalo. And we, we saw him linked to the conspiracy, the, the white replacement theory, the great replacement theory, which, uh, you know, has been around. It's been kind of evolving. Uh, Brenton Tarrant in in New Zealand you know, used it to 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 sort of be the 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 theory, the philosophy behind his you know his shooting rampage in New Zealand, and now it's copycatted by this guy. I just think that if people understand that this is a prevailing kind of sentiment, uh, well, prevailing. All right, that means more than fifty percent, I guess. But it's it's a more it's a bigger sentiment, a third of the American population believe in the two main tenets of white replacement theory are, are prone to being super conspiracy believers. And most of them are, of course, in the Republican Party. Most of them have been enabled by the, the whole MAGA thing. And you can see strains of it in, in our primaries. I think people need to be aware that what we saw last Saturday is not a one-off, that there are people out there and they're just waiting for a sign and they, they exist somewhat underground and on the on the Internet. 
but there's many more of them. And that was the shock in the AP survey that even the researchers said that we didn't know that that there was this many people who had these kind of extreme ideas. And that's the scary thing about 2022, you know, and I could joke about it and say, oh, great replacement theory. My problem as a Filipino American, as an Asian American, as a brown person, as a person of color, I didn't replace enough white people. (laughs) I, I did not replace enough white people. I fed right into their theory. Let me give you the other side of the story. Yeah. Washington Post, December 9th, 2021. Yeah. The city council here in New York City on Thursday approved a measure that will allow immigrants who are not U.S. citizens to vote for mayor and other key municipal positions. The council voted 33 to 14 Mm -hmm. uh, to grant non-citizens significant leverage over a broad array of elective offices, including the mayor, city council, comptroller, the public advocate, and the leaders of the city's five boroughs who oversee issues such as zoning. There are approximately one million adult non-citizens living in New York City, which amounts to 20% of current registered voters. So, again, I actually think non-citizens who live in new york city should be allowed to vote yeah i mean they get the services they get absolutely uh, you know i i when that happened i thought that was the beginning and i wrote a column about that i thought it was the beginning of a pro-democracy movement in america of course it should happen like in san francisco they do this but they allow but would you say that would you say that replacement theory didn't materialize out of nowhere well, the replacement theory comes out of, uh, I think its origins are in Europe, and then it extended in the the white racist underground. Right. He's, he saw it in Brenton Terrence's uh, writing in, in New Zealand, and this guy as a copycat, uh, Gendron, Peyton Gendron, just picked it up, and it makes sense. Look, this is the thing about all these uh, these theories. They, they kind of make sense if you're prone to believing in conspiracies. If you're not prone to logic, if you're not prone to the reality, then you're prone to conspiracy theories. This is the scary thing, really. It's not that they're, you know, this is one conspiracy, but you got to lump in QAnon and all the other conspiracies, because here's the other thing that this, uh, this survey said that it doesn't matter if you give these people the truth, because basically people are prone to uh, conspiracies based on personality. And that, that's a study that's been out for the last, say, 10, 15 years. And I, I talked to some political scientists and they said, hey, uh, you know, there was a thing in Stanford and, 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 and Berkeley like 10, 15 years ago. They showed that it had something to do with personality and even uh, the AP folks uh, the, in some stories I saw, they quoted some political scientists saying that it's about personality. So the scary thing is you give real facts and try to debunk conspiracy theories. It, don't, it won't work. But let me, it, let me, but a component, obviously, um, I don't, I think replacement theory is, you know, dangerous, obviously. Yeah. But there is an argument that that you hear on Fox News Mm. that the Democrats want these caravans of immigrants pouring over the border because they will vote for the Democratic Party. Now, this is this is a lie and I don't support it. However, it this idea doesn't materialize out of nowhere. People like me believe that if you're in this country, documented or undocumented, you should be allowed to vote. And so the Tucker Carlson, who should rot in hell, if he's not already doing that, Tucker Carlson does have a germ of truth in that there are some Democrats who want undocumented immigrants to vote. But, but the fact is, David, if you allow these people to vote and if you uh, nurture these voters, they they will just as easily vote 
Republican as Democrat. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I mean, right. they're coming from a an ultra religious background. Right. They, they are probably uh, anti-abortion. They yeah. are probably you know, not. They don't even know what choice is, but they, you know they believe in God. Evangel- I, I, you know, we like to think of them as Catholic. They're, more and more of them are even evangelicals. Exactly. So I yeah. just think that, and this was the turn that happened before Trump was elected. The GOP had this idea, and this really started with Bush. They were going big tent. They were all set to go to uh, into the 2016 uh, election uh, with, you know, going into, you know, uh, black, uh, you know, indigenous people of color communities and, and really drumming up the diversity vote. As soon as Trump came in, all that all that material they had set up incinerated. I mean, it's just, you know, they they were all but they got more. It. Trump got more Hispanic votes because they they don't vote as a block. Right. I mean, th- that that's right. I mean, but see, the thing is, that's how Democrats I, view the Hispanic vote. They, they just think they're all the same. But there are. There are there's different. It's it's a they're they're varied. I mean, you just like the Asian vote. I mean, right. this is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Look at all the different ethnicities. We're talking about 20 and, you know, some of the really rabid uh, races are the Democrat versus Republican races uh, amongst Asian Americans. Like uh, I think it's California 40th out in Orange County. But, you know, like you said, the diversity within the Latino community, within the Asian community, if if the Republicans in 2016 had gone that route and said, OK, we're going big tent because we can win these voters, they, they could have. But instead, they went Trump and they went, uh, you know, that's where these conspiracy theories like the, you know, the the white, the great replacement theory come up. Because then they go out and they 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 really villain villainize immigrants and and they're enablers who they see as this cabal, the elitist Democrats who are out there to replace whites. So this is how our politics has evolved. So I see this this poll come out or this survey uh, issued on last Friday, a day before Peyton Gendron does his thing in Buffalo. And we know this is happening out here. It's not just some, you know, fiction. It's a large group of Americans, a third, a third out there. And this is affecting our, you know, mainstream politics, certainly. The GOP, what is the GOP these days, right? It's like, it's Peyton Gendron, a a little bit moderated, but not by much. You know, it's QAnon, it's the conspiracy theories, it's, it's Fox News. Uh, one thing, good thing about this survey, it said that the 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 biggest or the largest number of these conspiracy theorists, the the who believe in those two tenets that there's a cabal and they're out to replace uh, um, whites, uh, they were viewers of OANN and Newsmax, like forty one percent, and and Fox was only like thirty thirty one, so that was like kind of a positive for Fox viewers, it means right. There's some reason. Well, o, Newsmax and OAN have to really go over the top. I mean, they are. Yeah, yeah. They're, well, they're something. So our our marching orders really, after if you know this is true with our electorate, either uh, I don't know. Do you leave the country? Do you? How do you fight this? How do you? If you know that it's personality and it's not the truth, like you can't you can't just give the truth. You can't give real facts to OANN. Or, you know, to, to these silos and say, hey, give this to your audience because they need to know the truth. That that doesn't cut it because it's this personality idea. And then to make it really dangerous, you bring in the number of people who own guns and the intersection between the people who believe in conspiracy theories and guns. And suddenly you have this, you know, this uh, this place where they all are. And you realize that what happened in Buffalo isn't a one off. We're going to continue to have these kind of things until we do something as a country to recognize that we need to come. I know it sounds trite. We need to come together. We need to, you know, Joe Biden, when he went to Buffalo, 
right? Tried to win over, you know, Buffalo in the nation, talking about love, you know, talking about Catholic hymns that they sing at mass. I don't know how effective it was, but he's trying. I don't know who else is. And I think what happens is after some funerals and after maybe a couple of days, this passes and, you know, on to the next shooting. Right. Right. That's a depressing thing. Can I say something optimistic? Yes, please. Yeah. I hate the NRA. I think they have blood all over their hands. I hate guns. I think guns should be outlawed. I think anybody who requires a gun uh, probably requires a lot more than a gun. That being said, as horrible as the news is, the when you look at it from a, a secular snapshot, mass shootings are, there are studies that say mass shootings are in decline, that we have a lot of high profile mass shootings, but the, the, the numbers are not really, uh, they're, 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 they have them every day, but I have read some statistics from reliable sources that say they're, 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 it could be it could be that the number of mass shootings has not gone up or gone down. It has been pretty much the same. Well, I hope that's true. I, I do think that, all right, there, you had 10 in Buffalo, but last week you had um, that, you know, the, the news media likes to clump them all together. It's like the TV producing way of covering the news. All the, you know, you got three shootings. Oh, we got a shooting block. Mm-hmm. We got to put it in our A block, right? And so here's Buffalo. And then, oh, well, let's bring up the shooting in in Dallas of the, at the Korean hair salon. And there were there were three Korean Americans who were shot. And they, they did capture uh, the gunman. Uh, no one was killed. Three were shot. So that was uh, a second uh, shooting incident and lower number, a third of, you know, the what, what happened in, in Buffalo. And then Sunday, the next day, you had that church in Laguna Wood in, mm-hmm. in Orange County, Los Angeles. And, you know, the L.A. Times was really stretched because they had people going to Buffalo to cover that. And then in their backyard, they had a situation where six people were shot one fatally in that church but that that and that was asian and dallas and la were both asian american shootings and that's that's a sad thing but you know it's not white supremacy but it was i think la they're looking at maybe uh charging a political hate crime because it was a taiwanese church and the shooter was a a person who grew up in Taiwan and was against the independence movement of Taiwan and was for a one China. So it was a kind of a politically oriented thing. Uh, here, here's the thing about the, maybe the one thing that maybe puts all three of them together, all three shootings, these gunmen all had mental health issues. Right. And, and there's know, nothing we can do for them. The, the, one of them, the, 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 the so guns, not selling guns. Exactly. Exactly. There are these red flag laws. The kid in Buffalo was in a day, had psychiatric evaluation for a day and a half. And what are you going to do? They released him. They knew he was dangerous. What are you going to do? Yeah. And, and the guy in Dallas uh, had a run in with an Asian American, a, a driving accident. And was having flashbacks for some reason he opened fire at this uh, korean salon uh injuring three not fatally but he's now in custody and the guy in uh in la he was from las vegas his wife had cancer went back to taiwan he had been he sold the he owned some property of a little fourplex in las vegas and it, he sold it not for apparently not for much profit he got kicked out he was essentially homeless and he let this political rage he have sort of take over his life. He had guns. He drove to L.A. to this church, a Taiwanese church, and and they let him in. 
they were Christian. And then um, he opened fire. And uh, uh, actually the story there of the heroism from the pastor, he, you know, the, the one guy who killed was killed was a doctor who was there bringing his mother to church. Right. Bring church. Anyway, so these according said, to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives this week, the number of guns being manufactured has tripled since 2000. And in 2009, Glock semi-automatic handguns outsell rifles. Uh, and now we have ghost guns, which we can't even keep track of. Uh, mass shootings are defined differently by different organizations. So right. depending on how you define a mass shooting, uh, an argument has been made that it's remained steady. Uh, not so sure about that, but I've heard well, people say that, you know, the way you count, a mass, the way you measure a mass shooting, uh, they may not be on the rise if you count the mass shootings the way they want you to. Yeah, well, just think of the, the ones that stick out, you know, yeah. um, you know, the Newtown, uh, you got uh, the Pulse, the, the, reason, the reason I brought that up, because you yeah. said, what are we supposed to do? Do we leave yeah. the country? And I was trying to come up with a rosier scenario, because if you're listening to this show right now, you're probably in your car or you're going for a walk and you're getting a lot of energy pumped into your brain. The truth is, if you interact with people we're not at each other's throats we uh, you know on a daily basis we're all about to snap there's no question that everybody is one snap shoelace away from screaming at the top of their lungs but when you interact with people you yeah. notice wait a second this isn't the way it is on the news this isn't the way it is what what i read people people are pleasant Right. And, and have you noticed, like, here I am in my gong closet, right? I've been this way for the last two years. And it is important the way we deal with trauma, the way we deal with uh, things that look dangerous. We, we, we interact with people and find they're not dangerous. We find that they, you know, that we're social. We, we, we show our faces, we communicate. Uh, this is what they, you know, psychologists understand. I mean, it's not like, you know, we, 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 we sense fear or danger and then, and then something happens. We look at each other, we interact and we realize no fear, no danger. And it's, it's where we should be happy. But now we have so much fear, especially when you have the politicians manipulating fear, when you have people right. manipulating how we are to to see each other and how we are not to, you know, you know, like have a person of color walk down the street, white person, you know, do you cross the street? Do you give each other space? Do you, or do you come toward each other, say hello, greet each other? Right. It, it, it's, and I think the pandemic has hurt, yes. hurt our ability. We're, we're isolated. I cannot tell you, the number of times I've been angry and then I've run an errand and some, I had some interaction with a human being and I went, wow, what am I so, what am I so pissed off about? No. It, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I, I did a talk show in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years and it was during the height of the, the limbo period where everything was polarizing and, you know, you had to like get on and be mm -hmm. a provocateur. I, I think I nearly had a heart attack, you know, and, and I, I had to stop doing that kind of radio and just start writing columns instead of the call uh, instead of doing the right. talks. And I felt a lot better because I wasn't at, you know, Oh, it's, you know, it's time for the show. I've got to like, right. And it's not you know, real. It's not real. It's nothing it, it, is it, real. The only thing that's real is love, love and respect and 
and interaction with other people or pets or animals or nature, that's real. You're, whatever you see on the television is not real. Whatever you're dealing with on social media is not real. It is manipulated. It's designed to get you to either buy something or get angry enough to vote a certain way. It is not real. Right. It's, it's manipulating you for your vote or for profit. And it, it ultimately sometimes it's, it, it triggers that fear mechanism. You know, you're, 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 you're fearful of something. You're fearful of loss. You're fearful of being replaced. Right. You know, and, and so, and you're right. The opposite of that fear is uh, openness and you know what's love. real joe in norway his hummus can yeah. joe are you still there i'm sorry i'm so hungry hummus cam it, it uh you don't really need oil i, I... <laughs> tell us what are you, you made. kidding me are you kidding me? <laughs> you fresh olive oil from the levant are you kidding me <laughs> <laughs> tell us what's in tell us what's in your hummus uh, in the hummus is sesame paste, lemon, cumin, and uh, a little bit of garlic. And it looks like you and have ginger. Sure. It looks like you made gingerbread apples or something off to the side. Okay, go on. And I've to I've also toasted uh, pine nuts. Toasted to go with pine it. nuts. That's nice. Very nice combination. You're pine nuts and, and hummus. And hey. this is a nice little uh, party favor you can do easily if you carve up. I showed you how to carve up the melon, remove the the rind, and I drizzled it with lemon juice, a little bit of salt, and some ribbons of mint, fresh mint. That's, That's your a definition. Nice little summer. Perfect That's your definition of summer. a party favor. Mine is a. <laughs> A handy where they hide the coats. That's my definition of a party favor. You know, David, uh, Kathy, 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 she she cooks a lot of vegan stuff. We'll, we'll I'll I'll have her cook something, and we'll get the camera over some our our, I would, our vegan oil thing that we do. Do that. I would love. Yeah. I, I yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll. She has some dishes that. There are pretty ones, and then there are the the quick and easy ones that we do, and but it's they're all they're all good. Like I said, um, she's she's really saved my life. Um, I've married her. We've been married for more than thirty years, and I know that uh, switching to her diet has has helped a lot. So Leslie anyway. makes beans. Beans are important. You need the beans. You and need the beans. Here's the thing about beans. I, I have no sponsors. But I, we treat ourselves to Rancho Gordo heirloom beans. Have you ever? I'm not. They're not I, don't, my I don't know. Huh? I don't know. Are they, are they like limas or what kind of beans? Go to RanchoGordo.com and it's pronounced Gordo. Uh, and I'll check it out. I'll check it heirloom out. Heirloom beans. Uh, they're they're out of Santa Rosa, but the owner. The New Yorker wrote about the owner. He flies down to Mexico a couple times a year and they discover beans that have been missing for centuries. Yeah. Heirloom okay. Be Heirloom be uh, yeah. These are the, the beans like these aren't the new ones. These are the heirloom. The, and nope. they have what is called terroir. Ter I'm not pronouncing it probably. Terroir, where you taste the land. Oh, great. It, it, I'm telling you, there are some heirloom beans that smell like bacon. That you really? think you, I'm eating it, and I say to Leslie, are you sure this isn't, read it, you put bacon in here. No, it's just these, be, these heirloom beans have flavors, and it's, you're communing with the universe when you eat a bean. Everything you need is in a bean. I, be, I believe that. I believe that. I, it's a I, seed. Whole, I wholeheartedly believe that. I'm, I'm a, we're big beaners. And, you can um, eat a bean or plant a bean, which no. means the universe is abundant, that everything you need has already been given to you, and that what, what's being taken away from you 
are all the things you don't need. And pretty soon, uh, the way our system is set up, we're going to lose our beans, our, our air, and our water. All you need to survive is water, beans, some vegetables, uh, like farro for a, a starch. You don't yeah. need yes. some I'm fruit, not. some vegetables. And people should try spending an entire day doing nothing but cooking beans. And think of that as your job. And you will, you'll, you'll be centered because that all you need, that's all you need. Bean meditation has worked for me. I mean, I, I don't, and don't go pressure cooker. You don't have to go. You can just boil them. It's like all day. Yeah. I was going to mention, I, I don't have the time for that, that kind of meditation. Oh, too well, much to cook. <laughs> I have friends. I, I bought one of my kids a value pack from Rancho Gordo. And whenever this child of mine is feeling down, I say, go make some beans. You will feel better. Cook some beans or give to Raheem or give to Rahima dot org. They provide beans to refugees. I'm, I'm going to try that. They're right. Rancho Gordo. They're not I'm, my they don't sponsor the show. I, I'm going to try that. Look, and here's my tip for if you're looking for a, a decent meat substitute. Butler's soy curls. I mentioned it before, but and I, I have not, no connection monetarily, but they're just good. And. They're hard to find sometimes, but they're out of Portland. Soy curls, pure soy, they ship them to you. And as a meat substitute, they're they're pure. Yeah. And if you eat anything but a vegan diet, you're wrong. Now, yeah. I've, I've been eating, I got stuck eating ice cream. Yes. For reasons you... that, and I was wrong. I'm, I, I'm an adult. I know I'm wrong when I eat dairy. You should yep. know. You should. You should know that if you eat beef or fish, you're wrong. Well, you know, David, my my position on this is: if you fall off the wagon, it's okay. It's not like the Church of Vegetarianism or the Church of Veganism. Just understand what you did and move move on. Yeah. But last week we talked about the upcharge at Starbucks, and this week on the PETA podcast, I talked to. Uh, one of the activists who was with James Cromwell in L.A. when he super glued his hand onto the counter. You know, you know that's a real thing, right? Super gluing your hand. How did they, it's, how'd they uh, get his hand off? Well, it, 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 it's a trick, but you need acetone, like uh, a lot of fingernail remover, fingernail polish remover. But you, a lot of acetone, I think it's called, and uh, but... A little like the old Brel cream commercials. A little dab will do you in terms of super glue. You put it on the counter. You, you're you're in there, and it it really works. And uh, if you go to the PETA podcast, uh, wherever you get your podcast, I I include the little a feed to a picture of him reading James Cromwell, the actor Babe, Oscar winning actor, um, talking about. This, but you know that the real thing about, and this is the connection to your ice cream habit and your dairy habit. The real reason to protest the upcharge, besides the fact that it's discriminatory against the lactose intolerant, it's discriminatory against the vegans. It's, it's, it's intolerant towards the intolerant. Yes, it is. But also think about what it does. You know, they don't charge an upcharge for the dairy milk, for the real cow milk, which is dangerous and abusive to cows you know i talk about this to the activists and i don't know how many people in your audience know this but you know if for cows to to lactate they got to be pregnant like continuously it's like a cycle this is worse than catholicism for cows so you know what you have to do you got to constantly impregnate them and the industry has this thing called a rape rack do you know about the rape rack this is a real thing. I'm not joking. People can Google rape rack. The, the dairy industry uses the rape Wasn't rack. Wasn't that the part of Baghdad where Uday and Hus U U Uday and Hussein? What were, what were, hang on, I'm so hungry. What were the. Uh, I, I don't know, but I know. Hang like, on, what was Saddam's son's names? 
I, f- I forget, but Uday and and the, the part of Baghdad that they lived in was called Rape Rack. It's part rape of Iraq, rack. but it was Rape Rack. <laughs> no, rape Rape Rack is a dairy term, and they they do this to to make sure the cows are constantly in a state of you know lactation, and then and then get this. Here, here's the other thing they do but besides the Rape Rack. It's a thing. The Rape Rack. If when they have when they have baby cows, the girls they save because they can lactate at some point. They're good. The boys. Bulls. Nope. Veal. The boy, they turn into veal calves. When, you they, eat, when you're eating veal, you're eating men. It's a, it's a terrible, terrible situation for the veal calves, you know, because they essentially, they... They unmuscle them. They 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 keep them in a like a box so that they are you know they have this soft tissue that is veal, and that's what happens to the boys. The girls they they do some of the girls because they don't let the girls nurse with mom. They keep they put things on their noses so they can't nurse with their moms, and they. But they they feed they they get them to the point where they're adult or their you know a bit their ability to get pregnant is there and then they join the mother on the assembly line. That's the dairy industry, and there's no upcharge for that. There's upcharge for vegan nut milks and and it, so eating cheese, eating dairy, yes, cheese bad, yeah, and ice cream is just as bad as eating red meat oh yeah yeah just as mad bad as eating uh well it's from the cows and it's from the it's from the milk you're you're, you're in, in many ways an argument could be made that they're torturing these cows these females torture would be a, a very would be euphemistic i mean if you look at the you know, the process they go through. And of course, you know, when I, uh, when I first heard Cromwell, you know, I'm thinking, Oh, the upcharge on soy or the upcharge on almond milk, or my favorite is cashew milk. I mean, I, that's unfair. It shouldn't happen. And most people just stop there. But if you look into it and say, Oh, well, by the way, there's no upcharge on dairy milk. And that's where the cruelty is. That's where the abuse is. And so, Check out the PETA podcast and also Google Rape Rack. You will be astonished and you will never look at a glass of milk the same way again. And when you eat veal, you're eating a boy. You're eating yeah, you're eating a well, well, I don't know if it's well marble, but you're eating uh, a. It sounds kind they, of creepy. You're like, you know. Yeah, they disable the, the calf, right? They they put them in a box so they don't, you know, use up their muscle. It's soft tissue, and it's supposed to be a delicacy, but it, it, it comes out of torture. You're eating a boy if you eat veal. How's the boy? How's the boy tonight? Nice, is soft the, muscle, David. Is the boy fresh? Fresh boy today. Fresh boy. Kosher for you. All right. I love you. I love your wife. Bring her back. She was great. Thank you. And I love you. I, I do too. I, ever since I started meditating, I throw that word out liberally. So, love I, you. You know that I don't approve of meditation. I know. I know, <laughs> I know we've had this conversation. <laughs> I think it's very narcissistic. I think you're, you're turning into yourself. And uh, I don't approve of meditation. I think masturbation is a much healthier way to connect with the uh, the I vow that Martin Buber always talks about. Yeah, right. Martin. Martin Buber, I vow. You find that through masturbation, not meditation. Meditation is very solipsistic and uh, cuts you off from the universe. Doesn't make you at one with the universe it cuts you off from humanity whereas masturbation see see david my meditation is working i'm not jumping up and down i'm not why don't we why don't we debate this one night 
One night, okay. I'll right. I'll stop meditating and I'll be be ready. All right. Thank you. Follow Emil on Twitter at Emil Amuck. Watch his live stream on Twitter, and he has a YouTube channel. Read him over at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Listen to the PETA podcast. Thank you, David. And how is, uh, uh, what's his name? Mike, uh, he has such a great name. Mike. Aren't you, ta- aren't you studying with one of the great? Oh, Mike Daisy. Yes, Mike Daisy. I, 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 I'm doing something with Mike Daisy. Why? He's a, it's, it's, he's, he's a lot of fun. Bring and- him on the show and interview him. All right, I'll see. I'll see if he's. Uh, I would love to meet Mike Days, or at least have you interview him. Okay, all right. I'll 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 ask him. I'll ask him if he wants to come on. Uh, I will. I will. Honest, Mike honest Daisy, guy. and I dated his sister Whoopsie. Whoopsie <laughs> Daisy. Remember not that? Upsy, not Upsy, whoopsie. Whoopsie. Not upsy. You, okay. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, uh, Joe in Norway. Thank you. You you want to say something? I just wanted to mention office hours. Yes, please. we have uh, yeah, quite an important session with uh, Myla Grissom. She's bringing a number of guests on to talk about the crisis at the Pacifica Radio Network and how we can save this irreplaceable left media institution. And then uh, followed up after that, after that would be Professor John with the Twilight Zone. And then Harsh is going to talk to us about Indian comedians and free speech. Okay. Quite, uh, interesting evening. Well, I have some exciting news that just came to me, and then we'll go to Rodrigo. But this is like, this is big for me. Fred Wallace Hayes Jr., NASA astronaut, Apollo 13, is doing our show in two weeks. This is like, like the, this is, this is amazing. Fred Hayes from Apollo 13. And he flew to the moon. They, they, he didn't, they weren't able to land on the moon, but he's one of 14, one of 20, do the math, three, 24 American astronauts to have flown to the moon. Uh, he's coming on the show to talk about Apollo 13, which... Uh, I always, I used to always play the uh, ground control from Apollo 13 on this show. So this is, uh, I'm going to start playing. I just, I just got an email that he said yes. Fred Hayes, Apollo 13, in two weeks on this show. This is, uh, I'm like, I feel like a 14 year old. And I won't do that joke. Uh, Rodrigo. Hi, David. I'll try to go fast. Uh, no, just, you know, you just um, our correspondent in Mexico. Rodrigo, uh, I'm starving. I'm looking at the hummus can. Hummus cam. Joe is torturing me, Rodrigo. What is on your you mind? Deserve it. Uh, you want to talk about uh, replacement theory? Yes. So the U.S. had more shootings last weekend. The first one had a very long manifesto from someone who, of course, being white, wasn't even drugged up when the police picked him up. We can certainly analyze how the gun fetishization Pascal Robert was talking about last time is a proxy for the economic power that the vanishing middle class has felt eroding for decades and how the media has brainwashed them into believing that three guys having $100,000 million each is normal and if they worked hard enough, they could join the place where they naturally belong. But this 16-year-old, by his own words, wasn't a racist growing up. In May 2020, he was 16 and bored and visiting, started visiting Fortune every day. There, he heard about the great replacement theory that low-key racists 
used to whisper about without using the actual words, and he decided to do his bid for the white race by driving several hours to shoot all black ladies and apologize for aiming at a white person. But what is behind this theory? Simply put, they are very worried that people of color, on average, have more children than rich white people, even taking into account that some white evangelicals are determined to have 16 children, whether they can afford to send them all to college or not. They're also worried that by 2050, the white category will no longer be the majority in the U.S., as a quick note, the reason this will happen is that more and more people are willing to take the mixed race tabs on the census that mark them as white and. If you go to the Wikipedia article on income and fertility, you will find a chart that more or less proves the inverse relationship between high income and high number of children. It sort of stands to reason that comparatively rich people decide to postpone having children, but why do poor people have more children? Let me use India as an example. The people who are adults today were born at a time when adults would have nine children, because they expected that half of them would die of disease before reaching adulthood, and half of the ones that survived would be women who would marry and take care of the husband's parents. The rest are men who survived enough to take care of the parents in their old age. As your country gradually manages to lift itself from poverty, the number of children they have comes down, and the children are expected to not only graduate high school, but even go to university and be better positioned to take care of their parents in their old age. Eventually, you reach the level of the upper middle class in the U.S., where the parents don't expect their children to take care of them. They expect that they will have enough money to retire and travel a little. This group is currently shrinking, but we'll leave that aside from for now. Uh, now, if you accept that poor people have too many children, you can become a white supremacist terrorist who tries to scare immigrants into not heeding to the United States to chase the American dream or, and this is what I wanted to talk about, the alternative is for the United States to stop constantly replacing dictators it no longer likes with newer dictators who promise to be more faithful. Someone I heard recently was saying that if they were in charge, the United States would pull back behind its borders and not come out for a decade or two. And if you know very little about the actual history of the world, you might think that's a great idea. But this would only solve one of the reasons the United States interferes in another country. What are these reasons? The first one is because your country has something the United States wants. The second one is because your country has something U.S. corporations wants. The third one is because Ronald Reagan thinks killing 3,000 people in Grenada makes him look like a man. The fourth one is that the United States is actually scared of you. Under the fourth one, we will have no trouble recognizing World War I and II and the Cold War. Under the first one, we more or less recognize the few dozen times when the United States replaced a bad leader with someone worse. For example, Saddam Hussein was a horrible person, but he allowed women to go to school, as did the Iranians before the CIA decided they were worried the socialists could win legitimate elections and the Iranian oil was just a nice bonus. But what about the second category? You may have heard of Commodore Perry sailing into Tokyo Bay in 1853 with orders to bomb civilians until the Japanese emperor agreed to trade with United States companies, or about the Panama Canal and how it came to be leased in perpetuity to the U.S. government, which is how McCain was eligible to be president. He was born in the Panama Canal, which is considered U.S. soil. You might not have realized that the Third World wasn't always a synonym for the underdeveloped countries. Between the 1950s and 1990, the countries that refused to join either the NATO powers or the Barso Pact made it clear that they didn't want to become communists, but they didn't want to depend on the United States or IMF loans either. 
they didn't exactly get a fair chance to do this. Why? Basically because capitalism calls for infinite expansion. It cannot abide the existence of a market is not allowed to expand into, where the companies with the biggest advantages can leverage their existing advantages into new advantages. A clear example of this is Obama's TPP. He still thinks of this treaty as his legacy because it forced the 14 participating countries to adopt some labor protection laws. But there's a dark side to this treaty that Trump rejected impulsively. The TPP could enable for signing members what is known as secret trade courts or secret arbitration tribunals, where any new law that affected the quote expected income end quote of multinational corporations could get the government sued for compensation. Okay. He took. It, it, I, I, we have to, we okay. have to wrap it up. Finish your thought, please. Uh, next show, it's fine. No, no, just, I don't mean to be rude, but uh, f finish your, you know, if you could get to your point, please. It's almost a page left. It's fine. A page? We can finish next time. How many, how long is a page? Well, 15, 20 lines? F 15 what? Okay, f f finish the page, please. Okay. Uh, it took more than 100 years for Haiti to fully pay reparations to nine generations of the descendants of slave owners for their quote-unquote laws, and that was not a secret. Inside modern free trade treaties, most of them now include these secret arbitration tribunals where your country can be sued for raising the minimum wage or protecting the environment in a way that makes multinational corporations spend more money than they expected. So when you think maybe the United States should start creating war refugees, remember that the United States Armed Forces liberating this or that country is only the most visible way in which the U.S. determines who will have all the advantages. Sometimes they send soldiers in, sometimes they send weapons to Ukraine, sometimes they force four countries to accept IMF loans that force your country to embrace the Republican austerity that certain politicians are such firm believers in, which hasn't exactly worked for either Greece or Spain. And sometimes they prop up far-right governments whose official policies result in, as one very visible example, 68% youth unemployment in Palestine. If you ask Palestinian young people, would you rather become a terrorist or get a job? More than 99% of them would choose the job, but they do not get the chance because the same government that last weekend killed a journalist and then interfered with her funeral has also designed a system where two-thirds of young Palestinians aren't meant to ever find a job. Not because Israel is genuinely afraid of Palestinians, but because the groups far to the right of Bibi Netanyahu and Ariel Sharon demand this as the price for their continued participation in the coalition government. And finally, a quick reminder for everyone who doesn't follow the Supreme Court. Judge Alito honestly believes that the Constitution does not establish the right to an abortion or the right to interracial marriage or the right for people to reside with family and a number of other things. But don't worry, he's only coming for the right to plan your own family this time. I'm sure he's not going to come back and take away the non-existing right to checking notes here, not be forced to undergo government-mandated surgeries against your will. Hmm. I wonder what surgeries the government could force on you. Thank you. Thank you. That is our show. I'll see you tomorrow night, Rodrigo. Okay. Yes. I want to thank Grace Jackson. Follow her on Twitter at Grace Jackson. I want to thank Stump the Hump Quizmaster Dan Frankenberger. Ben Burgess, read his new piece in Jacobin entitled Bad Republican. It's a review of Megan McCain's new book. And don't forget to listen to Ben's podcast. Give them an argument. The Hershenfelds, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld and Ethan Hershenfeld. Angeline is now on Peacock and Ethan is in it. 
download Thug Thug Jew on YouTube. I want to thank Jen Senko. Please go buy her book, The Brainwashing of My Dad. Go to thebrainwashingofmydad.com. Buy her book. And it's also a documentary. Go buy the book and the documentary. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn. Follow him on Twitter at Barry W. Lynn. And go to Barry W. Lynn for a treasure trove of his interviews and sermons and appearances. Thank you to the professors in Marianne, Professor Marianne Cummings. Follow her on Twitter at Razor Girl. Girl is spelled G R R L. Uh, Professor Ann Lee, follow her on The Daily Co's. Annie Lee is her handle, A N N I E L I. Professor Jonathan Bick will be with us on office hours tomorrow night. And of course, Professor Adnan Hussein. Go listen to the Mudgeless podcast and, of course, Guerrilla History. Thank you to Joe in Norway on the Hummus Cam. Professor Harvey. Jake, somebody just gave me a note here. Uh, Joe will make a covered wagon joke. OK, we'll get that tomorrow. Uh, Professor Harvey J.K., go pick up. Take hold of our history, FDR and democracy, fight for the four freedoms, and Thomas Paine and the promise of America. Alan Minsky, executive director of Progressive Democrats of America. Emil Guillermo, go to Emil Amuck on Twitter and go to amuck.com to uh, watch him and read him over at American Legal Defense and Education Fund and listen to the PETA podcast. And of course, Rodrigo, the show, I forgot to mention the people who put the show together, Joe in Norway, Professor Jonathan Bick, Grace Jackson, Sarah Bush, Andy Brown, Hannah Feldman, the Invisible Ninja, Professor Jonathan Bick, and of course, Dan Frankenberger. I think I left somebody out. This show is put together by Professor Jonathan Bick, Dan Frankenberger, Joe in Norway, Grace Jackson, Sarah Bush, Andy Brown, Hannah Feldman, The Invisible Ninja. I left somebody out. Office hours tonight at 8 p.m. I'm there for the first hour, hour and a half. I'll take your calls. We can talk about whatever you want. Then the community takes over. If you would like an invitation, go to my website and you'll get a link. While you're over there, sign up for my newsletter. It's coming out now every Friday. It's a recap of the week. And it also includes an invitation to office hours. I think that covers everything, right? I think that covers everything. Uh, I'll see everybody at office hours. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Porcelain hysteria in the greater Bay Area. We heard about it on CNN.com. I guess they're calling it a swine ball. We've been infested by feral hogs. They messed up my lawn and they ate my dogs. They're taking over and they're out of control. We're gonna organize a swine patrol. We got a swine bomb. We're doing the swine bomb boogie. These hogs are smelly and they make nasty sounds. Some of them weigh close to 800 pounds. Now you tell me if you think I'm mistaken. I think that sounds like an awful lot of bacon. These critters are mean, they can tear into you. Here's what they say you're supposed to do. Get 
on your car or climb up a tree. Cause pigs can't climb, at least that's what they tell me. We're in the swine bomb. Pigs can't climb. Doing the swine bomb boogie. Pigs can't climb. Folks are getting guns and shooting them on sight. Peter thinks that's all right. All my life I've been for gun control. Now they done put me on swine patrol. Pigs can't climb and white men can't jump. All we can do is a bump a dee bump. Can we chill these pigs out with some smooth and metal jazz? Round them all up and send them to Alcatraz. We're doing the swine bomb boogie. Pigs can't we got a swine bomb. The pigs can't climb. We're doing a swine bomb boogie. The pigs can't climb. We got a swine bomb. The pigs can't climb. We're doing a swine bomb boogie. The pigs can't climb. We got a swine bomb. The pigs can't climb. We got swine hogs all over the place. We're doing a swine bomb boogie. The pigs can't climb. Know what we're gonna do. If I knew, I would tell you. Seems like we're gonna do the big sky. Big sky.